Chapter 4 The Scene and the Foreseen The Roots of the Austrian Tradition First there is the scene, visible and immediate, that which is most easily grasped. Then there is the yet unseen, what comes next as the consequence of the former, realized in the latter, which can indeed become the foreseen. Herein we find a time sequence, a sequential seen and unseen. Not to be confused with the concurrent seen and unseen, one visible and one hidden. To emphasize, our focus is on the temporal, on an extended depth of field from the immediate to the intermediate and beyond. With the foreseen, a key concept that comes to us from Friedrich Bastiat, a proto-Austrian economist and a key figure of this chapter, moving from proximate to ultimate, the future becomes clearer, even obvious, but not because of prediction, the stuff of naive data analyses and mathematical models. One cannot learn from history, a posteriori, because casual relationships are deceptively veiled from our perception, what is unfortunately termed the teleological fallacy. Rather, in many cases, the foreseen emerges through the logical rigor of deduction, based on what one knows, and to some degree what one observes and experiences, as a sentient human being. The bridge from the seen to the foreseen is crossed purposefully, via a teleological path of means and ends, our familiar zeal as mittel to achieve a zweck, the common thread of the Clausewitzian strategy. Means are teleological, that is to say, means are tools used in service of a telos, an end or goal. The more disparate these means and ends, the more roundabout and circuitous the route is opposed to direct, often the more efficient and efficacious, a fundamental conviction and investment theme of this audiobook. In this thought paradigm of seen and unseen, and the teleology of means to a purposeful end, we find the Austrian school of economics and its unique methodology that is grounded in deduction, a priorism, and the subjectivity of human preferences. The Austrian tradition, established in the late 19th century by Karl Menger, forever changed the map of economic thought. Its intellectual epicenter was the University of Vienna, a position later tentatively assumed by New York University, following an exodus of Austrian economists from Austria, as we will discuss in Chapter 7. Before Menger, however, there were forerunners, the pre-Austrians, who, while not entirely Austrian in their thinking, nor in their nationality, did help to lay its foundational teleological roots. These precursors and early influencers included A. R. J. Turgot, who published his free market views before Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations appeared, and Jean-Baptiste Say, who expounded upon Smith's ideas with clarity and readability, which made Say's works highly popular. Thomas Jefferson had the first English edition translated in 1821. Say, however, was more than just an interpreter of Smith's ideas. Notable differences exist between their views, and Say was critical of Smith and pointed out inconsistencies in his thinking. For example, Say brought the entrepreneur into the spotlight of economic thought. He is said to have invented the term, which literally means undertaker, which the Austrians call Unternehmer with the connotation of one who undertakes an adventure, whereas the entrepreneur had been absent in Smith. Although the Austrians generally acknowledge Smith for his free market stance, he has been rejected by some, most notably by Murray Rothbard, for unwittingly providing ammunition to the Marxists, who also hail Smith as a founding father. For many Austrians, the free market lineage begins with Turgot and Say. Say also intersects our historical timeline that, in Chapter 3, brought us into Napoleonic Europe. Say served as a member of Napoleon's 100-member Tribunal Assembly, until his criticism of government policies led to his ouster and the banning of his writings, part of Napoleon's crackdown against the ideologues whom he had once embraced. Nonetheless, Say's famous economics Traite d'Economie Politique, Treatise on Political Economy, was published in 1803, and despite Napoleon's edict, went through four editions in Say's lifetime. Of particular interest in our discussion here is Say's successor and champion, the French economist and writer Claude Frédéric Bastiat, who is himself an important forerunner of the Austrian school due largely to his attacks against government interventionism, which he launched as effectively as any general. Before we leave military strategy behind us, it is worth contemplating why I treat it as perhaps the seminal thought on the means-ends framework of human strategic endeavor. 
I do not pretend to make warfare a metaphor for entrepreneurial competition, as Clausewitz did, nor is Twichot such a metaphor. Indeed, warfare and entrepreneurial discovery are antithetical. Bastiat himself reminds us of the inconsistencies between war and commerce. Let us then cease this childish practice of comparing industrial competition to war. Whatever element of plausibility this faulty analogy has comes of isolating two competing industries in order to determine the effects of their competition. As soon as one introduces into this calculation the effect produced upon the general well-being, the analogy breaks down. While Bastiat and Clausewitz were contemporaries, despite their shared teleological approach, they surely shared antipathy toward each other, due to their anti-militarism and francophobia respectively. Entrepreneurial competition betters the world, though paradoxically, most often at the expense of most of the competitors. Warfare destroys the world, also at the expense of most, if not all, the competitors. But the historical development of strategic thought we are following, specifically teleological thought, leads us to our central means-ends duality of Austrian investing itself. We understand the universal efficacy of indirect means and, with it, the dominant role of time. Because of this universality, we needn't concern ourselves with the particulars that differentiate each instance. Sadly, warfare has been all too much the story of human history. Perhaps the advent of advanced capitalist systems will diminish this. Perhaps this is a naive thought. Nonetheless, our understanding of capitalist systems, of unobservable cause and effect amid the ruckus of random data, and ultimately of effective capital investment, owes much to this and in fact requires, universal teleological thinking of means and ends, seen and foreseen. That which must be foreseen. Frail and sickly for most of his life, Bastiat, who died before he reached the age of fifty, may seem to be an unlikely forerunner for such an enduring economic movement as the Austrian school. Yet his life experiences provided a powerful vantage point from which to produce universal and timeless economic treatises. Born in 1801, Bastiat was orphaned at nine and raised by his paternal grandfather. By age 17, he was working in the family exporting business in Bayonne, France, where he saw clear evidence that the French government's protectionism did not bring prosperity. Rather, it led to the unemployment and poverty that were all too visible in the city that drew its lifeblood from trade. Without restrictions, as Bastiat could foresee, Trade would flourish among all parties, a perspective that would form the basis of his most eloquent and compelling economic arguments. At the age of twenty-five, Bastiat inherited the family's estate upon the death of his grandfather, which allowed him to pursue the life of a country squire and scholar. When the Bourbons were expelled from France in 1830, Bastiat led a troop of six hundred young Frenchmen to a royal fortress. No battle or glory ensued. Rather, it was a quick surrender and then an invitation to come inside for dinner. A gentleman farmer, he experimented in scientific agriculture, such as crop rotation to preserve soil fertility, and hired tenants to run the farm. But Bastiat, who confessed to caring little for money, soon retreated from the daily workings of the farm to immerse himself more deeply in the world of ideas and books. Yet living as he did on a country estate, Bastiat remained close to the land, and as such his perceptions gained clarity. What farmer sees only the apparent barrenness of a newly planted field? Again, Sun Tzu's call to see the seed, even before it is grown. Would he not, like Clip, be far more inclined to see the uncarved block and foresee the advantages to come in the yet unseen succession of crops? Would he not grasp and appreciate the farmer's tools as the very literal and tangible means to the desired ends of many years' harvests, the very seeds of which are the ingredients for next year's crop? In the natural world, Bastiat also recognized an order that spoke to him of how markets and exchanges among peoples should be allowed to function freely, as the superior mechanism by which to pursue satisfaction of one's wants. Even apparent inequalities, the pursuit of which counterintuitively equalizes them, point to a higher order of ends pursued through intermediate means, all for the good of the beneficiary of capitalism, the consumer. As Bastiat wrote in Economic Harmonies, Competition must necessarily intervene, called into being as it is, by the very fact of these inequalities, 
Labor instinctively moves in the direction that promises it the best returns, and thus unfailingly brings to an end that abnormal advantage it enjoyed, so that inequality is merely a spur that, in spite of ourselves, drives us on toward equality. This is one of the finest examples of teleology in the social machine. Bastiat further showed his proto-Austrian nature by describing economics in distinctly praxeological terms, praxeology being the study of human action, as societies in which people assist each other, work for one another, render reciprocal services, and place our faculties, or the results of their exercise, at the disposal of others, in consideration of return. Individuals, like countries, are not solitary. Indeed, their very survival depends upon interaction. Bastiat used such universal logic against the protectionists who would reduce men like snails to a state of absolute isolation. In his early days, Bastiat expressed his profound ideas in one-on-one -on -one conversations, his favorite form of communication and persuasion. His closest friend was Felix Coudois, a young intellectual and fellow gentleman farmer from a neighboring estate, a recent graduate of the law school in Toulouse. Coudois was a socialist steeped in Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose political philosophy influenced the French Revolution. Two more opposed opinions are hard to imagine. Over time, though, Bastiat converted Coudois to classical liberalism. Bastiat chafed at arguments that power in the hands of the state was meant for the good of all, and mocked such thinking by wryly envisioning a beneficent state to dispense bread for all mouths, work for all hands, capital for all enterprises, Credit for all projects, salve for all wounds, balm for all sufferings, advice for all perplexities, solutions for all doubts, truths for all intellects, diversions for all who want them, milk for infancy, and wine for old age, which can provide for all our wants, satisfy all our curiosity, correct all our errors, repair all our faults, and exempt us henceforth from the necessity for foresight. Prudence, judgment, sagacity, experience, order, economy, temperance, and activity. The mere notion of it collapses under the weight of its absurdity. After years of developing his arguments, Bastiat took them to a broader audience, publishing his first article in April 1834, an entreaty to abolish all tariffs, followed by a second essay opposing taxes on wine, and a third against taxes on land, unapologetically self-servingly, no doubt, and opposing trade restrictions. When his unsolicited manuscript on French and English tariffs was published in the prestigious Journal des Economistes, Bastiat established himself as a strong proponent for free trade and economic freedom, and a bulwark against a rising tide of protectionism. Writing profusely, Bastiat published a collection of his articles in his first book, Economic Sophisms, which is still considered to be the best literary defense of free trade. It was followed by his true opus, Economic Harmonies, in which he argues that the interests of all members of society are harmonious if private property rights are respected. In his view, the primary role of government was to uphold rights to life, liberty, and property, and to prevent injustice. When Bastiat was penning his economic treatises in France in defense of free trade, Karl Marx was living in London, writing his Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital, and promulgating socialist theories of class struggle and exploitation of workers in a capitalist society. Marx regarded Bastiat as the most superficial apologist of the vulgar economy, surely a compliment for Bastiat, from his biggest detractor whom he held in equal contempt. By leading the charge against Marx, which would be taken up most effectively by the Austrians, the chief enemies of the Marxists, Bastiat set forth in his economic harmonies that both capitalists, entrepreneurs, and laborers benefit from free enterprise. This economic harmony, then, may be thus stated. By labor, the action of man is combined with the action of nature. Utility results from that cooperation. Each man receives a share of the general utility proportioned to the value he has created, that is to say, to the services he has rendered, in other words, to the utility he has himself produced. With his view that accumulation of capital enriches workers as well as the factory owners, through greater productivity, higher wages, and cheaper goods, all of which would come to pass in industrialized economies, as if from Bastiat's script, Bastiat's thoughts are aligned with what would later emerge as Austrian capital theory. 
he also struck a blow against the socialists for their pursuit of an artificial organization, out of their belief that the natural organization of society is somewhat lacking or insufficient because of antagonism between capital and labor, producer and consumer. The only real antagonism as Bastiat saw it was among two principles that can never be reconciled, liberty and constraint. He saw as the obvious deduction the harmony of interests between laborers and those who employ them. In 1848, revolution again gripped France to end the monarchy that had been re-established post-Napoleon, and France's Second Republic was formed. Bastiat was elected to the National Assembly and became vice president of the Finance Committee. There, he was remembered as a stooped, thin figure sitting on the left, among the liberals and radicals, opposite the conservatives on the right. The origin of right and left in politics. Although vehemently opposed to the socialists and communists, he was nonetheless more at home on the left than the right, as he argued against government interference. Bastiat foresaw, correctly, the end of the Second Republic due to its economic policies, believing that support of protectionism meant favoring scarcity over abundance. What is arguably Bastiat's best-known work was a pamphlet entitled Ce qu'on voit et ce qu'on ne voit pas, that which is seen and that which is not seen, written in 1850. It was nearly not to be. The manuscript was lost during a move, and Bastiat had to rewrite it. He burned the second attempt that dissatisfied him, and finally completed a new draft just months before he died from tuberculosis at age 49. Had he not recreated the essay, the world would be without not one but two classics of economic thought, Bastiat's and Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, which expands upon it, my and surely many others, introduction to Bastiat and ultimately the Austrians. Through a series of economic parables, using counterfactual comparisons of free trade and interventionism, Bastiat draws the reader's attention from only the seen to what is yet unseen, but which can be foreseen. As Bastiat wrote, in the department of the economy, an act, a habit, an institution, a law, gives birth not only to an effect, but to a series of effects. Of these effects, the first only is immediate. It manifests itself simultaneously with its cause. It is seen. The others unfold in succession. They are not seen. It is well for us if they are foreseen. The dilemma, as Bastiat correctly pointed out, arises when favorable or unfavorable ends, whose obvious means and their natural time element are neglected and thus not foreseen. This ability to look beyond the obvious of the immediate scene and to foresee its later outcomes was, in Bastiat's view, the true differentiator. Now this difference is enormous for it almost always happens that when the immediate consequence is favorable, the ultimate consequences are fatal, and the converse. Hence it follows that the bad economist pursues a small present good, which will be followed by a great evil to come, while the true economist pursues a great good to come at the risk of a present small evil. In his language of series of effects and a small present good that is followed by a great evil to come, Bastiat elevates the temporal, and with it the disdain for immediacy, the atemporal. Coupled with this is the importance of deductive foresight. A more gentle teacher than the far rougher one of inductive experience, which teaches effectually but brutally. The key is to free oneself from a tyranny of first consequences, overvaluing what comes first at the expense of what inevitably comes later. As Bastiat warned, the sweeter the fruit of habit is, the more bitter are the consequences. As we will hear later in the audiobook, in this we glean the very essence of Austrian investing. Through his writings, Bastiat gained the wide respect of his contemporaries, becoming one of the most influential economists of the 19th century, as evidenced by invitations extended to him to contribute further to the Journal des Economistes and efforts to have him appointed to the first university chair of the political economy in France. The 1852 edition of the Dictionnaire d'Economie Politique published two years after his death, was dedicated to him. Had he lived longer, who knows how great a contribution Bastiat could have made to economic thought, including clarifying his earlier ideas. For all his insight, though, Bastiat's skill as a writer eventually led some to not take him seriously. Even some of those who were more positive toward him regarded Bastiat as more of an aggregator of previous ideas than a trailblazer. Economist Josef Schumpeter called him a brilliant journalist, but no theoretician. 
Apparently Bastiat was too understandable and concise for those who viewed pomposity and obtuseness as true brilliance. His fate reminds us that no man is a prophet in his own country, even among the International Guild of Economists, which, as we will discuss, was certainly true of the Austrian school. Other notable later-day Austrian economists, however, have hailed Bastiat as one of the most important economists ever, as well as a significant theoretician who contributed to the theory of value. Bastiat explained and defended his style by saying, We always want to give complicated explanations to the most simple facts, and we think we are clever only by looking for difficulties where there are none. He believed simplicity to be the touchstone of truth. Over time, however, Bastiat fell into obscurity, yet another victim of the Keynesian avalanche that would threaten to sweep away many a free market advocate, and he all but disappeared from most economics texts, save a cursory mention. However, Bastiat had a place in the Austrian school, whose core elements of a priorism and praxeology he, in many ways, foresaw. His name lived on, in particular, among the Austrians in the circle Bastiat, established by Murray Rothbard and his closest friends in 1953, as a venue for intellectual discussion and camaraderie, which continued until 1959. Although Bastiat may not be as appreciated as he deserves to be, it is well recognized that his work serves as an intellectual bridge between the ideas of the pre-Austrian economists and the Austrian tradition that began officially with Menger. Today, Bastiat is widely acknowledged to be a pre-Austrian. Menger, however, did not embrace him as he did not share Bastiat's normative approach. Although that does create some tension in the Austrian economics narrative, Ludwig von Mises himself considered economic science to be neutral and objective, but yet he was polemical, understandable perhaps, since he witnessed firsthand the horrors of the most extreme state interventionism in Nazism. In Menger's view, though, Bastiat was just as much an ideologue as any socialist, who started with preconceived value judgments and worked backward through economic analyses. Menger, Mises observed, heartily disapproved of the interventionist policies that the Austrian government, like almost all governments of the epoch, had adopted. But he did not believe that he could contribute a return to good policies in any other way than by expounding good economics in his books and articles, as well as in his university teaching. Menger upheld economics as being wertfrei, or value-free and thus neutral and objective. Shades of this positive-normative dichotomy still exist within the Austrian school today. It is also possible that Menger was mistaken in his judgment of Bastiat as not being wertfrei. Indeed, should it be assumed that just because a doctor is passionate about funding cancer research, he must follow subjective medical theories? Bastiat, in the tradition of Turgot and Say, is widely acknowledged to have contributed significantly to the methodology of the Austrian tradition, particularly with his extreme a priorist approach, which was most like that of Mises. Thus, Bastiat helps lay the cornerstone of the Austrian Weltanschauung, a worldview which emphasizes the importance of the subjectivity and choices made by the acting man, the term that Mises would use in his praxeology. As Bastiat, a prototypical Austrian and a praxeologist ahead of his time, observed. Our theory consists merely in observing universal facts, universal opinions, calculations and ways of proceeding that universally prevail, and in classifying these and rendering them coordinate, with a view to their being more easily understood. In his Seen and Unseen, Bastiat's legacy is to understand the economy as a series of intertemporal exchanges, the teleological connection of proximate means and ultimate ends, so that what we do, and the tools we employ upstream, the zeal, the strategic positional advantage, gives us greater efficacy later downstream, the middle to achieving a zvek. Thus our roundabout path continues, leading us now to the nexus of economic thought, 19th century Vienna, and a charismatic and ambitious young economist and journalist, whose writings would make an indelible mark on this discipline and establish a school inadvertently as a namesake to his homeland. At the Viennese Crossroads Between East and West Vienna has long been the crossroads between East and West, apropos on the geographical journey of this audiobook, as traders and crusaders passed through via the mighty Danube. By the 19th century, among the conquerors of Napoleon, the Habsburg dynasty basked in a golden age of its crown jewel, Vienna, 
the site of the world meeting to redraw borders and reconstruct Europe after the French defeat and surrender. As the third largest city in Europe, behind London and Paris, it had become a center of liberty, and with it the center of culture, music, art, politics, and intellectual pursuits. The dawn of a new era of achievement and grandeur was captured in the construction of the Ringstrasse, an elegant boulevard encircling the inner city district. The city remains, in my estimation, the most eminent in the world. One can imagine the likes of Gustav Mahler, the head of the Vienna court opera and one of the greatest composers who ever lived, strolling the streets of Vienna alongside equally significant scientists, philosophers, and economists, including, as we will discuss in this chapter, the founder of the Austrian school, Karl Menger. The flowering of thought in Vienna across disciplines provided the fertile ground that seeded the Austrian school at a unique time and place in history, as a renaissance in teleological thinking emerged, a means-ends framework aroused in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. This included such diverse thinkers as German biologists, perhaps most notably Karl Ernst von Bayer. But in Kant, Bayer and his colleagues did not find a prescriptive approach to conduct research in natural science. Rather, they grasped a clear synthesis of principles that linked teleology with mechanics. A confluence of intellectual events spanning Kant, Clausewitz, Bayer, and now Menger came together within a means-ends framework that acknowledged, as Menger wrote, all things are subject to the law of cause and effect. It would not be too far a stretch to imagine, as some notably have, that this commonality was, in part, because of the German language itself, which articulated clear distinctions between the proximate objective of Zeal and the ultimate end of Zweck, which Bayer adamantly distinguished in Kant, no doubt having read Clausewitz from a few decades earlier, a distinction perhaps absent amid the poverty of other Western languages. Teleology's revival got its start in the natural sciences, as a group of German biologists recognized a purpose imputed in life forms, while also embracing quantitative experimental science, the two not being mutually exclusive. This was the latest in the evolution of teleological thinking, which began with Aristotle and by the Middle Ages, had come under the influence of Christian theology and its views of a divine plan in nature. Kant, however, ruled out such thinking. There were two forms of teleology, one theistic, with nature seen as directed by a master agent, and the other mechanistic, with a cybernetic, a scientific approach I will discuss in Chapter 8, functioning within individual organisms and species. While Charles Darwin, in his 1859 On the Origin of Species, did not specifically seek to counter teleology. In fact, in his time, he was roundly criticized as a teleologist, which today has a more theistic meaning. His theory of evolution through natural selection had the effect of diminishing its influence. In fact, to Darwin, the ideal of natural selection did not falsify the teleology of Aristotle and Kant, but rather supported it. Teleology introduces other forces into the natural world, in addition to the familiar physical laws. Meanwhile, Bayer, who also rejected a theistic, anthropomorphic, and agent-based viewpoint in natural science, nonetheless offered a decidedly non-Darwinian view of evolution, grounded in Kant's teleomechanism framework. Bayer saw teleological relationships as the basis for exploring the casual relationship between form and function within organisms and the natural world. This would also be taken up, for instance, by Darcy Thompson in his fascinating 1917 book On Growth and Form, which observed quantitatively consistent physical and mechanical rules of biological growth and evolution. From Kant, the German biologists acquired the importance of the original state that plays a determining role in later stages. Thus, as Kant argued, a higher form of organization cannot issue forth from a lower form, Rather, the higher form is encoded in the lower form. This view is reminiscent of Stephen Wolfram's modern-day scientific approach, which assumes programmatically complex systems with explicit evolution rules instead of the random mutations of natural selection. Though such purposes are hidden from us, Kant nonetheless urged their assumption, certainly more conceivable within acting humans than biological systems. This thinking finds an important application in the embryological studies of Bayer, who regarded the embryo as the most essential aspect of the adult animal, whereby the animal develops in a pattern leading from the most universal and essential to the more specialized and individual characteristics. In fact, universal characteristics, not the addition of new parts, 
lead directly to subsequent development and individuation. In short, the future is at work shaping the present. Though we embark on another brief tangent into biology. Following our discussion in Chapter 2 of Conifer Teleology, our roundabout discussion here is quite purposeful, as the means of demonstrating a very important end. In Kantian teleology is yet another expression of our universal stratagem of ascending stages, of acquiring later stage advantage through an earlier stage disadvantage that transcends any one subject or school of thought. Its treatment by many disciplines underscores its importance to each one, including economics. The Teleology of Bayer's Butterfly The influence of the needs of the future on the present is no more eloquently illustrated perhaps than in the metamorphosis or production of the butterfly, which emerges later out of the caterpillar in its current structures and behaviors, most specifically its ravenous appetite. It is once again the plodding conifer that accelerates to a sprint, our tortoise, into the hare. First, there are the fat bodies of the caterpillar, a creature that to the undrained eye bears no resemblance to the ethereal version it will eventually become. Yet even in that lowly original form, it is uniquely endowed to become a butterfly. For instance, unlike most animals that assimilate the nutrition they need and excrete the excess, caterpillars store a portion of it in their digestive tract for later use during its chrysalis stage. When all is developed, the caterpillar loses its voracious appetite, seeks a place to spin its cocoon, and begins a metamorphic process that will transform its nervous system and produce wings, antenna, long feet, and other structures that are distinctive of the butterfly and not associated with the caterpillar. The caterpillar retains the means and resources today, which are the ingredients that will produce the purposeful ends of structures tomorrow. In other words, the future of the butterfly influences the shape and development of the caterpillar. The fat bodies are drawn down to provide the necessary material to build out the structures that were present only rudimentarily before. As Bayer observed, how is it possible to mistake that all of these operations are ordered with respect to a future need? They are directed to that which is to come into being. Such a relationship was designated by the Latin philosophers a causa finalis, a cause which lies in an end or result. Bayer would have surely made a highly acclaimed Austrian economist, if not naturalist, biologist at all. This remarkable teleomechanism of the caterpillar, like Robinson Crusoe, in his construction of a boat and net in a stage at which these tools are useless to survival and useful only in a stage to follow, is precisely the Austrian model of capital, production, and investing that will be our entire focus in Austrian Investing too, Chapter 10. As in his embryological studies, Bayer recognized these biological phenomena, that the means to what must be present later, e.g. in the adult, must first exist in the forerunner, the embryo. This pointed to the existence of a teleomechanical framework within biological organisms, a harmony of nature, in which there exists mutual regulation, which could not be explained by chance, which Bayer believed could lead only to destruction. This has been renamed teleonomy, or immediate ends of necessity masquerading as rational agent-selected ends, again conflating Ziel und Zweck, here again an example of Bastiat's unintentional teleology in the social machine, as well as the theme of Norbert Wiener's later cybernetics as explored in Chapter 8. Such harmonies might evoke a Bach fugue or a Beethoven sonata, as they present a grand, personal, and somehow inspiring nature, as depicted by Bayer. Within this metaphor of the ultimate's influence on the proximate, the end that determines and directs the means, we also find the orchestration of the Austrian entrepreneur, who by acquiring and assembling resources seeks to harmonize them into a desired final result of meeting the wants and desires of the consumer. Menger establishes the Austrian school. It was never Menger's intent to cleave with the classical economists and establish a unique school of economic thought. Yet such was the result of Menger's prodigious scholarship that began, curiously, as a journalist but became increasingly robust as a full-on economist and professor at the famed University of Vienna. Rothbard has noted that Menger didn't so much found an entirely new school of thought, as much as further develop earlier Proto-Austrian and even Aristotelian, but I have hopefully supported an argument for Lautzian. Thought that couldn't survive the classical school, thus is the ever-cumulative nature of human discovery. 
He was born Karl Menger Edler von Wolfskrun in 1841, the son of an old family in Galicia, part of the Austrian Empire in what is now Poland. His ancestors included musicians and army officers, craftsmen, and civil servants. His maternal grandfather, a Bohemian merchant, had made a great deal of money during the Napoleonic Wars, which he invested in a family estate where Menger spent much of his childhood. Menger later dropped the nobiliary von from his name and shortened it considerably. After studying economics at the universities of Prague and Vienna from 1859 until 1863, Menger went to work as a journalist. In 1866, he left the Wiener Zeitung newspaper, where he worked as a market analyst, and began to prepare for his oral examinations for a doctorate in law, and then went to work as an apprentice lawyer in 1867. That same year he received his law degree from the University of Krakow. Soon thereafter, Menger returned to economic journalism and helped found the Wiener Tagblatt, predecessor of the Neue Wiener Tagblatt, which became one of Vienna's most influential newspapers. He forever changed the world of economics with the publication of his first book in 1871, a slim and narrowly read volume called Grundsätze der Volkswirtschaftslehre, Principles of Economics. The book grew out of his years as an economic journalist in Vienna, during which time he discovered the importance of subjective demand and price determination. Specifically, Menger, as Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek later observed, had been struck by the glaring contrast between the traditional theories of price and the facts which experienced practical men considered as decisive for the determination of prices. His attempts to resolve that difference led to the publication of principles, the dissemination of which was restricted by the author's perfectionist tendencies as he later went through countless revisions. His writing style reflected his journalistic background, was not what people expected from a German scholar. Then again, Menger was not a German, but an Austrian, and not even an ordinary Austrian, but a resident of Vienna. Unlike previous German economics books, Menger's principles did not lean toward metaphysical existentialism with a moral or religious framework. Indeed, it was the first German-language secular economics textbook. Menger's principles coincided with two other independent yet simultaneous discoveries of the principle of marginal utility. Simply stated, that people use means to achieve various ends, according to their priorities, by William Jevons and Leon Valapas. The objective of Menger's work was to present a uniform theory of price with which to explain all price phenomena, and in particular also interest, wages, and rent. As Menger wrote in the preface to Principles, I have endeavored to reduce the complex phenomena of human economic activity to the simplest elements that can still be subjected to accurate observation, to apply to these elements the measure corresponding to their nature, and constantly adhering to this measure, to investigate the manner in which the more complex economic phenomena evolve from their elements according to definite principles. Unlike Jevons and Volovas, Menger favored an approach that was deductive, teleological, and, in a fundamental sense, humanistic. While Menger shared his contemporaries' preference for abstract reasoning, he was primarily interested in explaining the real-world actions of real people, not in creating artificial, stylized representations of reality. Further demonstrating his teleological thinking, Menger saw the inherent means-ends relationship in human choice. Jevons and Volovas, however, rejected cause and effect, which then became the standard in economics, except among the Mengerians and the Austrian school. Instead, Jevons and Volovas opted for a simultaneous determination approach to find an economic equilibrium. When Menger wrote his Principles of Economics, what followed was no less than a groundbreaking study of economics, particularly around the determination of value, which, as he saw it, must automatically take into account the usefulness, utility of a thing, in order for it to be considered a good. As Menger observed, our well-being at any given time, to the extent that it depends upon the satisfaction of our needs, is assured if we have at our disposal the goods required for their direct satisfaction. Evidence of Menger's teleological thinking can be found in his early notebooks, in which he recorded his activities and thoughts at various periods of his life, including his many influences. One of his notebooks, among the materials donated by his son to Duke University, shows a table of keywords that construct a distinct means-ends, Mittelzweck framework, for organizing his thoughts around economics. For example, the table, 
read vertically and horizontally, shows a good, gut, as a means, mittel, for achieving the satisfaction, befriedigung, of a desire or need, bedürfnis. Menger set forth four specific criteria which had to be present simultaneously in order for a thing to be considered a good, or as he put it, to acquire good's character, a human need, properties that render a thing capable of being brought into a casual connection to satisfy the need, human knowledge of that connection, and command of the thing sufficient to satisfy the need. Human well-being, then, was achieved through goods at our disposal for the direct satisfaction of our needs, thus highlighting the teleological thinking that satisfaction of the need, the end, is essential to the goods' character. Yet goods that could meet our needs directly, what Menger called goods of the first order, were not the only things that possess goods' character. Using the example of bread, a first-order good, there are also other goods that meet consumer needs specifically the flour and salt to go into the bread, and fuel to heat the oven, we find that implements and tools for the production of bread and the skilled labor services necessary for their use are regularly traded. All these things, or at any rate by far the greater number of them, are incapable of satisfying human needs in any direct way. For what human need could be satisfied by a specific labor service of a journeyman baker, by a baking utensil, or even by a quantity of ordinary flour. That these things are nevertheless treated as goods in human economy, just like goods of the first order, is due to the fact that they serve to produce bread and other goods of first order, and hence are indirectly, even if not directly, capable of satisfying human needs. Furthermore, as Minger demonstrated, the value of these ingredients, the factors of production, used to make a final good, is always derived from the value of the consumer good, and not the inverse. One example given is a bottle of wine that is not valuable because of the land and labor invested in it. Rather, it is because consumers value the wine that the land and the labor invested in winemaking are valuable. Menger also augmented Smith's declared central driver of universal opulence, the economic progress of civilization and the extension of prosperity throughout. Smith saw this progressing division of labor as the driver. However, it was clear to Menger that this was but a single cause of progress in human welfare, that is, a proximate cause, whereas the higher level, ultimate cause was the increasing employment of goods of higher order upon the growing quantity of goods available for human consumption, goods of the first order. This simple logic will become an essential piece of Austrian investing. In addition to his writing, Menger extended his influence, importantly, as a teacher, whose most notable student was Eugen von Bambavirk, who in turn taught Mises, sequential growth in this school of thought. At the University of Vienna, Menger was part of the Department of Law and Political Science. Economics was part of the law curriculum in Austria. First as a part-time unsalaried lecturer, the custom was for the students to pay the instructors directly, and then by 1873 as a full-time paid professor. In his seminars, a select group of advanced students, including those who had already received their doctorates, assembled to debate the carefully prepared papers of one of the members. The students led much of the discussion, but Menger assisted greatly with the papers, including by opening to students his vast personal library of more than 20,000 books, now at the Hitotsubashi University Library in Tokyo. His tutelage extended to organizing the papers and discussing the main points, and even teaching them elocution and breathing techniques. His brilliant mind and his pedagogical gifts contributed to Menger's stature, and soon he attracted the attention of none other than the Habsburg court, and in 1876 he took his most prestigious and influential teaching assignment as tutor for the crown prince, Rudolf von Habsburg, the only son of Emperor Franz Josef I of Austria and Empress Elizabeth, and heir to the throne of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Tutor to the Prince For the first three months of 1876, Menger gave the 18-year-old Prince Rudolf a crash course in economics, using Smith's Wealth of Nations as his primary text. Menger believed that Smith was sufficient to teach the Prince economic policies, and that a deeper understanding of economic theories was unnecessary. After each lecture, Rudolf was required to write extensive notes, produced entirely from memory, which Menger reviewed and edited. After the formal private lectures concluded, Menger stayed on with Rudolf, 
traveling with him throughout Europe for the next two years. Those conversations would change the course of history. A staunch anti-socialist in his personal views, Menger sought to counter what he saw as the destructive intellectual currents through which Prussian universities were spewing poison into the world. The fight, though, was a futile one, and Menger became filled with a dark pessimism. As Mises said of the Austrian school founder, he foresaw that the policies being pursued by the European powers would lead to a terrible war, ending with gruesome revolutions, the extinction of European culture and destruction of prosperity for people of all nations. This gloomy foreboding was passed on to Rudolf, eventually leading to a tragedy of not only personal but ultimately global proportions, known as the Meierling Incident. On the morning of January 30, 1889, the bodies of 30-year-old Rudolf, who was married, and his 17-year-old lover, Baroness Marie Alexandrina von Vetsera, were discovered at the Imperial Hunting Lodge at Meierling, in the fabled Vienna Woods, victims of a murder-suicide. With the death of the Crown Prince, the direct line of Habsburg succession was broken, and so would go to Franz Josef's brother, Karl Ludwig, who quickly renounced the throne and soon thereafter died of typhoid fever, making the heir apparent his son, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The transition in power upset the balance within the empire, and the resulting destabilization between Austrian and Hungarian factions escalated with the assassination of Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie by a Serbian nationalist at Sarajevo in June 1914, becoming, in essence, the first shots fired in the Great War. In his memoir, Mises, whose grandfather had conversed with Menger's brother Max, offered a startling perspective on Rudolf's death. Economics, not a love affair, caused Menger's pupil to kill himself. The crown prince took his own life because of despair over the future of his empire and that of European civilization, not because of a woman. The young girl had a death wish of her own, and he took her into death with him. He did not commit suicide on her account. For Rudolf, foreseeing destruction of all he valued, led to despair and depression, Mises noted. Menger, at age 48, barely had the first half of his life behind him, and had foreseen nothing less than the inevitability of the demise of his own Troy, a pessimism that consumed all the sharp-sighted Austrians. So what exactly had Menger taught Rudolf? The evidence came to light many years later when Rudolf's notebooks were published, which demonstrate the Crown Prince's nearly total recall of the material, and more important, Menger's biases, which had been carefully cloaked in his published works. With regard to government policies, including radically non-interventionalist statements that directly opposed the policies of the Austro-Hungarian Empire under Franz Josef, Rudolf embraced these teachings and wrote articles under an assumed name that were critical of his father's policies. The author's identity and Menger's influence apparently escaped the notice of the emperor. Meanwhile, Menger's service as royal tutor had so impressed Franz Josef that he approved Menger's appointment as the chair of law and political economy at the University of Vienna, a prestigious position that may have indicated he was being groomed to become prime minister although the prince's death dashed any possibility of that occurring. Nonetheless, Menger enjoyed the life of a popular and well-paid professional until suddenly, in 1903, he retired at the age of 63. Normal retirement age for professors was 70, and retreated to his library, where he wrote and saw university students frequently. Although an unspecified illness was offered as the explanation, the truth of the reason for his departure was likely the birth of an illegitimate son, Karl, born a year and a half before Menger's retirement. Menger never officially married, but had a common-law marriage with Karl's mother, Hermina Andermann, who inherited his library upon his death. Speculation is that Menger, a Catholic, could not marry Hermine because she was either Jewish or divorced. All marriages in Menger's time were religious ceremonies. In his seclusion, amid his books, Menger threw himself into a complete and systematic revision of principles, but as his scope of study and reading material expanded to philosophy, psychology, sociology, ethnography, and other disciplines, he apparently lost his way. Unsatisfied with his revisions, he continually postponed the publication of a revised edition, while the original principles went out of print. Menger never allowed it to be reprinted or translated during his lifetime, believing it to be incomplete. Principles was not published in English until 1950, 
which greatly diminished the spread of his ideas. Fortunately, the works of his followers, especially Bambaverk's Positive Theory of Capital, were published and translated into English in the late 19th century, which, as we will discuss in Chapter 5, advanced Menger's theories. Otherwise, the founder of the Austrian school could have faded into obscurity. Menger's legacy, however, extended far beyond one book to an entire methodology that set apart the Austrian tradition. Methodenstreit in his preference to principles of economics, Menger saluted German scholars in economics, offering his book as a friendly greeting from a collaborator in Austria. Not everyone returned the sentiment. By rejecting the slavish reliance on data that marked the German historicists who engaged in lavish record-keeping and classification of economic data, Menger took an entirely different approach that embraced universal economic laws, which he deduced from the law of cause and effect using means-ends reasoning. Menger was an anti-positivist, although the full implication of his position may not have been realized at the time. Thereby, he established the foundational Austrian tenet that economics is not a science derived from data, but rather uses a priorist methodology, grounded in observation and deduction of human action, thus opening the door for Mises' praxeology. In essence, Menger's principles can be seen as an exercise in pure theory. To their critics, the Austrians and Menger were anti-empiricists, which made them unscientific, certainly not a criticism to an Austrian. In a lecture on Menger and Bombawerk, Rothbard stressed that this aversion to mathematics was due to no lack of understanding. Both men, indeed, were trained in mathematics. They understood it all too well, which is why they rejected it, Rothbard said, referring to the use of mathematics in economic theory, certainly not a blanket rejection of mathematics per se. As a result, Austrian books read differently, look differently, smell different than the old classical books. One thing, there's no math in them, or very little. They're clear, they're logical, they proceed step by step. There's no sort of sudden flights of abstract fancy, not grounded in actual individual action. Later, Mengerians, most notably Mises, would be the ones to define the epistemological foundations of Austrian economics. Menger and his followers were not opposed to using empirical methods to understand the economy. Their objective, as Mises observed, was to put economic theory on a sound basis, and they were ready to dedicate themselves entirely to this cause. The German historical school, led by Gustav Schmaler, however, harbored a deep distrust of theoretical analysis, and its adherents emphatically denied that there are economic theorems of such a universal validity. Although Schmaller's embrace of positivism may not have been explicit, his attack on Menger's economics, deriving universal laws using deduction without relying on empirical evidence and scientific induction, showed his alignment with positivist thinking. By responding to standard positivism, Menger effectively destroyed Schmaller's nuanced position. Schmaller himself never offered a definition of positivism. For that, along with the inherent inadequacies of induction from historic experiences, we rely on the words of Mises in human action. Historical experience, as an experience of complex phenomena, does not provide us with facts in the sense in which the natural sciences employ this term to signify isolated events tested in experiments. The information conveyed by historical experience cannot be used as building material for the construction of theories and the prediction of future events. Every historical experience is open to various interpretations and is interpreted in different ways. In Mises' view, the postulates of positivism are illusory. One cannot study the science of human action using the same approach that applies to physics and natural science. There is no means to establish an a posteriori theory of human conduct and social events. History can neither prove nor disprove any general statement in the manner in which the natural sciences accept or reject a hypothesis on the ground of laboratory experiments. Neither experimental verification nor experimental falsification of a general proposition are possible in this field. The conflict between the Mengerians and the German historical school, known as Methodenstreit, the Battle of Methods, intensified with the publication of Menger's second book with the catchy title Untersuchungen über der Methode der Sozialwissenschaften und der politischen Ökonomie insbesondere. Investigations into the method of the social sciences with special reference to economics. 
Published in 1883, Investigations was more or less addressed to the German economists as a kind of methodological housecleaning to rid the historical school of its anti-theoretical stance. Unlike the friendly greeting of principles extended to the German historical school, Investigations was nothing less than a weapon wielded in a war between partisans in the ongoing battle over social science and Menger's defense of the importance of theory and laws that are universal, independent of time and place. As Menger wrote, the historical understanding of concrete social phenomena, however, is by no means the only thing that we can attain by way of scientific research. Rather, the theoretical understanding of social phenomena is of completely equivalent value and of equal significance. Reactions were mixed, from wholehearted embrace to vehement rejection, the most strident of which came from Schmaller, who penned a scathing review in which he dismissed investigations. We have finished with this book, and claimed that Menger was devoid of a universal philosophical and historical education, as well as a naturally broad vision which would have allowed him to appreciate the historicist's viewpoint. Menger replied with his own scornful verbiage, challenging Schmaller, the methodologist, to strike like a lion in the sands of the Spree, a river in Berlin where Schmaller taught at the university, shake his mane, brandish his paw, and yawn epistemologically. Only children and fools will take his methodological gesticulations seriously henceforth. This battle over economics revived old resentments, hearkening back to Austria's defeat of Prussia in 1866 in the war against France. The Austrian-Prussian divide even led to fistfights between German and Austrian students at the University of Vienna. As for the rivalry between Menger and Schmaller, there was a comedic side in Menger's odd preoccupation later in life of collecting pictures of other economists to establish who had the longest beard. Just before his 70th birthday, Menger desired to have formal portraits of every economist in the world taken and sent to him. In order to determine who is the most amply whiskered, which Menger, the likely victor, upheld as the true measure of a professor's dignity, not surprisingly, Schmaller and fellow German historicist Franz Brittano, apparently still smarting from the Methudenstreit some thirty years before, refused to participate. Menger's break from the German historicists spawned comments about the Menger school and then an Austrian or Viennese school, a pejorative label applied by Schmaller meant to portray Menger and his followers as isolated and obscure. The Austrian school embraced it gradually, until Menger himself mentioned the Ersterreichische Schule in a newspaper article in 1889, a distinction for the Austrian-born economists, who as time went on would leave their homeland that never embraced them. The irony is that Austria is decidedly non-Austrian, economically speaking. As Mises observed, those whom the world called Austrian economists were, in the Austrian universities, somewhat reluctantly tolerated outsiders. Years later, Mises would take on the historicists in his book Theory and History, countering their view that economic theorems are void because they rely on a, a priori reasoning and that only historical experience is valid. As he wrote, such historical experience does not give the observer facts in the sense in which the natural sciences apply this term to the results obtained in laboratory experiments. He further criticized those who call their offices, studies, and libraries laboratories for research in economics, statistics, or the social sciences as being hopelessly muddle-headed. Mises stated, Historical facts need to be interpreted on the ground of previously available theorems. German historicists, however, were in essence denying the existence of such economic theories. Therefore, their views, as Mises argued, were tantamount to the apodictic negation of economics as such. Menger, in contrast, was dedicated to distilling economic theories of a universal nature, which could apply to all nations, cultures, and eras. This necessitated a means-ends framework, which Menger, in many ways, pioneered. Such thinking must have been completely unpalatable to the German historicists, who rejected cause and effect, and therefore means and ends. The debate between Schmaller's historicists and Menger's theorists had far wider consequences than the use of data and application of economic theory. The German historical school in pre-war imperial Germany, comprised of the leading German economists, historians, and political scientists, sided with the socialists and upheld the belief that an unregulated free market would result in exploitation of workers and run counter to national interest. 
However, they differed from the socialists on the need for a revolutionary overthrow, and instead offered as a solution state socialism with social reforms, such as the modern warfare state imposed by Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, known as the Iron Chancellor in the 1880s and 1890s. In his book of essays, Planning for Freedom, first published in 1952, Mises traced the lineage of present-day interventionist progressivism to the supreme brain trusters of imperial Germany, especially Schmaller, setting up a clash of two orthodoxies, the Bismarck orthodoxy versus the Jefferson orthodoxy. Others have made a stronger and more insidious connection, connecting the rise of the socialist Nazis to the seeds sown by Bismarck and his contemporaries. When admirers of the Austrian school see it as a bastion of freedom, as Ron Paul does in the foreword to this audiobook, they do not overstate their opinion. Österreichische Schule Menger dared to take economics down a different theoretical path, away from the empiricists and historicists, by acknowledging the preeminence of individual choice and the subjectivity of human action. The individual, particularly as consumer, is the economic agent on whom research should be focused. The Austrian school's common method of analysis is rooted in subjectivism, although its explicit methodology has varied somewhat from one economist to another. As such, Menger also recognized a teleological connection between higher-order production, the means, and lower-order production, the ends of consumer needs, in opposition to the positivists who saw no value in teleological research and clung instead to scientism. We see the growing criticality science of today, while useful in analogy, as in Chapter 8, as even furthering, along with the vapid general equilibrium in modern portfolio theories, the neglect of the market's purposeful process. The Austrian school was one of ontology, dealing with human action itself. Their perceived world was one of apodictic casual facts. With capital as its root and the consumer as its goal, their underlying economic realities were always genetic and teleological, with a clear identification of means and ends. Schumpeter summed up Menger's contribution to economics in a eulogy honoring the founder of the Austrian school upon his death in 1921. Menger was nobody's pupil, and what he created stands. His discovery was not merely that people buy, sell, or produce goods, or that they derive satisfaction of their needs from such goods. Menger's discovery carried a far greater weight in the simple fact that the laws of human needs themselves were sufficient to explain the complex phenomena of the modern exchange economy. This singular view, putting human interaction at the pinnacle, has led to rejection and criticism, even outright attack on the Austrian school, not only among its economic peers but also politically, as it denied the legitimacy and efficacy of many economic policies. Although the Austrian school was not without its opponents on the political left and right, such alienation brought its own distinction of objectivity and independent-mindedness. Over time, many have followed Menger. Gradually, some, like Bum Bawerk and Mises, refined, modified, and made numerous substantial contributions. But Menger, unquestionably, was the beginning, the one who planted the flag for the Austrian school and its unique methodology of a priorism, deduction, and the importance of subjective human choice and action, all set within a teleological framework of the entrepreneur, who must gather the means to achieve the ends of meeting the consumer's wants and needs. Austrian methodology follows an intertemporal path, beyond the limits of the seen to the yet unseen and indeed the foreseen, the progression of the zeal that becomes mittel for achieving a zweck, the Austrian's teleological analysis of ends and means, which began with Menger, was not merely a way to think about capital. It allowed goods and capital to be classified as higher order and lower order, itself an intertemporal process. Upon this foundation, comprised of the building blocks of Bastiat and the pre-Austrians, and formalized by Menger and those who came after him, Austrian capital theory was established, recognizing the importance of assembling capital the factors of production, in an ever more roundabout structure, not for the sake of circuitousness, but to gain efficiency and efficacy in meeting consumer needs. This brings us to Bom Bawerk, the subject of Chapter 5, an early disciple of the school that Menger founded, who ultimately became the one to put it on the map. Chapter 5 
Umweg, the roundabout path of the Unternehmer. The gospel of this audiobook, which should be obvious by now, is the strategic positional advantage gained in the roundabout way, in the relation of indirect means and conditions to ultimate ends and consequences, that is, in intentionally and counterintuitively going right in order to better go left, rather than taking the direct route, the false shortcut. We have approached the roundabout way by way of synonymous concepts across the historical foundation of strategic thought, from the Taoists' Schur to the Prussians' Ziel Mittel und Zweck, culminating now with the core tenet of the great Austrian economic tradition, Umweg. Umweg, like Schur, is a lowly and mundane term, which disguises its philosophical and practical significance. It translates literally as detour, indirect, or roundabout route, and its economic meaning springs from a pillar of the Austrian school. A man who is truly a co-founder with Karl Menger, Eugen von Bambavirk. Building upon Menger's theories, Bambavirk clarified and popularized them, and then cumulatively postulated more of his own, crucial to the study of value, capital, and interest. Indeed, had it been left to Menger, sequestered in his library and consumed with constant revisions of his previous works, the Austrian tradition would have surely died on the vine. It was under Bambavirk, who was no mere disciple, that the Austrian approach acquired the rigor to be considered a school of economic thought. Bambavirk's influence was so great, particularly in capital theory and understanding economic growth, that at the turn of the twentieth century, he was likely the best-known economist outside of the United Kingdom. So one has to wonder why today his name is barely known outside the Austrians. All of Bambavirk's weighty achievements come together in Umweg, which invokes the circular roadway intersections that allow traffic to merge efficiently, literally going right to ultimately go left, rather than crossing each other's paths head-on. It is zigging while others zag, in order to then outzag the zaggers. So, too, is the path of this audiobook, spanning miles and millennia, militarists and economists, conifers and entrepreneurs, circuitous yet calculated in our intended direction. By exploring universal strategic thinking, we build a structure of understanding from many sources and thus mimic how capitalists layer their tools in intermediate stages of production. Likewise, as we will explore in the final chapters, Austrian investing applies the same roundabout capitalistic method of looking beyond the seen immediacy of first consequences toward the unseen of ultimate consequences. It is a method of positioning upstream for full deployment downstream, of engaging where, when it is easy, and of perceiving the seed even before it is grown. The protagonist of the Austrian narrative is the entrepreneur, known in Bambavirk's texts as the Unternehmer, or Undertaker, the literal translation from the French term coined by Say, who assembles the necessary inputs, the factors of production, into a temporal capital structure. As Bambavirk demonstrated, Capital accumulation is a sequential production process accomplished through stages to produce final consumer goods more efficiently and timed for when they will be demanded, the constantly stalked strategic advantage toward the ultimate end of satisfying the consumer. To meet that objective, the Unternehmer must raise his sights beyond the current slice of time in the marketplace and look ahead to anticipate not only what goods consumers will want, but importantly when they will want them. An intertemporal choice and trade-off exist between present and future satisfaction, as the Unternehmer forgoes the current immediate and instead pursues a later immediate. The view of the capitalist entrepreneur is unique to the Austrians, who understand the dynamics of disequilibrium in the economy, which we might think of here as opportunities to be exploited through investments in capital structure. Mainstream economists seldom address disequilibrium because it's too messy for their mathematical models, this structure, as first described by Menger, but not fully developed until Bambavirk, consists of capital configured cumulatively and hierarchically, from the highest order of raw materials, land, ore mined from the ground, timber from the forest, progressively altered with intermediate goods to the lower order that finally reaches the consumer. It is an aggregate model, if you will, although the Austrians are not typically fans of the aggregate, preferring to focus on the actions of the individual. Capital structures progress and develop as entrepreneurs weigh opportunities to make their production processes and therefore their capital structures more umweg. 
following the roundabout path which leads to no less than the very progress of material society. Postulating the Positive Eugen von Bombawerk, nicknamed Baum, enjoyed a career that spanned academia and government, two vantage points from which he observed and postulated upon economics in action. Born in Bruno, Austria in 1851, he was the youngest son of an aristocratic Austrian civil servant and deputy governor, Educated at the University of Vienna, where he received his doctorate of law in 1875, Bombofferk lectured at the University of Innsbruck throughout the 1880s, during which he wrote his most notable works, and then entered government, becoming finance minister of Austria in the 1890s. During this time, which earned him a portrait on the Austrian 100 shilling notes printed from 1984 to 2002, Bombawerk is credited with helping the country clean up its finances and stabilize its currency. He also led the reformation of the Austrian tax code. Bombawerk made his mark with the publication of the first two volumes of his works under the title Capital and Interest. The first volume, History and Critique of Interest Theories, published in 1884, when Bombawerk was only 33 years old, included an extensive discussion of interest and related theories exposing fallacies and demonstrating that the notion of interest is not artificial or usurious, but rather is logically inherent in the market. Building upon Menger's ideas, particularly around time preference, though also highly critical of them and giving more credit to John Ray, Bombawerk demonstrated that even when goods are equal in every other way, including quality, quantity, and form, present goods are valued more highly than future goods. The second volume and his most important work was The Positive Theory of Capital, published in 1889, and then immediately translated and published in English, a stunning achievement for Bombawerk and the Austrian school. It is important to note that the word positive in the book title in no way implies that Bombawerk was a positivist. The word signifies that the theory in the volume was his, whereas the intention of the first volume had been negative, exposing the flaws in existing theories. A third volume, Further Essays on Capital and Interest, comprised of what had been appendices to the second volume, was published in 1921 after Bombawerk's death. Retiring from government soon after the turn of the 20th century, Bombawerk returned to academia where he taught at the University of Vienna. His lectures on capital theory and his private seminar attracted many students, among them Ludwig von Mises. Personally, Bombawerk, who was married to the sister of his best friend, fellow Austrian economist Friedrich von Wieser, arguably third in line as a co-founder of the school, was described as the quintessential Austrian, quiet, modest, and affectionate. His diversions included music, he was a talented cellist, fitting with his focus on the temporal, cross-country bicycling, and during the summer, daily mountain climbs in the Dolomites. Despite his robust lifestyle in the out-of-doors, Bombawerk died at the age of 62, just before the outbreak of World War I and the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Although his life was sadly cut short, many of his colleagues lived well into their 80s, Bombawerk's legacy continues to outlive him through his notable advancements in economics, such that an understanding of his concepts of production is necessary to any discussion of capital theory today. Furthermore, he is at the very hub of the concepts converging on Austrian investing. Production Sumpfig To explain his economic theories, Bombawerk drew from everyday experiences, from the autistic exchange as described in Chapter 1, to, more broadly, methodological individualism, a principle that stemmed from Menger's work and the belief that social and economic interactions are best studied and explained through the actions of individuals rather than groups or collectives, which can act only through the actions of individuals. We might also think of reducing interactions to their individual parts as a type of reductionism, albeit with an Austrian bent. Focusing on the actions of the individual is one of the core concepts of Austrian economics, as explained by Menger. There is no economic phenomenon that does not ultimately find its origin and measure in the economically acting human and his economic deliberations. The Austrians don't shy from studying complex macro phenomena, but the crucial point is that they seek to explain such events by tracing them back to the actions and motivations of the individuals involved. 
Von Bawerk's studies of the individual often used parables, which became one of his most effective pedagogical tools. They also provide a good example of the distinctively Austrian flavor of empiricism, whereby experience can yield an understanding of general principles, for example the advantage of using tools, but not ironclad economic laws. Following Bombaverk's example, we offer illustrations that bring his concepts powerfully to life, showing production sumweg, or roundabout production in action. It is important to understand that production sumweg is not simply about having production take longer, not just indirectness for the sake of it. Taking the roundabout route is not the same as merely taking more time. There is no advantage or virtue in delays, procrastination, meandering, or going out of one's way for no reason. In production sumweg, one amasses the tools of one's trade, the intermediate goods that will add proficiency and efficiency to the pursuit, the result of which is realized in the future. As Bombaverk observed, that roundabout methods lead to greater results than direct methods is one of the most important and fundamental propositions in the whole theory of production. The same can be said of roundabout methods in investing. Over time, the inputs, intermediate goods, and other factors of production are brought together so that the desired result, the product wanted, may follow. To illustrate, we return to the parable of shipwrecked Robinson Crusoe. In their discourses, the Austrians seized upon the example of Crusoe, whose name was corrupted from the familial German Kreuznair, to illustrate with simplicity the evolution of a one-person economy, as Crusoe's very survival depends on him moving beyond the hand-to-mouth direct satisfaction of his needs to become ever more roundabout. On his remote island, which Defoe called the Island of Despair, the geographic location of which coincided with the island of Tobago, north of Venezuela, and a short distance from Trinidad, Crusoe's first priorities are the basics of life. To obtain food, he begins with the most primitive of approaches. He goes after what he needs with his hands, or as Bombaver called it, mit der nackten Faust, literally meaning with the bare fist. Defoe equips Crusoe with the means for hunting, growing basic crops, and raising goats. Here we focus on fishing to meet his most immediate needs. Standing in water, Crusoe tries to snatch fish as they swim by, but these slippery and fast-moving creatures are hard to catch. And so he upgrades his approach with a primitive tool, a first attempt at an intermediate good, a branch that he shapes into a spear. Although he misses frequently, he manages to catch five fish a day, but when the last bone is picked clean, he must rest up for another day of labor. Thus, Crusoe's quandary is how to catch the same amount of fish in less time and with less labor, or a greater number of fish in the same amount of time. The answer is to become more roundabout. The problem, however, is that even with his spear, Crusoe spends so much time trying to catch five fish for the day that the only way he can invest in better tools, improved intermediate goods, is to cut back on current production. In other words, he has to save some of his effort instead of expending it all catching fish. This requires him to decrease his fishing time and catch perhaps only three fish a day, which means he's going to be hungry. So he can spend the remainder of his day making a simple boat out of a hollowed log and a fishing net woven from vines. The process takes weeks. All the while, Crusoe foregoes full satisfaction of his current wants, a stomach full of fish, so that he can position himself for future advantage with the intermediate goods of a boat and net. Hungry, he labors upstream for more fish downstream. Putting it in economic terms, he makes use of his meager surplus time now in order to create more productive means for later. This is Umvig. Crusoe ultimately catches more fish by first catching fewer fish, by focusing his efforts in the immediate toward indirect means, not ends. Importantly, Crusoe demonstrates that savings is not mere renunciation, nor is it simply deprivation. Rather, it is highly strategic, yielding or losing now to realize an advantage in the future that, the saver hopes, more than justifies the setback and waiting to be paid off for the fruits of one's labor and investment, if indeed there is ever a payoff. Entrepreneurial ventures naturally do not come with any guarantees of feasibility or profitability. Here again we find the exchange across time, lost now for greater gain later. Thus, as Bombaverk recognized, savings is not negative, but rather deferred consumption, 
which provides the productive resources for greater consumption later. At last the boat and net are ready. The hungry Crusoe takes to the water and in less than two hours catches five fish. Now with his daily needs met, he can invest in other roundabout production such as, in addition to repairing his boat and net, a rack for drying fish and evaporating seawater to collect salt to preserve them. Soon Crusoe has an exceedingly efficient fishing operation, catching far more fish than he can consume and accumulating a stockpile of protein for his diet, and equivalently a stockpile of time for replacing and creating even more capital goods. Now that he is more roundabout thanks to his boat and net, Crusoe can draw from his stockpile of dried and salted fish to keep up consumption while he makes a second net to replace the first when it finally wears out. Capital must be thought of as a temporal structure that is always dwindling away. Moreover, the advantages and gains that are realized today are due to capital that was invested previously. The same process we recognize is occurring with our conifers of Chapter 2 that seed into the rocky, inhospitable places where they initially will fall behind, growing slowly and hungry for nutrients, but from which they will realize greater growth and opportunism later, thanks to their buildup of advantageous efficiency, position, and vantage point. But what if it had turned out differently for Robinson Crusoe and for the conifers? Instead of taking a few weeks to make a net and simple boat, during which time he had to reduce his daily consumption by two fish to three from his usual five, suppose the process took two months to complete. Similarly, for the conifers, what if it took longer for them to reach a faster growth stage, or if there were fewer land-clearing fires and thus less turnover in the fertile areas? What if it all took too long because time is so costly? For Crusoe, the issue is whether the productivity gained from the net and the boat would offset his cost in time, which he measures in terms of forfeited fish, two fish times 60 days, or 120 fish. How much weight would he have lost from caloric deprivation? To be sure, he would use the boat and net if someone gave them to him as a free gift. But would he invest the time and effort to make them at a cost of 120 fish? Would the increased productivity justify that cost? In Crusoe's very real terms, would the payoff make up for the anguish, both physical and psychological, of being near starvation for two months? Humans' constant necessity of caloric intake creates a natural impediment to the immediate privation of capitalistic production. Here again, we can see economic productivity in action. It is not just enough to be physically more productive. It has to make economic sense as well. Again, it is naive to think that just because a process is more roundabout, it will automatically be more advantageous. To take a silly example, Crusoe could use a process that involved climbing a tree every time he wanted to catch another fish. This obviously would confer no advantage over the more direct approach. However, Bombavirk concluded that the only reason for production sumveg to take longer is to acquire a future productivity advantage, made better and or with less labor, energy, or raw materials, in creating things that someone really wants and when they'll want them. Sometimes the roundabout method exhibits its physical superiority by making more units of output with the same amount of inputs. In other cases, however, the roundabout process yields a desired output good that literally cannot be produced by any shorter, more direct process. Thus, by using what Bombaver called wise circuitous methods, the superiority of the indirect way manifests itself in being the only way in which certain goods can be obtained. If I may say so, it is so much the better that it is often the only way. As Crusoe shows us, entrepreneurs engaging in roundabout production must contemplate the basic considerations of how long it takes, what it costs, how many resources must be invested to get increased output, and how long one has to wait for a payback, all of which, as we will hear, are impacted by the level of interest rates. Crusoe's one-man economy serves to clarify the simplest, most fundamental features to teach the skeleton, as it were, of the whole structure of economic processes. In that, Bombavirk noted, Robinson aids and pictures of primitive circumstances are very good when the object is to present clearly the simplest typical principles, to give a kind of skeleton of economic procedure. At some point, however, the bare bones must be made more substantial with the living actuality of a modern economic community.
and filled out with abstract formula with explanation and illustration taken from life. Thus the study of production sumveg must leave the lonely shore of our Crusoe and come to the industrial conduct of a great nation with millions of people. In all economies, large and small, the choice in production and deployment of capital comes down to gradations between the direct way and the roundabout way. As Bombavirk wrote, We either put forth our labor just before the goal is reached, or we intentionally take a roundabout way. That is to say, we may put forth our labor in such a way that it at once completes the circle of conditions necessary for the emergence of the desired good, and thus the existence of the good immediately follows the expenditure of the labor. Or we may associate our labor first with the more remote causes of the good, with the object of obtaining not the desired good itself, but approximate cause of the good, which cause, again, must be associated with other suitable materials and powers, till finally, perhaps through a considerable number of intermediate members, the finished good, the instrument of human satisfaction, is obtained. A more lucid and concise account of strategic and teleological process, from the warring states of China to the battlefields of Europe, to the Unternehmer and the investor, has never been written. We might think of the roundabout structure of intermediate capital goods as an autocatalytic process. By that I mean a process in which the product of one reaction becomes the catalyst for further reactions, or, put another way, the process catalyzes itself with growth equaling capital accumulation and reinvestment. The term auto does not imply a lack of human decision at every step. Consumer choice is paramount, and entrepreneurs must act to respond to current and future consumer wants and needs. Production thus becomes autocatalytic and self-reproductive, as the production of higher-order capital goods furthers the production of lower-order consumer goods, with capital continuously improved through innovation to create better lower-order goods. Looking at the process in these terms, we can think of technology, innovation, and production as adaptive learning, incremental steps generated by previous steps, and that lead to other steps, each of which becomes teleonomically, like von Bayer's caterpillar's means to the yet undiscovered ends of the butterfly. There is an apparent programmatic purposefulness, even though each step merely compounds the prior. Technological advancements become embedded in and mixed with existing technologies to make possible other technologies or consumer goods, which perhaps were not possible, or at least not economically producible before. However, there are constraints or breaks on production zumweg, namely positive time preference and interest rates. Bombaver used his Ajo theory to explain interest as flowing from the generally universal higher valuation placed on present versus future goods. E.g., most people would want a good today versus the same good tomorrow, or in a year's time. This is true of all goods in general. Thus, there is a positive interest rate. This framing of the market phenomenon of interest as a result of subjective preferences was a quintessentially Austrian insight and the heart of the theory that earned Bombaverk such a claim. Bombaverk, the bourgeois Marx. Thus far, we have covered a lot of Teutonic territory, which might lead some to accuse me of cultural bias. For whatever reason, one simply cannot overstate the contributions of the German-speaking world, including the Judaic German speakers, of course. But here is one who stands out quite contrary to all those we have covered thus far, Karl Marx. In Das Kapital, published in 1867, Marx challenged the thinking of classical economics by putting forth a labor theory of value, whereby labor played a dominant role in determining value. Marx's arguments centered on the belief that it was labor alone that produced value. Therefore, the value of a product, in Marx's view, should equate to the labor hours invested in it. We know from Menger's subjective theory of value, however, that it is the final product that determines the value of the intermediate inputs, e.g. the bottle of wine makes the grapes and the efforts of the vine dresser worthwhile. To Marx's errant way of thinking, however, the market value of goods was due entirely to the amount of socially necessary labor required for their production. At the same time, because workers were capable of producing more than they needed to survive, the capitalists could get away with selling products for the full amount, corresponding to the labor hours congealed in the products, while giving the workers responsible wages necessary for bare subsistence. The gap, in Marx's view, between the two amounts was surplus value, 
effectively what was skimmed off the workers' produce and taken by parasitic exploiters. When these radical theories were first promulgated, classical economists had no answer to Marx. Therefore, it appeared he had proved his point that capitalism created a class struggle. Although Bastiat, as described in Chapter 4, stood up to the Marxists and the socialists, it was von Balfour who defeated them so effectively with economic theories and critiques, such that Marxism did not take root in economics to the degree that it has in other professions, such as sociology and history. Using impeccable logic, von Balfour showed that the workers who are employed by the entrepreneur are paid immediately for the full value of their labor, so long as that value is correctly calculated by including the time element. After all, in most production processes, the input of labor hours doesn't immediately yield a finished good. Even so, the worker is paid immediately or soon enough, while the entrepreneur must wait, perhaps years, for any potential return. The act of organizing production is effectively the act of lending, as inputs are paid up front in order to command product for sale much later. If the profits exceed the costs of waiting, there is an intertemporal arbitrage between inputs and output to be had. Thus the entrepreneur provides an income for the workers throughout the production process, paying them in advance of the output to which they contribute. Labor was but a part of the entrepreneur's roundabout, indirect means to his often remote and merely potential end of economic profit. Von Bavirk further demonstrated the point rather conclusively with the example of the owner of a house with a market value of £2,000, who paid out exactly £2,000 in wages to the workers who had built it. In this case, Bombaverk argued that there is not a particle of profit that could constitute exploitation. The workers are clearly paid the full product of their labor, according to the Marxist dictum. However, Bombaverk further assumes that the owner can proceed to rent the house out to tenants for a perpetual annual yield of £100 going forward. It is clear that the owner is now earning a perpetual 5% return on his investment, which of course is a form of interest. Yet since, as stipulated, the workers had been paid wages exactly equal to the market value of the good that they produced, Bombaverk asked, Where shall we find the worker from whom the 100 pounds could have been taken either by fraud or force? There is another component to the difference between the workers and the entrepreneur, that is the notion of risk specifically that the workers have considerably less risk than the entrepreneur. When a worker sells his labor hours in exchange for a paycheck, the entrepreneur typically assumes the entire risk of whether the worker's output will end up being marketable. The worker is usually paid up front, with no strings attached to how profitable the entire project ends up. The entrepreneur always faces uncertainty as to the outcome of his investment, and the downside risks of substantial debt or even bankruptcy, while still paying the workers before he himself is paid by the end consumer. Once we take the real-world element of uncertainty into account, it's not clear how we could even apply the Marxist prescription of paying workers the full value of their labor. If a firm goes out of business, should it have the right to claw back the wages it dispersed over the years, because in retrospect the workers involved were clearly overpaid? Thus Bombaverk, whom Josef Schumpeter reverently called the bourgeois Marx for his grand and all-embracing theoretical system, mercilessly delivered a coup de grace to the Marxists and their exploitation theory. The subjective value theory overruled the dialectical hocus-pocus of Marx. In addition, in his famous essay, Karl Marx and the Close of His System, Bombaverk hammered home the huge technical flaw in the Marxist explanation of interest. Surely those today who harbor a discreet affinity for Marx are unaware of the logical fallacies they must implicitly embrace. Bombaverk also put forth an understanding of interest that countered the views of the ancients, who equated interest with something onerous, an opinion held by Aristotle, who believed that money, by its very nature, was incapable of bearing fruit. The lender's gain could only come from defrauding the borrower. The early Christian church had similar ideas and sought to protect poor creditors from rich lenders. However, interest as the cost of time has an entirely different meaning. It is the inherent price one must pay to access capital sooner rather than later, which in turn becomes the threshold for determining one's return and the prudence of making an investment.
Thus, Bumbavirk's theories on capital and interest point the way to guide capitalist decisions on just how roundabout to be. By the time of Bumbavirk's birth in the mid-19th century, the utilization of the highest-of-order goods was being transformed by better and better intermediate tools and methods, which catalytically transformed the production, including delivery via railroads, of all the lower-order goods that followed. Indeed, this burgeoning industrialization of the world was production sumveg writ large, the greatest the world had ever known, and it was surely the source of both that very thesis of Bombavirk, as well as the rationale for capitalization itself. As industrialization came relatively late to continental Europe, the advancement of certain raw materials such as coal, iron, and eventually steel only then began supplanting older, less productive factors of production, in particular timber, as an energy source, just preceding the development of capitalization in the theoretical works of the Austrians, and perhaps even sparking it was the expansion of agriculture at the expense of suddenly less economically viable forested land, and in particular, the necessity of developing a method to weigh the future income realized over time from land devoted to forestry versus other alternatives. Although Bombavirk dealt with financial maturity of timber, discounted cash flows, and other elements of capitalization, there is no evidence that he ever heard of a German forester named Martin Faustmann, who some forty years before the publication of The Positive Theory of Capital had produced the seminal work on forest economics and formalized the use of opportunity cost and capitalization. Faustmann's Forest Economy At the young age of twenty-four, Martin Faustmann became a co-editor of the scientific magazine Allgemeine Forst und Jagdzeitung, General Journal of Forestry and Hunting. At age 27, in 1849, he published in that journal his groundbreaking article, Berechnung des Wutes Wellen Waldboden, so wie nach nicht haubarer Holzbestände für die Waldwirtschaft besitzen, calculation of the value which forest land and immature stands possess for forestry. Faustmann was not the first to undertake such a study. Early in the 19th century, a small number of foresters in Germany and Austria endeavored to value the land capital, Starting with Gottlob Koenig in 1813, the first to treat present value discounting of a tangible asset, at least in forestry, though one is hard-pressed to find it in other realms prior to Koenig. This preceded David Ricardo's soil rent theory of 1817, though it followed Adam Smith's land capital theory of 1776. Faustmann, however, is regarded today as having developed the definitive general and rigorous formula for valuation of forests and land rents. Although some refer to the Koenig-Faustmann formula, it is widely known today only under the name Faustmann. Faustmann sought to correctly answer a simple and pressing question. How economical is an area of forest land? Specifically, how do the expected future forestry economics of that land, viewed in the present, what Faustmann called Budenerwartungsverta, which we'll refer to as the land expectation value, LEV, jibe with the current market value of bare land, the land replacement value, or LRV, of forest land in operation. That is, is available land affordable for use in or for conversion into forestry, or is it better off used for something else? Essentially, Faustmann was trying to calculate the premium or discount of the appraised capitalized present value of forestry land relative to the market's current appraisal of such available land in a fallow state, or say under agricultural use. We can view this as a ratio of the two appraisals, what we'll coin as Faustmann's ratio, LEV over LRV. The message is clear. When Faustmann's ratio is greater than one, the LEV is greater than the LRV, or the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Invest in land for forestry. If nothing else, you can probably then sell it off as a going forestry operation. If the ratio is less than one, the LEV is less than the LRV, or the whole is less than the sum of its parts. Do not invest in that bare land at least for forestry. Here, with Faustmann's ratio, from the deep coniferous forests of Germany and Austria, we have found a central economic concept integral to the rest of this audiobook. What made Faustmann's work so special was that he provided a way to quantify the long, roundabout period of production required in forestry, and the complication of expenses that aren't paid back for many years. Forestry is, by its nature, a long-term proposition, 
It is about eminently forward markets in the future. As we know from Chapter 2, the pattern for many tree species, especially the conifers, is slow growth at first as the tree builds resources and assembles assets. For instance, developing strong roots and thick bark, becoming more efficient and enjoying faster growth later on, until the tree reaches the culminating point of survival in the wild and, ironically, harvesting on the farm. Only by waiting can that accelerated growth be realized. For instance, you get more wood by letting a single tree grow for 15 years than by chopping down three five-year-old trees over the same period. However, in the latter, you get paid incrementally every five years, whereas in the former, you get it all at the end. Thus, before committing land to a forest that may take 15 years to mature enough for pulp and 25 or longer for timber, one must appreciate that the benefits received in the future carry less value than the same benefits received in the present moment. Forestry is the textbook roundabout industry. Faustman devised a formula for the LEV, whereby one can compare the long-term production of forestry with much shorter-term agricultural production, such as hay or barley. During Faustman's day, this was a particularly pressing concern since forest lands were being overtaken by more profitable agricultural production, which, in addition to the difference in price, also brought to bear the time horizon for production. Both hay and pine, certainly at the opposing extremes of production periods, the former with multiple harvests per year and the latter with perhaps a handful of harvests per century, could be compared as alternatives for a given area of land, assuming the suitability of the land for both and thus require an economic basis for the conversion that was literally sweeping the land. Faustman's formula was absolutely essential, and the formal conception of capitalization in what economists would later call imputation was thus born out of necessity. Suffering through the slow growth present is but a means to the future fast growth end, but first the forester must overcome the external constraint on his patience, the opportunity cost of capital. And to German forester's credit, this was an idea hinted at by Friedrich Bastiat, but not yet discovered or formalized until Menger, and ultimately coined in 1914 by Menger's pupil, Wieser. In opportunity cost, the Austrians recognized not only what one must pay, but the foregone opportunity of what that same amount of capital invested elsewhere, with similar risk, could have earned. An entrepreneur who, for example, invests a sum of money in land, must consider not only what he will get from whatever he builds or plants on that property, but also what he could have gotten from alternatives, including leaving it in the bank. The interest rate, therefore, becomes an objective way of determining the true economic costliness of production Sumweg. Faustman's formula for the land expectation value, in simplified form, is LEV equals B over 1 plus I to the R plus B over 1 plus I to the 2R plus b over 1 plus i to the 3r, plus b over 1 plus i to the infinity, equals b over 1 plus i to the r minus 1. Where b is the cash value of the wood at each discrete harvest, less the present value of any thinnings and all ongoing costs along the way, which I have spared the listener for simplicity. i is the appropriate interest rate, the opportunity cost of capital, and r is the rotation period, the number of years between each harvest, when revenues are received. Here, Faustman converts an infinite flow of future land ground rents, Budenrente, a periodic annuity from a series of forest rotations in perpetuity, into their present value, an infinite geometric series that has a conveniently simple result. Faustman's contribution was thus a rigorous method for determining the land expectation value to a forester, which, has been the spinal cord of classical forest economics ever since. In fact, Faustman was likely the first economist to get present value right in this way, using a discounted cash flow analysis that today, of course, is used to value any stream of income, certain or not, most notably stakes in debt and equity, where it has come to be known as the dividend discount model of modern finance theory. The capitalized value of the land is based on the net rents, B in Faustman's formula, that we get out of it relative to what we forego to receive those rents, the opportunity cost of our capital, the discount rate I in Faustman's formula. Naturally, this approach is oversimplified somewhat because it does not take into account that there could be other uses for the land that have a higher value. For example, crops requiring less time to mature for harvest and more frequent cycles of rotation, 
and that a stand can be chopped down at any time as factors change. There is a well-studied switching option embedded in land. Faustman cared only about the land as forest land. The only thing unusual here is R, the rotation period. In fact, determining R was another principal takeaway from Faustman's formula. Even assuming that tree growth is constant, if we start at zero and then increase the rotation period, it will first raise the LEV and then eventually will lower it. The maximum LEV value then corresponds to the optimal rotation period. Note that in Faustman's formula, the cash value of the wood sold at each harvest, B, is itself influenced by the rotation period, as trees keep growing through longer rotations. Faustman's formula also recognizes, of course, the importance of the interest rate, something that the layperson might think has nothing to do with managing a forest. What follows is the axiom of the axe. When the physical growth of the forest and the expected future price of timber are such that they yield a greater return than the market interest rate, the opportunity cost of cutting the timber and selling at the spot price is too high. The forester should stay his axe. However, when the physical growth and expected future price yield a lower return than the interest rate, then the benefit of today's revenue exceeds the opportunity cost of cutting. The forester should chop away. Clearly, then, an increase in the interest rate, with all else equal, reduces the optimal R rotation period. In other words, increase the interest rate and you shorten the profitable period of production. This could be taken right out of an Austrian textbook. The intertemporal decision of when to cut the forest was thus solved. Taking the price of timber and the interest rate is given, as well as the relation between the period of rotation and the revenues to be received from each cutting on this schedule. Faustman showed foresters how to maximize the LEV by finding the optimal R. From there, the true economic discounted value was solved. As an aside, Faustman also proved that the capitalized land value is not dependent on whether the trees are planted as a single-age stand, intermittent management, or are of diverse ages, sustained management. Within a cross-section of a forest, one could find only a single stage in the lifespan of a tree represented, and the land value, the forest value less the growing stock value, would be equivalent to a forest whose cross-section included an entire lifespan. This means we can look at annual rents made up of a subset of the entire growing forest, the annual thinnings, rather than waiting each intermittent rotation period for an entire forest to be leveled. The rotation period is still just as important, as it determines how much is harvested, the magnitude of B, and replanted each year. But now the harvesting frequency is every year, so R equals 1. This is non-trivial, as it simplifies our land expectation value to something even more intuitive, by allowing us to compare the cash value of the wood each annual harvest with the annual discount rate, LEV equals B over I. Despite Bombaverk's time spent surrounded by the Vienna woods, and despite his fixation on the temporal aspect of production, for which the timber industry is perhaps the model case, he never referenced Faustmann's formula. He does, however, along with most notably, his Swedish disciple, Johann Gustav Knut Wicksell, Repeat Faustman's conclusion, the axiom of the axe, that timber is economically viable and thus immature as long as new growth in tree value as a percentage of the current land and stand value, the return on investment capital, ROIC, exceeds the compounding opportunity cost of owning that land and stand value, the opportunity cost of capital, I. This brings us back to Faustman's ratio. We can say that the annual economic return on the land the harvest value as a percentage of the land replacement value is ROIC equals B over LRV, and thus the land expectation value can be restated as LEV equals LRV times ROIC over I. So now Faustman's ratio is in fact LEV over LRV equals ROIC over I. As we can see, the ratio depicts not only the affordability of bare land, the land replacement value, but more specifically the relationship between the tree value production as a percentage of the LRV and the rate at which we are discounting that production. It is, in essence, the return derived from invested capital compared to the replacement cost of that capital. As before, when ROIC exceeds the opportunity cost of capital, the interest rate I, timber should be farmed. When it does not, then interest rates do not warrant the slow tree growth. The soil is too expensive and is better used for a faster rotation crop such as hay, or perhaps for nothing at all. Indeed, 
The axiom of the axe has become a fundamental canon of corporate finance today. What does this mean when growth is slow at first and fast later, as in our accelerating tortoise and hare fable of the conifer? Is it really ideal to chop down the slow-growing young tree at its first hint of life, or to call the race before our tortoise finds his legs? This is the paradox of the roundabout, which we recall as Clip's paradox. You cannot simply measure the economics in the immediate stage, as that would make you Bastiat's bad economist. The immediate may show a loss that is but the means for a later exceedingly profitable stage bestowed by a longer period of production. Faustman's ratio, as a rule of thumb, holds for all capital, beyond only trees and dirt. Thus we can see the common ground of Faustman's discovery of the obvious in forestry and, right behind him, Bombaverk's theory of capital and interest. Lower interest rates, or more precisely, lower time preference, saving now to consume later, lead to more production zum Weg, whether in a pine stand or any other capital goods. Rings of Capital The intertemporal aspect of capital shows that it is heterogeneous, a reality that the Austrian tradition embraces, whereas other economic schools of thought typically treat capital as an amorphous homogeneous blob, which allows them to grossly undervalue its importance and its modifications. Such heterogeneity means not all capital configurations are the same, nor do they generate the same return. Moreover, the expansion of the capital structure does not entail a simultaneous and equiproportional increase in capital throughout its higher and lower orders. Rather, it is a redistribution of proportionate capital among the various orders. Because they explicitly acknowledge the heterogeneity of the capital structure, Austrians are in a unique position to study the market mechanisms that keep the economy's intertemporal production plans in line with the intertemporal preferences of consumers. Bombaverk had his favorite metaphors for capital heterogeneity. His stream, which is not of equal breadth at all stages, with dams at certain points and leakages at others, evokes the favorite image of Sun Tzu. Best of all, though, and conveniently following our conifer leitmotif, Bombaverk offered the depiction of a tree's growth, specifically a crosscut, essentially a large trunk, revealing its annual growth rings in a pattern of concentric circles. Konzentensche Jahresringe. See figure 5.1 in the downloadable PDF. What better image is there of the intertemporal cumulative means-ends process that, as I argue throughout this audiobook, is the very process of productive capital investment? Lose sight of this intertemporal structure, lose one's depth of field, and the productivity is lost. Figure 5.1 should perhaps be affixed to everyone's Bloomberg screen. If this audiobook accomplishes nothing else but makes this point clearly, it will have reached its intended zvek. As the concentric rings illustrate, the production process and value emanate cumulatively from the core. The process flows outward over time, through successive rings, as more factors of production are added to the previous inputs, turning them into intermediate goods. The more intermediate layers there are, the more roundabout production becomes. Then, at the outermost ring, a final finished good is pushed out into the marketplace. Unlike a tree's static rings, however, the area between each ring is constantly being expanded or contracted. Each of the concentric annual rings represents what might be termed as maturity class. The outermost ring includes those parts of the capital that will become finished consumption goods within the next year, ring. The second outermost ring contains the capital that will mature into consumption goods in the second year, and so on. There are other variations within the structure depending on, for example, how developed an economy is. A hypothetical very underdeveloped economy based on only one raw material or one good, perhaps a basic manual tool for digging, would consist of one ring. At the other end of the spectrum, a highly industrialized economy would be depicted by many well-formed embedded circles, with a width that represents the magnitude of the asset classes involved. There will be more rings, reflecting more years and more circuitous processes of production. As Bombaverk explained, within each production area, the amount of capital invested increases with every forward step to a lower maturity class. Bombaverk pointed out that capital structures are cumulative, indeed autocatalytic, what comes before leads to and is contained in what comes later. In effect, we might think of all the previous capital and inputs congealing, or becoming encapsulated, if that's a more palatable term, in the next ring. 
For instance, a most elemental capital good dating back some 10,000 years is a goat, which can be consumed at once as meat, or if female, can become an intermediate tool, which produces milk to consume. Furthermore, that milk, when recombined with a goat's stomach and rennet, can become a factor of production of cheese. The cheese can become an ingredient, perhaps to make fondue and so forth. Each of these consumer goods, in turn, becomes a sequential intermediate good for, and thus is contained in, the next subsequent consumer good, and each adds another ring to an increasingly roundabout production process, not butchering the goat now, sparing the golden goose as it were, and instead waiting, hungry for months, for a great many hopefully exquisite goat's milk tums, is the capitalistic intertemporal trade-off in a nutshell, the very source of humanity's emergence from its historical hand-to-mouth existence. Henry Ford, The Roundabout Unternehmer Capital drives research and development, modernization of plants and processes, creation of new products, and improved distribution systems to bring those products to consumers. And there is but one source of that capital, savings. In the 19th century, the savings rate in the United States, for instance, rose from 15% before the Civil War to 24% in the 1870s and 28% in the 1880s. During this time of great industrial expansion, Capital deepened as profits were invested back into businesses, such as those named Carnegie Steel and Standard Oil. Vertical integration created huge industrial firms that controlled successful stages of manufacturing, all the rings of production, from raw material to finished products, thus magnifying more production sumveg advantages. Workers also benefited from the intermediate capital goods that made them ever more productive and increased their earnings power and their ability to benefit from greater consumer goods. The proliferation of measurement devices, cutting tools, lathes, and machine tools detonated a chain reaction of development of machine tools to make other machine tools to make tools. That tools beget greater tools is the very point of capitalistic production, and along with an understanding of monetary interventionism's bastardization of this process, of Austrian investing itself. The autocataclytic multiplier effect wrought enormous productivity increases everywhere, from farms to factories. At the same time, industrial development spawned new commercial and savings banks, life insurance companies, and investment firms, and the stock market became a dominant source for capital investment. Just before the dawn of the 20th century, inventors in Germany, journeying the road of the Unternehmer, as laid out by their neighbor Bermbawerk, introduced a new mode of transportation that would literally change the world putting horse-drawn conveyances out to pasture and replacing them with vehicles propelled by gasoline-fueled engines. The automobile can be traced back to a German-born Austrian inventor, Siegfried Marcus, who around 1870 put an internal combustion engine on a handcart, the Marcus car. The fabled German engineering continued as inventors Nicholas Otto, Gottlieb Daimler, and Wilhelm Maybach in 1876 produced the first four-cycle engine, although official credit went to countryman Carl Benz, later of Mercedes-Benz fame, in 1879, when he was granted a patent for the internal combustion engine. In 1886, Benz patented his first automobile. On the other side of the Atlantic, in the summer of 1876, a 13-year-old Michigan farm boy was mesmerized when he saw a contraption with a crude steam engine trundling down the road, the first vehicle he'd ever seen powered by something other than a horse. The boy was none other than Henry Ford, who would later recall, It was that engine which took me into automotive transportation. An entrepreneurial pioneer, Ford put the average American in the motor car and established a global enterprise with European operations, especially in Germany, where Ford's fabled mass production was immortalized as Fordismus, an industrial ideal that raised efficiency and productivity. By the time Ford's autobiographical My Life and Work was translated in German in 1923, Mein Leben und Werk, Ford was hailed as an American industrialist superstar. Ford, a pacifist who opposed war as wasteful, was also given the abhorrent honor in the early 1930s of having his portrait displayed on the wall behind Adolf Hitler's desk. Ford was not without his faults, some of them egregious, such as his distrust of financiers, which he personified into a disgusting dislike of those of Jewish descent. Sadly, he was not alone. Many espoused the prejudices of the day. 
But here we separate the man from his mission and recognize him as the embodiment of the roundabout entrepreneur who created a new paradigm of production, the assembly line, as the culmination of vertical integration that depicts the improved efficiency and productivity gained by spanning Bombawerk's Jahresringe with factories and power plants to turn coal, iron ore, and steel into automobiles. Hailed as one of the true luminaries of the modern age, in 1999, Fortune named him the businessman of the century. Ford deserves yet another title, though one he never wore in life. He is the quintessential roundabout entrepreneur in the Austrian tradition. Although he probably never read Bombawerk, but who, no doubt, must have followed this American Unternehmer. Ford seemed to be singing out of the Austrian hymnal when he wrote in his 1926 classic, Today and Tomorrow. The time element in manufacturing stretches from the moment the raw material is separated from the earth to the moment the finished product is delivered to the ultimate consumer. The Austrians described what the Unternehmer knows in his gut. Ford held similar Austrian views on such things as profits as the source of productive capital, that must be reinvested to the ultimate benefit of consumers, and a loathing for the actual operation of the banking and monetary system, which he famously said, if people understood, there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Before the entrepreneur, though, there was the farmer's son, born in 1863, at a time when his Midwestern home state was a wooded frontier, covered by dense forests of oaks, ash, maples, and, of course, conifers. Ford was expected to follow in the footsteps of his father, William, but his natural fascination was for all things mechanical. As a boy, he fashioned for himself a set of tools, from a nail and a corset stay, with which to repair watches, perhaps foreshadowing the entrepreneur who would invest a tremendous amount of time and effort to assemble the tools of production in order to improve speed, efficiency, and output in his manufacturing processes. Mechanics versus farming sparked conflict between son and father, and in 1879, at the age of 16, Henry left home and traveled to Detroit, where he worked in a machine shop and then a shipbuilding factory. After returning to his father's farm in 1882 to help with the harvest, Ford became interested in agricultural equipment and was hired as a machinery demonstrator and repairman for Westinghouse, traveling from farm to farm from 1883 to 1885. In 1886, it was timber that brought Ford back to the farm. Specifically to 80 acres his father offered him in return for a promise to give up being a machinist. Ford agreed, temporarily of course, and set himself up in the lumber business, apparently with a favorable Faustman ratio. In 1888 he married Clara Jane Bryant. The couple had one son, Edsel, named after Ford's closest childhood friend. Despite the deal he'd made with his father, Ford never lost his interest in engines and by 1890 was working on a double-cylinder engine. When he and Clara moved to Detroit, where Ford took a job as an engineer and machinist at the Edison Illuminating Company, eventually becoming chief engineer, his obsession with the horseless carriage intensified. By 1892, he had built his first motor car, and by 1893, he had a model he could test on the road. By the time Ford built a second car in 1895, he already faced a competitive market including a German Benz car on display at Macy's in New York. In 1896, Ford sold his car, the Quadricycle, and like the roundabout entrepreneur he was at heart, invested the proceeds in R&D. Indeed, over the course of his lifetime, Ford Motor Company would not have prospered had the founder not committed to continuous long-term investment in improvements and roundabout production. Although his name is synonymous with automotive manufacturing and entrepreneurial success, Ford failed in his first two ventures, backed in part by a local lumber baron. Some of the greatest entrepreneurs have suffered such setbacks, and some, like Ford's good friend Thomas Edison, went bankrupt. Often these experiences pave the roundabout routes to crazy and obsessive goals. Finally, in 1903, Ford Motor Company was incorporated, and its prototype Model A went into production in a 50 by 250 foot assembly plant, using parts bought from suppliers. Ford was also passionate about racing, believing that, fun aside, it would generate publicity for his cars. In 1904, he set about to break the world's record for land speed, refitting a racer with a Model B engine and racing it across the frozen Lake St. Clair. He completed the third mile in 36 seconds, from a speed of 100 miles per hour, shattering the previous record of 77 miles per hour. His racing stunts apparently worked, and also in 1904, 
the growing company moved into a larger factory. In 1905 through 1906, the company rolled out the four-cylinder Model N, selling for $600, as well as the six-cylinder Model K, $2,800. Ford's true vision, which sometimes put him at odds with his business partners, was not to make roadsters for the rich, but to produce modest, reliable, high-quality cars for working people of more modest means, such as his iconic Model T, introduced in 1908 to an enthusiastic public that, just a few years before, did not even know they craved cars. As Ford once said, If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. With the Model T, Ford transformed his company and brought the American public into the modern era. Led by Ford's vision, the company made the roundabout transition from assembler to manufacturer in every process along the way in order to reduce costs, gain more control over supplies, and eliminate unnecessary inventory, thus making huge gains in efficiency and innovation. Detroit was the Silicon Valley of its day. The decision was driven by economics. With mass production, Ford could make parts at a lower cost and more quickly than buying them from suppliers. The flagship for his roundabout production was the River Rouge plant, which included a port and shipyard, steelmaking, a foundry, a body-making plant, a sawmill, rubber processing, a cement plant, a power plant, and an assembly plant. It was the epitome of production Zumweg, which at the outset literally consumes time and requires great capital expenditures to be, in Ford's words, turned back into the business so that it may be still better fitted to serve, and in part passed on to the purchasers. The roundabout paradox is that the process of becoming more circuitous takes a tremendous amount of time, during which there is little to show for the sacrifice, a la Robinson Crusoe, but at the end results in significant time savings. Like the conifer, it is slow at the start, so that it can accelerate at the end. After showing extraordinary patience during the building of the roundabout production process, once it was in place, Ford switched gears temporarily and became obsessed with timing the car-making production process to see how he can make it faster. An annual output of the Model T rose from 585,000 vehicles in 1916 to 1 million in 1921, and then doubled to 2 million just two years later. Speed and efficiency were crucial as supervisors patrolled the plant floor with stopwatches to time production. Newspapers wrote about the astonishing pace of the assembly process. One 1913 account told of a Model T put together by a team from pre-assembled parts in two and a half minutes. Soon the company would boast a new Ford was born every 24 seconds. Ford, the entrepreneurial hero of the common man, believed the production gains at River Rouge would cut deeply and in many directions into the price of everything we make, bringing down the prices of cars and also farm equipment. It is important that it shall be cheap, Ford said of the tractor. Otherwise, power will not go to the farmers. By getting the farmer used to the comfort and power of the automobile, Ford hoped to convert them to mechanized farm equipment to ease the physical labor of farming, a drudgery he knew all too well. Contemplating Ford's life and work, we see how the pursuit of production Sumveg is the indirect path, but one that is undertaken with single-minded purpose and tenacity. Yes, Ford had his share of trials and errors as part of the learning and discovery process, but his mission to efficiently produce cars for the masses never wavered. Although it has become fashionable in some quarters to speak of following one's bliss, hoping to stumble upon profit as if blindfolded along a daisy-strewn path, as John Kay, author of Obliquity, an academic's take on indirectness might have us believe. This is not how the real world works and progresses. Entrepreneurs do not dabble willy-nilly in pursuits of fancy, chasing butterflies or endless real optionality. Theirs is a practice of assuming an uncomfortable position in the difficult sunk costs required for the tools to achieve their clear goals. Even when their roundabout processes take them back to the drawing board countless times, to reinvent the very tools they need to produce their final goods, they are decidedly and determinedly purposeful. Nor do entrepreneurs pursue rainbows down some picturesquely meandering path because of serendipity, kismet, and chance. Their indirectness is always calculated. They know where they are going, though never knowing, of course, if they will actually get there, while keeping their minds open to the evaluation and modification of goals from what is learned along the way. They move in a circuitous fashion from zeal to zeal, but never forget for an instant that these are the middle to a zvek.
This is the singular and profound teleological discovery process of markets. For Ford, the zeal of increased efficiencies and lower production costs drove toward a zvek of lower prices for consumers and ultimately a more productive business, believing that the ultimate beneficiary ought to be the public, a postulate that would have put him in good stead with the Austrian school. If it were within my power to go back in time to arrange a meeting, it would surely be between Ford, Bombavirk, and Mises, whose lives overlapped. Ford stood for the buying public and its right to goods and services at the lowest possible cost. He believed it was far better to sell a large number of cars at a reasonably small margin than to sell fewer cars at a large margin of profit. With this attitude, he viewed a profit as far more a fund to ensure future progress than it is a payment for past performance. Paying out profits in the form of dividends, particularly on preferred stock with burdensome payouts, put profits into a few hands rather than back into more roundabout production. As Ford said, the owners and the workers will get their reward by the increased amount of business the lower prices bring. Industry cannot exist for a class. Insufficient capital reinvestment, as we will revisit later on, is essentially capital consumption in lieu of the roundabout. Focusing on profits over productivity, ends over means was, in Ford's words, trying to drive with the cart before the horse. Ford warned against the most common error of confusing money and business, which he blamed on the stock market for leading people to believe that business is good if there is lively gambling upward in stocks, and bad if the gamblers happen to be forcing stock prices down. He eloquently viewed the stock market as a sideshow, and little did he know how increasingly true this would be as so much of investing today is the domain of punters, over-seekers of productive capital. To Ford, like in Taiji Kwan and at the Wei Chi board, there were two distinct games going on between the stock market and true investment, the former a mere shadow of the latter. Disdainful of finance and suspicious of banks all his life, his abominable stereotypes and prejudices aside, Ford made the short-sighted finance of Wall Street his nemesis, viewing it as strings on a business in stark opposition to his roundabout redirecting of profits back into the operation and focusing instead on an immediate return. The majority are so interested in getting the utmost out of the machine that they will give no time to improving it as it runs. Ford cited the parable of the talents, interestingly, as Clausewitz did, in Chapter 3, to whom much is given, of him shall be much required thus exhorting entrepreneurs never to sacrifice working capital for the sake of amassing personal fortune. He exposed what he called the fallacy which has steered our country and other countries wrong on so many matters touching industry, the fallacy that business is money and that big business is big money. Make no mistake, Ford was a true blue capitalist who believed in making profits, but rather than consuming the capital produced today, saw the infinitely better wisdom of reinvesting intertemporally for a position of greater strategic advantage. As Ford Motor Company expanded, the costs were paid for by efficiencies gained through faster output at the last ring of production, and by eliminating in previous rings stockpiles of iron, coal, and steel, all unnecessary inventories that Ford saw as idle waste. By the mid-1920s he would boast, We do not own or use a single warehouse. Ford also didn't believe in having too much labor on hand, considering hiring two men for the job of one to be a crime against society, although he did have to account for high turnover because of the tedium of the assembly line work. In 1913, turnover reached an unbelievable 370%, and Ford hired more than 50,000 people to maintain an average labor force of about 13,600. When profits swelled, he paid well for labor, creating an uproar when he doubled the basic wage to $5 a day, which triggered a virtual stampede of job seekers. Paying higher wages for labor was not altruistic in Ford's eyes. Moreover, it wasn't simply that Ford was trying to pay his workers enough to buy back the product, although he did preach a high-wage doctrine after the stock market crash in 1929. Rather, paying relatively high wages was, for Ford, a matter of smart business, he regarded well-paid skilled workers as important as high-grade material. By paying workers well, he effectively lowered his costs because higher wages reduced turnover and the need for constant training of new hires. At the time, the newspapers saw Ford's wage increase as an extraordinary gesture of goodwill. With his wage policy, Ford also fired a shot across the bow of Roosevelt's New Deal, which he vehemently opposed, 
believing that higher wages and less restriction on business and not higher taxes would benefit the country. Unlike the other automakers, Ford refused to go along with Roosevelt's Blue Eagle campaign, an insignia for goods manufactured by companies that supported the administration's economic and wage policies. An enraged Ford blustered, Hell, that Roosevelt buzzard! I wouldn't put that on my car. Rather than embrace the National Recovery Administration, NRA, and the New Deal, which Ford dismissed as these alphabet schemes, he preached that American businesses should take hold of their industries and run them with good, sound American business sense. Ford, perhaps more than any other industrialist opponent of the New Deal, could take such a public stand with confidence. Nobody could accuse him of hiding behind empty rhetoric, since he had voluntarily raised his workers' wages amid the ravages of the Great Depression. It wasn't a matter of his personal greed or indifference to the plight of his employees. Ford really did believe that the Roosevelt administration was overstepping the proper bounds of the federal government. Ford extended his production metaphors to the economic machinery of the country, believing it wisest to make improvements when things were going well, rather than waiting for a breakdown, and warned against seeing depressions as unpreventable epidemics. As we will hear in Chapter 7, such words would have rung true with Mises. As Ford observed, the seeds of bad times are in the mistakes which we make in the good times. Yet in the good times, no one wants to hear of the mistakes we may be making. The policy then is to get while the getting is good. The economic machine breaks, Ford believed, because of our ignorance of all the natural laws which regulate economic health, our mistaken belief that business can run only so long without smashing. As we will hear in Chapter 8, the economic machine does have natural internal controls that govern it, and they are undermined and short-circuited by the ignorance of interventionism. Warning against the evils of inflation that gives the illusion of buying power and speculation that comes from the perception of shortage, Ford sounded decidedly Austrian themes. When it came to monetary reform, Ford was all for sound money, but unfortunately, under the influence of his friend Edison, supported a monetary system backed not with gold, but instead with American agricultural products. Known as Ford Edison money, the proposal was motivated by a desire to spare farmers from expensive interest payments to the bankers, a position that neglected Bombaverk's insights about the genuine fact of time preference as the cause of interest. While naturally favored by farmers, it failed to find widespread support and was abandoned. Our focus on Ford, though, is not for his political or monetary ideas, but for those in which he showed genius like no other, as a roundabout entrepreneur who rightly regarded capital as the lifeblood of a progressing business and economy. His was an inherently intertemporal orientation, and his depth of field stretched beyond any one year or season, like the good farmer he was at heart. It was no coincidence, then, that the more successful Ford became, the more he embraced his agrarian roots, which he had never really abandoned, he immortalized the rural idea in his greenfield village near Dearborn, Michigan, where more than 80 historic structures are preserved, from the Wright Brothers Cycle Shop to Edison's Menlo Park Laboratory, where he experimented with the electric light. Wandering the grounds gives insight into Ford's resolve for authenticity, simplicity, and patience. One can imagine him, in his later years, reveling in threshing hay by hand. Indeed, in these he gained his greatest edge. These icons of the past, however, so revered by Ford, are not merely dusty relics. In them are preserved the seeds of the future they sowed, the very tangible reminders of the roundabout process of discovery and innovation that leads to the progress of capitalism and the advancement of civilization. The Roundabout of Life Much of human activity, particularly in endeavors that are more strategic, and I use the Clausewitzian Zielzweck means of gaining greater superiority definition, or higher order versus those that are less so, benefits from roundaboutness and a decidedly indirect means-end approach. Despite the strategic advantage of being umvig, it is extremely difficult to think and act in this way, as we will address in the next chapter. Most people just can't do it. If roundabout were easy, then everyone would do it, and no doubt the strategic advantage derived from it would be eliminated altogether. Moreover, the roundabout route may very well be overlooked because all we tend to see is the final product, the ultimate end, while we are blind to what came before, the remote means to that end. And yet there are enough examples in life that demonstrate the advantages of roundaboutness, even outside of the obvious martial applications. Once again, like good Taoists, 
we turn to nature. The evolutionary mechanism of mate selection often employs a strategy whose aims are indirect benefits in the form of better adaptive genetic characteristics for the offspring, as opposed to direct and immediate benefits realized by the mates. This is a pretty extraordinary thing. The same intertemporal, intergenerational strategy of the conifers growing on the rocks, where what happens in this moment is but a means to a strategic advantage for the progeny. Selection for offspring fitness in this way shapes the very mechanisms that enable this roundabout process to persist. As we look for other examples of strategic means ends thinking, when the talk of strategy shifts from the theoretical to real world applications, it is unavoidable to consider sports. Clearly across different sports, there exists a gradation between the tactical, e.g. executing one isolated play at a time, and the strategic, e.g. treating individual plays as intermediate parts of a greater play. Along this continuum, surely basketball falls as more tactical. The execution of an independent series of two- and three-point plays spurious momentum aside. Football, American as well as European, would perhaps fall somewhere in the middle as mostly tactical and only somewhat strategic in the Clausewitzian sense. Others stand out as more roundabout, higher-order games. For instance, there was a lesson to be learned in the 2006 British Open of golf, which was won by Tiger Woods with what appeared at the time to be a counterintuitive and counterproductive strategy. On an extremely difficult course, Woods, one of the longest hitters on the tour at the time, retreated from his signature massive drives and instead teed off using only four and five irons meant only for medium-range play. The reason, as author Andreas Kluth relates in his book Hannibal and Me, is that Woods had inverted the mental process of the ordinary golf player. This calls to mind the same inversion needed at the Wei Chi board in Chapter 3, as well as the maxim of Carl Gustav Jakob Jacobi, the 19th-century German mathematician, Man muss immer umkehren, or loosely, Invert, always invert, meaning solutions to difficult problems can often be found by examining them in the inverse. In his game, Woods looked beyond the fairway to the pin, not the green, but the pin. He then figured out where on the fairway his ball should land that would give him the positional advantage of the optimal spot from which to approach the pin. Thus, his early shots were mere means for his advantageous later shots with the ultimate end of an easy putt. Such inversions reveal, and are perhaps the only way to come to, the counterintuitive optimal approaches in such roundabout games. Like the strategy of Tui Shou from Chapter 1, there are the feints of fencing, tennis and especially the gentleman's game of squash, where progressive drawing shots pull the opponent out of position and set up a subsequent decisive attack. It is generally understood in squash, specifically the softball or international game, that one must think by inversion two or more shots ahead. This is a simpler instance of an intrinsic strategy in perhaps the most roundabout game of ice hockey. The traditional sport affords Northwood's hockey town home, the patient cycling of the puck around the offensive zone, a literal roundabout, using time to tease out imbalances and a seam in the defense and find an open shot or passing lane to the goal, as opposed to charging directly through traffic. Hockey's dominant forecheck strategy is another less obvious instance of the circumvention strategy at play. Again, this is about planning several passes ahead. Schur versus Lee. Strategy as a sequence of stages inverted back from the goal. Surely Wayne Gretzky was referencing Bastiat when he said, A good hockey player plays where the puck is. A great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. It was through the sport of sailboat dinghy racing on a small Lake Michigan Bay that, as a child, I first encountered the counterintuitively circuitous and surely sports are the best way to discover it as children on our own. A persistently shifting wind favors the boat on the seemingly less direct upwind route, thus saving the most direct route for when it is most advantageous. Even on a downwind leg, the straightest line along a race course from buoy to buoy, although clearly the shortest route, is best avoided for a roundabout one. Heading away from the buoy on a slight reach at first in order to then head directly at it with a much speedier point of sail, creates a longer but surprisingly faster course. Perhaps nowhere is this subtle intertemporalizing into Zielsvek stages more plain than in baseball. This was particularly exemplified in the coaching philosophy of Hall of Famer Earl Weaver, one of the greatest managers in the history of baseball. Weaver, who in late January 2013, as I was still drafting this chapter, died at the age of 82, 
won four American League pennants and a World Series during his 17 seasons with the Baltimore Orioles, to which my beloved Rochester Red Wings was a farm team. With the view that baseball is plain old common sense, so reminiscent of Clip, Weaver's approach to the game could be best described as production sumweg, and stressed using his player rotation to gain the greatest chance for an eventual opportunistic swing of the bat, but not every swing of the bat, nor certainly even every at-bat, Sure versus Lee. As Weaver told his players, wait for the pitch you can hit out of the park. If it doesn't come, take the walk down to first base so you can score if the next batter gets his pitch. Weaver's words recall the advice of Ted Williams to wait for the fat pitch, a famous model of Warren Buffett. But Weaver's approach is much more nuanced, employing depth of field rather than just patience. The key was to see beyond the immediate at-bat, never waste an out with a bunt or an attempted at steal, and maximize the potency of later at-bats. Base runners even give advantage to the batter by creating gaps. There are two distinct parts to implement a Weaver strategy. The first is the zeal of getting on base, which then becomes the middle for the zvek of scoring many runs, i.e. winning games, likely through a multiple-run homer. But if batters try instead to go directly for the zvek of a run with every batter, every runner, and every inning, then that will be the result, one run eked out at a time, a decidedly less productive approach, by focusing on the zeal of runners on base, meaning focusing on high on-base percentages, Weaver increased his chances of realizing his vec that won games. This was and remains a highly controversial approach, now known as Big Ball from Michael Lewis's wonderful book Moneyball, though more aptly should be known as Weaver, Sure, or Roundabout Ball. As we might see through the Austrian lens, Weaver extended the team's period of production within each inning by building his intermediate goods in runners on base. And then, when all goes right, came the final consumer good, when the Unternehmer finally gets paid, the base-clearing hit. Again, the inverted path traced back from ends to means reveals a circuitous route. We instinctively understand the roundabout in much of sport. It is perhaps what makes it so interesting. How, then, do we so often disregard it in investing? It is a superior strategy and perhaps more than we think, pervading even the more prosaic games of chance, from the vulnerable builders of backgammon to the trapping bluffs of poker, where early bluff losses are a means to eventual big pots when the advantage is greatest. Finally, we can return to the supreme game of strategy, and one of the very oldest in human history, Wei Qi, which reminds us that victory does not come from the direct pursuit of one's aims, with the do-or-die of a Lee strategy, in which every engagement, every tee shot, every at-bat, has its own zvek. Rather, it belongs to the sure strategist, who retreats now, going for a shorter shot to the fairway, or taking the walk to first, in order to gain the zeal of greater positional advantage, from which to achieve the ultimate zvek. Within this multi-stage, indirect means toward remote ends, we find Wu Wei, not going directly for the goal, and in so doing reaching it all the more effectively. And what holds true at the Wei Qi board also applies to the Austrian Unternehmer, who engages in an intertemporal exchange for advantage later. In the universality of strategic thought and decision-making of Schur and Umwig, embraced and embodied by the Austrian who defined the roundaboutness of successful entrepreneurship and the American who put it into practice, we have completed the path through our Austro-Asian world and brought it to the New World. For now we stay in the realm of Bermbawerk and the Unternehmer, for whom the opportunities and the challenges are the same. To become ever more roundabout, overcoming our innate desire for immediacy, all for the ultimate benefit of the consumer and, by extension, to all of material society. Yet, as we will soon hear, pursuing that goal is completely contrary to that very humanness about us. Chapter 6 Time Preference Overcoming That Humanness About Us It is an inconvenient and unfortunate fact about Austrian investing, the destination of this audiobook toward which we have been making our way. It is nearly impossible to implement. A very real and deeply encoded impediment acts as a natural built-in barrier, that humanness about us. We are not made with a predilection toward sure, roundaboutness, and capitalistic production and investment, we are adaptively designed to favor the tactical Lee, immediate, direct, decisive, over the strategic sure. 
intermediate, indirect, roundabout. It is no wonder, then, that having an intertemporal perspective and perception is such an underestimated and overlooked advantage, and yet it is also one of the most influential, a distinct intelligence, and key to our success. Our perception of time is central to this audiobook, and to our ability, or far more likely inability, to implement its methodology of Austrian investing. You see, the roundabout runs afoul of the very way we perceive the ticking of the clock, and more specifically, all the moments and all those ticks and talks. As we will hear, our perception of time is diametrically opposed to our appreciation of and our ability to engage in the roundabout. And yet, because the direct, the Lee, is endemic to humans, we have within our grasp the means to exploit it in others, that is, if we can overcome the seemingly insurmountable. To do so, we must make the turn toward sure, by going against the grain of our very nature. This requires a complete inversion of a behavioral pattern known as time inconsistency, and generally expressed mathematically with a hyperbolic discounting model. This pattern, present in all of us and distorted to extreme and even dangerous levels in the cases of addictions, is to be impatient now, all the while holding fast to the self-delusion of being able to be patient later. And of course, when later becomes now, we are just as impatient. We expect to act very differently through time than we actually do, predictably throwing a wrench in our best laid plans, especially the more roundabout ones. This phenomenon plagues us in all aspects of life, not just in financial decisions, but also things such as weight loss, learning a foreign language, catching up with old friends, and so forth. We always want to do something a bit onerous that will shower us with long-term benefits, but we never want to do it today. Unless we find a way to deal effectively with our skewed time expectations, everything we have discussed up to this point becomes moot, a mere intellectual flight of fancy with no chance of ever being implemented. In Austrian investing, we must plan to do and then actually do the complete opposite of these ingrained time expectations. We must instead become strategically patient now, but not at the practice of some virtue toward realizing a platitude-laden future. Rather, we are patient now for the sole purpose of becoming intensely and rapaciously impatient later. Though difficult to perceive, this is the teleological, casual arrow of time in roundabout investing. This calls to mind Henry Ford, who exhibited tremendous patience as he waited for months, if not years, all the while spending profits on a production plant and equipment to become more roundabout. Then, when production started, he stood there impatiently with a stopwatch, counting the seconds until each finished car rolled off the assembly line. This roundabout ideal is a temporal two-step, a dance of duality that defies the reality of how we really think and act over time. Just ask any dieter who absolutely must have a slice of Schaukoladenkuchen now, but is completely convinced of having the ability to start and stick to a diet tomorrow. Impatience now, with the belief that we can and will be patient later, is the way of all flesh. So we must see time differently, in a whole new intertemporal dimension. The roundabout, the pain of positioning and paying now for the advantage and payoff later, only works when we remove our temporal blinders that keep us hyper-focused in the moment. Then, and only then, can we pursue those proximal aims intended to give us an intermediate advantage from which the distal ends are more easily and effectively achieved. To say this is extremely challenging is an understatement. The reason for this difficulty can be found in our wiring, those genetic tracings of our evolutionary journey rooted in survival, when overlooking immediate needs was reckless and life-threatening. Yet the continuation of that same journey has been made possible by gains attained sequentially along the roundabout, making simple tools, domestication of animals, growing, harvesting, and storing grains, smelting ores and metals, and eventually, through the ongoing march of entrepreneurial progress, amassing the most intricate capital structures, building inner rings of capital, as Eugen von Bambavirk showed in his Jahresringe from which the grand scope of the industrial and digital revolutions arose. These monumental human achievements would not have been possible without the ability to forego in the immediate, Lee, for potential advancement in a forward slice of time, sure. To follow this path, this Tao, we first must become aware of our inherent time preference and subjugate our myopic time inconsistency that makes us extremely impatient with a high time preference 
now while anticipating subsequent abundant patience with a low time preference. We must become like the Taoist manipulative sage, who first humbles himself to be in a better position to rise later, the archer with crossbow drawn seeking the positioning, or sing from which to then overwhelm the enemy. Grasping time preference and time inconsistency is the gateway between learning about the roundabout and actually putting it into practice. The sole purpose of this chapter is to help make this mental leap. These two interconnected and complementary concepts provide a baseline of instinctual habit and behavior from which we must resolutely deviate. The objective is to arm ourselves with intertemporal tools that allow us to accumulate and distribute positional advantage through time, rather than concentrate it in a decisive, arbitrary present. Here, too, is the invaluable legacy of the Austrians, and most notably the great Bombavirk, whose pioneering work in time preference brought into the spotlight the cognitive, emotional, and psychological origins of this behavior. Thus, the man who gave us the roundabout also concurrently first spelled out the severe dilemma in its implementation, while also providing a roadmap of awareness to help us navigate the traps of our own perception and cognition. Following Bombaver, we must learn to hold our desire for immediacy in abeyance and plumb our full depth of field, requiring the disposition of the roundabout Bombaverkian Untenema, who needs patience in the first stages in order to become impatient in the latter to position for eventual rapacious opportunism. As his student, Ludwig von Mises, would later stress, there is no point in perpetual abstinence or waiting. Eventually the individual must decide to consume, and in that moment the primordial fact of time preference, the desire to act in this moment, manifests itself. In this way, what I have dubbed Austrian investing contrasts starkly to the far more typical investing approach that only weighs current contemporaneous opportunities one against the other, hungry for yield, blind to the changing opportunities likely to materialize around the next bend. The atemporal head-on clash, which, unlike the sure approach, assesses each exaggerated present moment as the same. As I intend to show in the final chapters, without the benefit of a singular intertemporal orientation, we deprive ourselves of perhaps the best capital investments. As we remind ourselves from Chapter 1, Adopting an intertemporal depth of field is most definitely not about merely having patience, nor is it the cliched long-term view anchored in the present moment that is a constant refrain among many investors, most notably the time frame of forever advocated by value investors such as Warren Buffett. In fact, it is quite contrary to it. Long-term is but a trajectory from now to the distant future that effectively, and by definition, must ignore the sequence of many ripe time slices in the middle. Austrian investing is about an intertemporal exchange as the very source of profit, now for an anticipated later. This exchange was central to the wisdom of our old grain trader Everett Clipp at the Chicago Board of Trade, where demands for immediacy in the pit bestowed an edge on those able to provide it, the basis of virtually all bona fide investment edges. For this task we embrace the circuitousness of Wu Wei, of doing by not doing and gaining by losing, and of Clip's loving to lose. All the while we keep in mind that the patience and false humility of Wu Wei are neither procrastination nor passive waiting. Robinson Crusoe did not forego fishing with a spear in order to lie in a hammock all day. He retreated from the water and the fulfillment of his daily needs, eschewing the smaller, sooner reward, so he could redistribute his resources of time and energy to build a boat and make a net, and thus fish all the more effectively later on. In that forward moment, he could be greedy for all he could catch, the larger, later reward. But first, he was mighty hungry. And so we, too, must be willing to do the difficult and uncomfortable, to reallocate our attention span intertemporally, sharpening our perception of the forward moments from telescopic, fuzzy, and ill-informed to clear and salient. There has been one continuous theme to this audiobook, utilizing the present as means for opportunistic exploits in the future, in Bombavirk's words, our economical conduct has exceedingly little reference to the present, but is almost entirely taken up with the future. But how do we accomplish such a feat for ourselves? It starts with the basic meta-knowledge of our time preference, and in later chapters we will come to understand the costs of our often misplaced biology. We acknowledge that time preference is so subjective and contextual, with variability from one individual to the next, due to factors such as age and environment, 
and within the same individual from one moment to another, due to circumstances or a particular slate of choices. But mostly, we must recognize our consistent temporal bias. Although it may seem irrational, it is not. Rather, it is how we got here. Part of the calling card of membership in Homo sapiens. And so we confront our evolutionary fears of scarcity and even of our own mortality. Becoming aware of and even overcoming our time preferences do not occur simply by wishing or wanting it to be so. If it were that easy, then everyone would do it. And as we said about production Sumweg in Chapter 5, any advantage from it would no doubt disappear. There would be a great many Henry Fords foregoing profits to build more tools. The key is in the human brain and what we know about those gray matter structures that govern our thoughts, impulses, desires, and behaviors. But before going to the scientific and empirical, we again follow the lead of the Austrians by taking a logical, deductive approach that starts with the individual. In his astute observations of human nature, Bambavirk was the first, along with John Ray, an obscure 19th century economist whom Bambavirk thanked for his contributions, which he then greatly surpassed, to connect the dots from time preference to time inconsistency and hyperbolic discounting as the most daunting challenges to production zum Weg. To see that Bambavirk anticipated the modern work in behavioral economics and finance, consider this passage. Who of us, faced with disagreeable but unavoidable visits or errands or tasks that had to be attended to within a certain time, has not postponed them from the days when it would have been relatively convenient to attend to them, and then finally been forced to act in hurry and haste? To model procrastination, where someone really does intend to do something, just not right now, involves not merely a discount on future enjoyments, but a more subtle problem of time inconsistency, of thinking that what is too onerous in the present will somehow be easier to endure in the future. For example, we have a high time preference now, with a predilection for consumption, but we expect that in the future our time preference will somehow be lower, enabling us to forego consumption and or save later on. Universal to us humans is the difficulty of doing the exact opposite, inverting our natural drives and desires so to endure a negative present stage in order to enjoy a positive future stage. Yet the time inconsistency identified by Bambavirk had remained all but unknown in finance until its empirical discovery a few decades ago by behavioral psychologists, most notably studying addiction, its tremendous financial implications specifically to capital investment and valuation remained unrecognized until now. Thanks to Bambavirk, we can build the awareness and self-knowledge that allow us to apply these means to our desired ends of Austrian investing. For that, we return to a pioneer in the identification and study of what we now call time preference. Radical Bambavirk and the Psychology of Time Preference Bambavirk viewed economics and time as inextricably linked. Like time is to music, something close to the heart of any Viennese, it is the very canvas of capital and economics. It can be stretched, compressed, and distorted with dramatic implications. These implications were the whole point of his groundbreaking views of the intertemporal trade-off between present and future, the first to move beyond capital productivity and interest theory alone, and as noted earlier, bring in cognitive aspects. Where he became truly radical, however, was in the emotional factors, particularly by introducing the concept of willpower, clearly an emotional force, and the effort required to delay gratification. By acknowledging the psychological and emotional aspects of time preference, Bambavirk made a distinct departure from any depiction of intertemporal choice solely with regard to the cognitive, and in so doing made strides in understanding how all these triggers influenced perception and behavior. Although the present moment is all that we can experience, our future is certainly no less material. As Bambavirk observed, what is going to happen to us in a week or in a year is no less something touching us than what happens to us today. It is therefore equally entitled to be considered in our own economy, for the object of that economy is to provide for our well-being. Bambavirk's prescription for the organization and management of our resources is the equal treatment of present and future as an ideal. In other words, temporal depth. We engage in more than just the current moment, the realm of our immediate self. Bambavirk evokes all of our many forward moments that touch all of our many forward selves. All are equally ourselves. All have equality of rights. 
Though whether this equality of rights as a matter of principle is matched by a full equality of rights as a matter of practice is another question. Here Bambaverk anticipates the future self-psychological disconnect literature that started in the 1970s. We are estranged from our forward selves because we lack the gift of literally feeling in advance the emotions we shall experience in the future. Our chauvinism for the present self, the one certainly closest in temporal proximity and the most tangible to our experience, is such that we often neglect our forward selves. As Bambaver cautioned, how often does a man from weakness let himself be hurried into taking some step or making some promise which he knows at the moment he will rue before twenty-four hours are over? The cause of such hasty actions, he added, is not a lack of knowledge but rather a defect of will. This is Bambaverk the proselytizer of the emotional will required for production sumvig, for tolerating a present loss in order to achieve a future advantage. So, given the future's importance to our well-being, how can the present hold us in such a vice grip? It is understandable in the case of the person in want from Chapter 5, Bambaverk's poor peasant or starving artisan. If one's future existence is in question, there can be only the present to consider, as surviving the present is a necessary condition to making it to any future. The same might be said for anyone who most acutely feels his mortality, such as people engaged in very perilous callings. What about everyone else, though, who presumably can and certainly should be more thoughtful of the future than the current moment? It is a problem that has plagued people across cultures and centuries. As Bambaverk observed, how many an Indian tribe, with careless greed, has sold the land of its fathers, the source of its maintenance, to the pale faces for a couple of casks of fire water? The same behavior is observable, he added, in the working man who drinks on Sunday the week's wages he gets on Saturday, and starves along with his wife and child the next six days. Because of pleasure in and the availability of the moment, opportunity and well-being are easily compromised for the future. The present, of course, carries quite the emotional charge, the desire to live in the moment. There is a whole system of thought, prevalent in Eastern and Western meditation, to expand one's awareness of the present, and, of course, there is merit in stopping to smell the proverbial roses. Our carpe diem attitude, however, should be to seize every day, each individual slice of time, but never one at the expense of all the others to come. The German-born physicist Albert Einstein once wisely consoled a grieving friend to hold past and future moments as equals to the present. Our live-for-today culture has been invaded, like a deadly virus, by an insidious attitude that teaches this moment is all that matters just because it is all we see and experience, right now. The symptoms of this affliction can be found in the chronically low savings rate in our culture, ranging from financial to even fresh water, soil, and of course forests. And analogously, and most incredibly, governmental fiscal deficits that deviously and increasingly rob future generations, our helpless intergenerational forward selves. Thus, to think and act intertemporally, we must go against what our culture teaches us. Would we not want to live our lives as a complete series of moments to the best and fullest way possible? It takes more than flipping a temporal switch to adopt a more time-consistent orientation, just as any positive or therapeutic behavior change dieting, smoking cessation, or overcoming an addiction, takes effort and commitment. Because we cannot feel our future feelings, we focus, often obsessively, on the present. As Bambaverk wrote, whether it be that our power of representation and abstraction is not strong enough, or whether it be that we will not take the necessary trouble, the consideration we give our future, and particularly our faraway future wants, is more or less imperfect. A decided incompleteness of the imaginations keeps us from projecting accurately, even perceiving at all what lies ahead. The perspective is not the only span of time slices altered by perception. Its mirror image, the retrospective, has its own brand of myopia, called static gestalt characteristics. We tend to remember things based on singular moments, how they come to a close, in addition to the peak intensity moment, their most temporally adjacent moment that marks the end of the past and the beginning of the future. Researchers have explained this phenomenon with a metaphor inspired by writer Milan Kundera, that memory does not take film, it takes photographs. We can see this as a focusing illusion, whereby, as Daniel Kahneman wrote, our mistake is one of attention to selected moments and neglect of what happens at other times. We just don't process and perceive time very well, neither forward nor backward. 
Our mental time travel, forward and back, is imperfect. Interestingly, amnesiacs and schizophrenics, who experience memory losses and deficiencies, struggle with planning for and imagining the future. All of us, to some degree, experience, perceive, and recall time very differently than the linear movement of the clock, and downright erroneously. We weight the future and the past subjectively and disproportionately, such that, like the warnings on the rearview mirror, they seem fuzzier and further away in proximity to the present. Fortunately, despite the difficulties, humans are capable of making certain intertemporal compromises, overcoming our time inconsistent hardwiring. If we were not, our species would still be living in caves using the most basic of tools. Humans are not alone in this capacity, which we share with many animals, birds, and even plants, in particular the oldest species on Earth, the conifers. The more developed the species, the deeper its depth of field, taking a teleological series of intermediate, interconnected steps as a necessary expedient for later competitive advantage. Similarly, older people are better at overcoming the impulsivity we associate with youth. Ironically, it is the young adult, in the deep end of the temporal pool, who lives like there is no tomorrow, while older folk, who have far fewer actuarial years ahead, are better able to make intertemporal choices that prepare for a future, perhaps that may very well exceed their own lifespan, thus thinking and acting for the benefit of intergenerational fitness and advantage. It is a universal trait within living systems to make intertemporal trade-offs, as if on the basis of some cost-benefit analysis, though skewed, with the willingness to pay a cost early on provided there is a sufficient larger benefit to be realized later. In contrast, the river, as an example of a non-living complex system, can do naught but follow the direct course. It cannot bend right with the intention to bend left. For example, running uphill now, in order to descend down an even steeper hillside later on. Although the surge of pent-up water is a favorite Taoist image of Shur, we cannot take on the mindless meandering of the river. This temporal teleology is, indeed, a mark of life itself. We must actualize this capacity to make decisions and take actions whose consequences unfold intertemporally, with a separation between cause and effect, means and ends, zeal und zweck. But as we will see, there are tragic and revealing circumstances when the structures that allow for intertemporal thinking and action, curbing our high time preference for now and favoring a low time preference for later, become lost or damaged. In the worst of scenarios, the person is left to drift constantly in the present with nary a thought or ability to grasp or plan for the future. The Curious Case of Phineas Gage In the voluminous libraries dedicated to neurology, there is no more oft-told tale than the curious case of Phineas Gage. In the summer of 1848, this twenty-five-year-old railroad foreman in Vermont suffered a gruesome brain injury that left him irreversibly altered in temperament. Here we find a poster child of sorts for time preference in the most extreme, while at the same time gaining a unique and early look into the neurology behind human behavior and the brain structures that are the command center of our tolerance for roundaboutness. In the mid-19th century, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing in the United States, creating the autocatalytic demand for raw materials to fuel economic expansion and the railroads to transport them. The Rutland and Burlington was the dairy line, carrying creamery products from the green mountains of Vermont to market. It was known for bringing butter to Boston, packed in ice in refrigerated cars. As the line expanded with new tracks, crews for the Rutland and Burlington ran into outcroppings of hard rock along the Black River. Rather than take the literal roundabout route, the railroad decided to blast its way to a direct shot from one point to another, illustrating yet again that the direct route, while quicker, is more difficult, and in very many cases, inferior to the circuitous. The foreman for this job was a man described as efficient and capable, valued by the company and well-liked and respected by his work crew, Phineas Gage. We can picture this hard-working fellow, accomplished in the precise art and science of putting powder and fuses into the holes drilled into the rocks, highly responsible, level-headed, and with a steady hand. From this, we can infer the behaviors that would go with such a description, moderate in eating and drinking, with no extreme vices. Those who knew him would later report he was more apt to speak like a choir boy than a railroad ruffian and was likely even in the habit of saving a portion of his pay. In other words, we can picture Gage as a typical man of his day, 
with a garden variety or even rather low time preference, despite working with explosives, that would have some emphasis on present consumption. He was twenty-five, after all, but could very well have also included a forward-leaning perspective through upcoming slices of time. Perhaps he planned to marry, start a family, and build or buy a home. Alas, that stretch of railway that was to be made straighter rather than roundabout would have dire consequences for Gage, completely subverting his ability to ever again be forward-focused and leaving him to flounder in an impetuous life filled only with now. It happened one day, when after loading a charge and fuse, he became distracted. Before another man on his crew had time to pour sand into the hole drilled in the rock, Gage began tamping it with an iron bar. The charge ignited and blew upward into his face, propelling the bar, weighing some thirteen pounds, measuring over three feet in length and over an inch in diameter, through his head. The bar entered his left cheek, passed through the front of his brain and exited through the top of his head, before landing more than a hundred feet away, covered in blood and brains. Amazingly, Gage was still alive. Later, the story was written up in the New England newspapers as a horrific accident and a miracle of survival. As a medical case, it was discussed under the headline Passage of an Iron Rod Through the Head in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal. These accounts tell of Gage's treatment by the town physician, who was amazed that his patient was conscious and able to converse naturally, while the doctor could observe the pulsations of his brain through the wound in his skull. The doctor never considered his patient as anything other than completely rational. Although Gage lost vision in his left eye, he could see perfectly out of his right and had no impairment of hearing, touch, speech, or language. But as his recovery ensued, the people who knew the man were soon to conclude that this was not the same Gage. He was described as fitful and irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, and became highly impatient, unable to exercise any restraint or heed any advice when it conflicted with his desires in the moment. Some reports describe Gage as vulgar and bawdy, indulging in excesses in drinking and sexual behavior, lying and thieving. Yet that was not the only dramatic change in Gage after the accident. He was completely unable to plan for his future or to carry out any planned activity. His teleological functioning was severely impaired. After the railroad refused to take him back because of his aberrant behavior, Gage drifted from job to job, working on horse farms and at one point becoming a circus attraction who showed off his wounds and the iron bar that caused them. By the age of thirty-eight, his health deteriorating, Gage developed severe seizures and went to live with his mother and sister. The convulsions worsened to the point of being continuous, which ultimately caused his death. A tragic tale, yes, but that is not what draws our attention here, nor, quite frankly, is it why Gage has earned notoriety in the neurological world beyond having survived an iron bar passing through his brain? Rather, this rare case provided the first clinical proof positive that specific parts of the human brain were dedicated to temporal reasoning, with structures that allow for the ability to curb impulses and make intertemporal choices and future-based decisions. Here was the irrefutable clinical evidence in Gage's almost Jekyll to Hyde personality transformation of how time preference is part of our biology. The Schur and Lee Brain It should come as no surprise to the parent of any toddler or preschool child that with maturity the human brain develops the capacity to wait for longer periods of time. I await my children's passage as the moment that reason and thus bribery becomes an effective parental tool. Such development manifests in the ability, emotionally and cognitively, to deter satiation of wants and needs, so that the temptation of a smaller, sooner reward does not overwhelm one's longer-term best interest for achieving a larger or better later one. Self-control and willpower combine as the necessary ingredients that allow for delayed gratification, in effect, the emotional and psychological underpinnings of becoming roundabout, and we had help from Phineas Gage in understanding where exactly such capacities reside. From a neurological standpoint, this maturation is found in the development of the hippocampus, which is essential to the transferal from short-term to long-term memory, an intertemporal retrospective, and the frontal lobe, a region of the cerebral cortex loaded with dopamine-sensitive neurons, which play a major part in reward, attention, motivation, and planning. Interestingly, serotonin is known to support functioning in the frontal lobe and other forebrain structures associated with decisions and choices involving time and future consequences. 
In clinical experiments, scientists administered tryptophan-depleting drug mixtures to volunteers to test the role of serotonin on future-based decision-making. The conclusion? Serotonin plays a vital and impactful but not exclusive role in time discounting and intertemporal choice. In terms of brain structure, development of the frontal lobe and hippocampus, which begins around age four, allows for impulse control to override the basal structure, including the amygdala, or lizard brain, which researchers have connected to instinctual behaviors. Stated another way, the developed brain with a fully functional frontal lobe is a cool system, the cognitive no system, that is emotionally neutral, contemplative, and capable of generating purposeful strategic action, the seat of self-regulation and self-control, or as we might say, the roundabout, sure system. In contrast, the hot system, the emotional go system, is the center of fear and passion, immediacy, impulsiveness, and reflexive behavior, truly the locus of Li, that undermines self-control. In a healthy brain, the interaction of these sure and Li systems enables people to prevent powerful stimuli from triggering impulses, and thereby allows them to exert their willpower and self-control. It is the means by which they break free of the so-called pleasure principle, driven by impulses and ignoring reason. In the dynamic between cool and hot is the means to access willpower and self-control to pursue deliberate ends. A classic and amply cited illustration is the 1972 marshmallow test by psychologist Walter Michel of Stanford University, who studied 32 preschoolers, 16 boys and 16 girls with a median age of four and a half years. Children were given a choice of a treat, marshmallow, Oreo cookie, or pretzel stick, and told they could eat one immediately, or wait 15 minutes and receive two. Left alone in a room without any distractions, the children, who were observed through one-way mirrors, exhibited attempts to exert self-control, closing their eyes, playing with their hair, and so forth. Some of the children were able to wait long enough to get a second treat, while some ate the treat immediately, and interestingly, mistrust, the fear of never even getting a marshmallow at all was a major consideration in their unwillingness to wait, rather than just impatience. Most unsurprisingly, age was a major determinant in the ability to defer gratification. I remember with a combination of fondness and fear my kindergarten teacher, who tried to drill self-control into her young students. Mimicking her, I used to roam the house repeating, self-discipline, self-discipline, much to the amusement of my parents who must have been dismayed at my apparent abandonment of this mantra in my teenage years. The significance of this study, replicated many times since and which has become a classic in the gratification paradigm, was that it turned out to be highly diagnostic of self-control and self-regulation, and even predictive of behavior into adulthood. Children who successfully delayed gratification were later shown to perform better on SAT tests and exhibited higher personal and interpersonal competencies though sadly likely didn't have promising futures as hedge fund managers or Wall Street traders. Although marshmallows may seem like an odd proxy for roundabout capitalistic production and investment, the same basic elements apply. One must look beyond the seen immediate moment to the unseen next moments, and thus curb the immediate impulses and skepticisms, and instead jockey for larger later advantages. The Subjectivity of Time Within our human tendency to overemphasize the present and underemphasize forward slices of time, there is a great deal of subjectivity. As Bombaverk noted, people may discount an interval of time by 100%, by 50%, or only by 1%, and some may go to the other extreme of grossly overvaluing future utility. This subjective variation, from person to person or within a single individual based on particular circumstances, shows that such discounting is not, in the words of Bombaverk, graduated harmoniously, by a constant amount over a particular length of time. We cannot say, as Faustman and others later posited, that if one discounts by 5% what is expected to be received in a year, then an additional 5% discount must be applied to a subsequent year, in order to discount a total of two years, and so forth. On the contrary, Bombaverk observed, the original subjective undervaluations are, in the highest degree, unequal and irregular. There can be strong differences between present and future enjoyment, while there is only a very small difference or no difference at all in the evaluations of one enjoyment that is pretty far away and another that is farther away. 
Nonetheless, these imagined future emotions are comparable. Indeed, they are comparable not only with present emotions experienced at the moment, but also with each other, and that comparability, furthermore, obtains irrespective of whether they belong to the same or different periods of time. Subtle observations such as these show that Bambaverk went beyond mere time preference and recognized time inconsistency. Like the Austrian economists who followed him, Bambaverk deduced praxeological phenomena of time inconsistency and hyperbolic discounting through a general understanding of the human condition rather than through clinical data. What Bambaverk gave us in his observations is a phenomenon, a propensity that we all share, whereby we assign greater value to what is most salient, available, and tangible to us, typically the present moment, compared to what is beyond the grasp of our imaginations, or that we, for whatever reason, doubt will even materialize, and how these recognizable human traits lead to familiar and regrettable actions, such as procrastination and addiction. This field of study is captured by the modern concept of hyperbolic discounting, though in an austere mathematical formulation as opposed to Bombaverk's intuitive verbal exposition. The general tendency toward time inconsistency was later concisely illustrated in an example that we'll call Thaler's Apples, named for the University of Chicago economist Richard Thaler, who hypothesized it, which presents the following choices. A1, one apple today. A2, two apples tomorrow. B1, one apple in one year. B2, two apples in one year plus one day. The typical impatient human would likely opt for one apple today, A1, over two apples tomorrow, A2. As the old adage goes, we prefer the bird in the hand instead of multiple birds in the bush. Acting like preschool children, we seize even the smallest enjoyment in the current moment, regarding it as outweighing, as Bombaverk observed, the greatest and most lasting advantage. On the basis of time preference alone, and the general present bias, this makes sense. We want the smaller sooner, rather than wait for the larger later. It appears we change from preschoolers less than we think. Where the time inconsistency revealed itself was in the projection of a year hence. In his experiment, Thaler found that no one would settle for only one apple in a year, B1, when waiting an extra day would yield two apples, B2. As we know, the tendency is to prefer a more valuable later outcome as the temporal distance is extended. Hence the reversal in time preference. As the clock ticks, at some point the preferred B2 gradually becomes the spurned A2, and we inexplicably change our minds. Although we can surely sympathize and see the rationale, such determinations are, nonetheless, highly inconsistent, irrational. If we would not want to wait one more day now, preferring the immediate apple rather than two in a day. Why would we be any different in the future, willing to wait a year and a day for double the reward? The problem is not in a particular value judgment, but rather in a person who apparently fails to realize that his future self will not be able to carry out the choice that his present self announces. What does it mean to say that in one year he would prefer to wait an additional day to get two apples, when his current behavior shows the opposite to be the case? In his observations around time inconsistency, Bombaverk seemed to presage this oddity in us that would only later be verified in the lab. Our focus away from the abstract, like the modern availability heuristic, toward those memories and associations that are most available in our minds, is thus a focus on the immediate. Bombaverk's description of this subjectivity in our time preference was and still is very much at odds with the way we ought to discount the future. The normative robotic case. In 1937, the Nobel and MIT economist Paul Samuelson, whose famous textbook in its 1989 edition, confidently and inconceivably stated, contrary to what many skeptics had earlier believed, the Soviet economy is proof that a socialist command economy can function and even thrive, proof positive of flawed mathematical economics proofs, introduced the very exponential discounting used by Faustman in 1849, called exponential because of the multiplicative compounding of the discount factor 1 plus i with each successive year. Here, from an esteemed English-speaking economist, rather than a lowly German forester, was a rigorous model of intertemporal choice. It featured the familiar compound interest mathematics, an agreeable thing to do. And best of all, it treated acting man as consistent and condensed his messy temporal preferences down to that single parameter, i from Faustmann. Despite Samuelson's reservations about its suitability, 
It really caught on in economics, to the point where today's behavioral psychologists and economists write papers showing the experimental violations of the now standard discounted utility model of mainstream economics. Herein was the problem. Despite its formal elegance and convenience in solving for equilibria, Samuelson's model of a uniform discount on future utility didn't accurately describe the behavior of people in the real world. As discussed, we are decidedly inconsistent in our time preferences. That is, our preference for delay reverses as the delay period changes, and we are certainly not well described by a single or perhaps by any static parameter. Faustman was right. His formula, developed for forestry, as the listener recalls, does provide an objective and normative way of approaching the compounding of opportunity costs and the pricing of capital. However, in the real world, we overlay our own subjective discounting apparatus on this simple compounding. Comparing this to Faustman exposes the bias. We can alter Faustman's formula to allow the rate of time preference, I, to vary, and in fact decline with delay. Our new time-inconsistent Faustman's formula for the land expectation value is thus. LEV equals B over 1 plus I sub 1 plus B over 1 plus I sub 1 times 1 plus I sub 2 plus B over 1 plus I sub 1 times 1 plus I sub 2 times 1 plus I sub 3 where each I sub N is declining as N increases that is I sub 1 is greater than I sub 2 greater than I sub 3 what this means of course is that the discounted or capitalized value of each successive B or each successive marshmallow or apple falls very quickly for short delay intervals, near-term harvests, and then still falls but at a slower rate for long delay intervals, harvests further out in the future. With Faustman's original exponential discounting, the discounted Bs all fall at a constant rate with each successive delay. This, again, in a nutshell, describes our time inconsistency descriptively equivalent to the hyperbolic discounting model. A sub-additive discounting model has also been shown to provide similar descriptions of lower discounting over longer delays, though it fails to capture the preference reversals. The difference between this and Faustman's original Jedi-like method of discounting is overwhelming. When earlier yearly discount rates in the Faustman equation, say I sub 1 and I sub 2, are high and patience is particularly low, there will be no tolerance for the early slow growth of the conifer. The later fast growth will not be reached when yearly discount rates are expected to be much lower and patience is expected to be high. The axiom of the axe will very likely cut the enterprise short, even assuming tremendous profitability. The eyes are high when they are needed to be low, and they are low when they are needed to be high. Despite the objective formula, Realizing the economics of the exceedingly roundabout carnivorous tree goes against our biology. Following any such roundabout paths, where the difficult initial stages are there to accommodate the ease of the later stages, one needs patience in the initial stages and anticipated impatience in the later stages, not the inverse. The difficulty of this inversion becomes even more pronounced in individuals whose fixation on the immediate at the expense of the intermediate is further heightened. Bombarded by technology, they exist in a faux present, in which everything is accelerated, creating a present shock, as termed by Douglas Rushkoff, which references the view of Alvin Toffler's 1970 future shock, that we struggle with processing change itself, made worse by today's ever faster, from an ever autocatalytic pace. As modern as these concepts may seem, they are anchored firmly in Bombaverkian thought. As we might expect, Research shows that children and young adults with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, exhibit more pronounced hyperbolic discounting and a stronger preference for immediate rewards than those who do not have the disorder. If we extrapolate these findings, how might they apply to adults who do not have Attention Deficit Disorder, ADD, but experience pseudo-ADD because of the pressure of multitasking? Is modernity with its ubiquitous productivity-enhancing technology tools turning us into a society of hyper-hyperbolic discounters? These questions are worth considering, given the findings of Edward Hallowell, a psychiatrist who, in his superb book Crazy Busy, discussed the plight of adults who did not have ADD, but for whom a severe case of modern life gave them ADD-like symptoms, what he calls F-state, for frantic, frenzied, forgetful, flummoxed, frustrated, and fragmented. 
Although there are variations in severity, the empirical propensity of heightened hyperbolic discounting among those with these conditions reinforces the importance of awareness and meta-knowledge to rein in impulses and prevent actions in the moment from jeopardizing the future. It also reinforces my long-held suspicion that PDAs, particularly those with stock tickers, are akin to spikes through the head. Hallowell's findings would seem to make self-regulation as enabled by the cool, sure system all the more important. Without it, people cannot pursue distal goals instead of succumbing to the temptation of proximal stimuli. Unless the sure system functions, intertemporal choice is ineffective, even to the extreme in Phineas Gage's case of being completely eliminated. Research is increasingly showing that a restorative for what I'm calling the sure system is time spent in the woods, particularly in children, for whom exposure to nature seems to mitigate the impact of ADHD, or as Richard Louvre calls it, nature deficit disorder. By the same token, why wouldn't leisurely contemplative exposure to a coniferous forest with its edifying successions over time help to stretch out our time perception? Understanding this inconsistency, arbitrary, subjective, and oh so human, allows us to gauge perceptions, reactions, and decisions across time, gaining insight into others' intertemporal behaviors, which will no doubt display a well-defined present bias, and of course, our own. We see, as Bombaverk noted, through the undervaluation of the future utility, men will refrain from providing for the future so amply as they would otherwise have done. In other words, this underestimate acts to the prejudice of saving and accumulation of wealth. In upcoming chapters, as we move out of the world of observing particular human behavior and soon into some of the most intensely emotional phrase imaginable, capitalistic investing, such understanding becomes our edge. And decidedly, one can only have an edge if one truly comprehends it. What we have here is a clear systematic source of investment mispricing ripe for intertemporal arbitrage a term synonymous with Austrian investing itself. But this bias of intertemporal inconsistency is not, and for the most part cannot, be arbitraged away, because of the simple reason that the arbitrageurs are the only ones most inflicted by the bias. The Trade-Off of an Addict Health is an area in which there is an obvious and logical time separation, particularly around choice. The most dramatic example of health decision trade-offs is addiction. The pleasure of the substance or behavior in the moment is so strong that it overwhelms any notion of future consequence, no matter how dire, as if the person is looking through binoculars backward. The future seems even more distant and less relevant to the present. Such an attitude calls to mind the old Perry Como song Forget Domani, with its hyperbolic discounter's refrain, Let's forget about tomorrow, for tomorrow never comes. The future as we perceive it, or as we perceive our forward selves, never arrives. The ease with which we expect to manage known adverse consequences is an illusion. We may tell ourselves we can change in the future, but for now the addict intends to do what he always does. Addiction can, of course, put health, livelihood, relationships, and even one's life in peril. Therapeutic 12-step programs can assist in breaking the hold of an addictive substance or behavior by supporting the recovering person's willpower and future-based decisions to experience deprivation in the moment, e.g. not drinking, not gambling, etc., in order to experience more and improving health in forward slices of time. The image of a heroin addict, as Bastiat's bad economist who pursues a small present good, but which will be followed by the great evil to come, is too poignant to pass up. Interestingly, for the person with an alcohol addiction, pharmacology has been able to collapse the time between the small present good and the later great evil with oral medications, and abuse et al., that produce immediate unpleasant reactions, headaches, nausea, vomiting, if someone drinks while taking it. This brings the forward back to the present to where we can best process it and feel it. Fortunately, for the persistence of the Austrian investing edge, no such pill is yet available to economists or investors. But the trick of time compression has also been used to motivate other behaviors impacted by myopic time inconsistency and the chronic tendency among people not to maximize utility over intervals of time. Merrill Lynch's Face Retirement feature is an online tool that ages pictures of consumers, thus enabling them to see how they will appear in the future. What might be dismissed as a clever marketing gimmick is actually based on a Stanford University experiment that showed such age-enhanced pictures helped people to save more. 
In effect, they gained more salience for their forward selves by looking eye to eye at them. The Merrill Lynch tool might even be seen as playing off the theme of Aesop's fable of the ant and the grasshopper, which extols the virtue of planning for the future. During the warm summer months, the grasshopper, unconscious of the lean winter months to come, spends all his time and energy singing in the sun. The industrious ant, meanwhile, with a better grasp of what is to come, works all summer to save for the future, storing up food to eat in the winter. When the weather turns bitter cold, the ant is prepared while the grasshopper is sorely in need. Or consider a staple of bedtime fairy tales, that of the three little pigs, one who quickly builds a house of straw in order to maximize his time for pleasure and relaxation now, another who spends just a bit more time to make a house of sticks, but quickly joins the straw builder in play, and the third who forgoes all recreation now and constructs a sturdy house of bricks. When the big bad wolf huffs and puffs, straw and sticks cannot stand. Fortunately for these two high-time preference pigs, their industrious and no doubt Austrian red friend, safely ensconced in brick, does not bar the door. My favorite such cultural reference to seeing beyond the present self is the short 1945 children's book The Carrot Seed by Ruth Krauss. A little boy planted a carrot seed and then had to withstand a barrage of skepticism from his family, who kept saying it wouldn't come up as he worked and waited to eventually attain his giant carrot. I made this book a surreptitious introductory text for my children on roundabout production and its naysayers. If such cautionary tales of intertemporal swapping insects, pigs, and gardening babes are lost on us, there are other cultural threads to follow, the Protestant work ethic and the godliness of industriousness, which is found in many denominations, as well as some other faith traditions, like their Puritan forebears, the Protestants saw work not just as a means to earn a wage, but as an absolute end in itself, a calling. Working, saving, moderating pleasure today, and preparing for tomorrow, secularly and spiritually, encourage a low time preference, enhance a depth of field perspective, indeed, all the way to kingdom come. When our forward perception sharpens, we can, in effect, invert the hyperbolic curve thus becoming more patient in the present so that we can allow ourselves the advantage to act opportunistically impatient in a coming slice of time. By establishing a forward-leaning means-ends framework, we put the teleology of time on our side, which enables us to pursue greater exploits in the future. Importantly, and this is where Umvik and time preference work together, inverting our present versus future patience allows a similar inversion discussed in Chapter 5, where we start with the end and then progress backward to its means in the present. Like Tiger Woods keeping his eye on the pin, not the fairway, in the 2006 British Open. In other words, when we know what the Zvek is, we can then establish the appropriate incremental zeal that become the middle for reaching it. No Zeal for Zeal on Wall Street Without a depth of field perspective, we become victimized by time. Immediacy is a tyrant ratcheting up stress and exacerbating feelings of being time bankrupt, and there are immense external magnifiers on our time inconsistency. When time is scarce, indeed down to the last grains in the hourglass, as the grim reaper waits, desperation sets in. There is no future, no forward moments. There is only now, now, now. In this world, there is no time or desire to pursue zeal, to employ purposeful patience toward the attainment of an intermediate objective, that affords a far greater strategic advantage for later on. There is only an unrelenting zvek, the do or die of an action in the moment. This prevalent thinking of impatience now and the expectation of patience later was the opposite of Henry Ford's roundaboutness, thus affirming his exemplary status among Unternehmer, such as leaving successful partnerships and foregoing immediate profits in order to engage in the time-consuming endeavor of building production processes so that he could impatiently make and sell cars later. Although Bambaverk referred to soldiers, we might think of today's CEOs, CFOs, and most notably, investment managers and traders as having similarly risky occupations because they must rivet their attention to the present moment or else face potential professional death. This is Wall Street, where every trader has a short shelf life and lives in yearly and even far less increments. Earn your keep, literally or you have no future. It is Bambaverk's thought of death forced on them by peculiar circumstances, like soldiers in battle or the terminally ill, 
A Wall Street trader who fails to focus rapidly on making money frequently has marked himself for extinction. Therefore, there is no roundabout, no intertemporal arbitrage of today's opportunity for the superior one that will unfold in a forward slice of time. No matter how large the later might be, the sooner is all there is. In fact, time inconsistency is the source of much conventional wisdom on Wall Street, from momentum investing to the merits of monetary policy. Wall Street's endemic problem is one of lost opportunity. You must go for it now, or you won't have a chance tomorrow. Like wary preschoolers, traders see no sense in going for a larger, later marshmallow that they'll likely never even get. The biggest sin is not losing money, but failing to make enough money each period to keep your treasured seat at the table. With the constant pressure of knowing that they could be replaced at any moment, Wall Street traders can act no differently. Their entire focus must be on now. The byproducts of such present bias have been some of the biggest failures in risk management, including the collapse of Hedge Fund Long-Term Capital Management, LTCM, in 1998, and, ten years later, the implosion of the investment bank Lehman Brothers. This time preference-driven explanation for such failures is a very counterintuitive view. The most obvious answer to the wild gambler problems of Wall Street is the free option that traders possess, whereby they make enormous bonuses when their bets are winners, while not participating in the losses when their bets are losers. But the fact that these calamities and others have involved enormous personal economic loss among those who ultimately caused or oversaw them should give us pause in assigning blame to the free option. While the criticism should be laid on the structure of the system, it is not how most think. I have tried to gain intuition for what drives Wall Street's gambling madness by constructing a simple cartoon experiment or computer simulation. In this study, robot traders with free option bonus payouts and what we'll call knockouts, or the requirement to exceed a specified profit level every year or else lose their jobs, i.e. get knocked out, a very realistic scenario, are given a menu of choices of simple investment strategies to employ, strategies that risk frequent small losses for infrequent huge gains, Marco from Chapter 1. The reverse, strategies that risk infrequent huge losses for frequent small gains, the definitive Wall Street and even hedge fund model, and strategies somewhere in between. All these strategies, or return distributions, were given identical geometric means so that, regardless of which strategy a trader selected, his expected strategy return is the same. The surprising and unambiguous results, traders with knockouts favored the huge infrequent risks, thus providing very likely career survival, whereas traders without the knockouts avoided them. Moreover, lessening or removing the free option, meaning requiring the trader to have skin in the game or share the losses, had no effect on strategy preference. Preferences were based on maximizing a trader's expected personal career payout, the statistical significance in this switch between strategy preferences was above 99%, with no sensitivity to the magnitudes of each strategy's skewness, nor of profit and loss participations. In this simple Gedanken experiment, with full foresight of the return distributions employed, the traders take the direct approach of optimizing their chances of success each and every successive period. The overriding aim is to avoid being knocked out, and thus to stay in the very lucrative game. The present is under a microscope, as Clip showed. Excessive carrying costs act like magnifying lenses on the immediate. To add insult to injury, in the real world this tendency is further self-reinforced as the decisive present period makes a trader's time discounting uber-hyperbolic, literally as if they have iron bars in their frontal lobes. Furthermore, Wall Street careers have a peculiar tendency to survive extreme take-down-the-system losses. Consider the LTCM folks whereas small losses or inadequate gains typically cause careers to fade away. On Wall Street, roundabout investing, acquiring later stage advantage through an earlier stage disadvantage, is irrational, and acting as if there is no future is perfectly rational. So the best solution to too-big-to-fail trading risks is relieving the risk-takers of their impossible intertemporal predicament. Aside from instituting four life contracts for traders, this means more oversight from the owners of the capital, Perhaps firms that engage in gambling should go back to being privately held, or else that capital should stay out of the gambling business in the first place. Of course, this responsibility is made entirely unnecessary by government bailouts of Wall Street's big gambling losses.
Our time perspective is the sine qua non of capital investing and risk-taking. It is what matters, what determines our very opportunity set. And it is insidious, malleable, and manipulated by circumstance. It gets worse, so much worse. Bombaverk's calls for lower time preference as a prescription to the advantage of roundaboutness are not without their own serious pitfalls. As we will see from Mises in Chapter 8, our perception of time, distorted as it is by our cognitive and emotional equipment, is highly vulnerable to other more insidious, though seemingly benign, and far more destructive monetary distortions. This is the provenance of the acutely distorted world we live in today, the avoidance of which is a requisite component of Austrian investing. Adapting to the Intertemporal One of the hallmarks in the evolution of humans is our brain, in particular, the signature large frontal lobes that allow us to shape our environment and our tools through the use of reason with awareness and cognition of the future. Such development moved us out of the cradle of civilization in sub-Saharan Africa and enabled us to disperse along all points of the compass, following herds and also adapting to new climates and terrains. Tolerance for natural climate change and even preference for certain regions were essential to early humans as they settled far and wide. Contact with the often extreme change of seasons gave early humans their first approach to time and roundaboutness, perhaps even giving a head start to those tribes who followed their prey into the less hospitable areas. Some 500,000 years ago, the first humans in China used and controlled fire, which required supplies of fuel to be collected and stored to keep the flames alive. With the development of language, Thought expanded from a preoccupation with the present to the representation and abstraction of the future. As evidenced in the fossil record, human migration necessitated adaptations to time, in simplest terms. It was no longer possible to reach for perpetually ripening fruit off the nearest tree, or to count on plentiful herds of animals. As humans became aware of the future, they had to learn to work with and prepare for it, drying fruits in the sun, packing meat and ice in the winter, moving livestock seasonally between mountain and pasture grazing, transhumans, and curdling milk to store as cheese, all illustrating a decreasing time preference and developing roundaboutness. Where supplies of food waxed and waned with the seasons, early humans had to learn to forego current rewards and seek future advantages for survival. Our evolutionary struggle has intrinsically been one of overcoming our inherent faulty temporal wiring, and inverting our congenital overvaluation of the present. The roundabout strategy, the sure strategy, has been the very strategy of our species' overwhelming though uneven success. Even today, as the evolutionary march continues, with technology seeping into every corner of the seven continents, we still struggle with the most fundamental challenge, our perception of time. In that, we have not moved far beyond the desperation of our ancestors, who had far more risk in making this quantum leap of faith, removing the blinders of now and thus grasping a deeper, fuller field of time. Perhaps this will always be a frontier to conquer as we continuously fight against that humanness about us, struggling to act in our own best interest and that of those who come after us, indeed civilization itself. The fact remains that most people are unable to consistently take the roundabout route because of the mental tripwires that exist in all of us insidious nooses that drag us back to the current moment and the satisfaction of current desires, the pursuit of pleasure and success now. Therein lies a systematic, universal source of edge to the Austrian investing approach, perhaps the main takeaway of this chapter. But as Clip always said, this is easy for me to say, very difficult or even impossible for you to do. To exploit this edge is to escape our temporal shackles, requiring nothing less than deliberate and continuous mindfulness and self-discipline. With the meta-knowledge of the workings of our own minds, we can better attempt to consciously invert our time inconsistency, becoming patient now in order to be strategically impatient later. This critical step is the only way to link the knowledge accumulated thus far along the Tao of capital with its application and implementation. Much of the investment success I've had has resulted unequivocally from a constant practice and plotting with the early indispensable prodding of CLIP. To deal with time inconsistency, developing an ability to keep the whole sequence of the slices of time as fully part of the game, and not just maximizing an arbitrary slice at each beginning. With awareness and then some degree of mastery, 
It is a lifelong journey. We can thus move to the next phase in the Austrian tradition, where the market is a process and we, freed of our inborn temporal biases, can recognize and take our place within it. Chapter 7 The Market is a Process For more than a century, the Austrian school has been dismissed as antiquated and unscientific because of its fundamental methodology. Mainstream economics epitomized first in the early 20th century career of John Maynard Keynes, whose famous book The General Theory was literally named as an allusion to the revolution of Einsteinian relativity theory, and ultimately in the mid-20th century career of Paul Samuelson, the first American to win the economics Nobel in 1970, moved emphatically beyond the Austrians' a prioristic approach. Its new direction was toward a distinct alignment with other sciences, the physics envy, as it has been called, of quantitative and empirical techniques. But while the physicists make steady advances in their field, the expert fine-tuning of the mathematical economists has plunged the world back into years of repeated financial crisis and labor market stagnation, the very problems they told us they had solved after studying the Great Depression. Consumers and producers, with their subjective expectations and preferences, do not conform well to mathematical models. It is the very nature of economics as a social science that requires the logical, deductive, a priori approach of praxeology, the term Mises used for the scientific study of human action. Mises inherited the theories of Karl Menger and Eugen von Bambavirk involving value, capital, and time. Mises refined them and added important new theories of his own, particularly with regard to money and credit, and ultimately, what we today know as Austrian business cycle theory, ABCT which explained the booms and busts that heaved the landscape of his times into peaks and valleys, destructive forces that continue to this day. Through his work, Mises showcased the adaptability of the Austrian school, while never straying from its methodology. Indeed, he was the strictest of adherents to the deductive method of verbal logic. Moreover, Mises demonstrated the ability of the tradition to evolve, all of which opens the door for new interpretations and applications, including those presented here as Austrian investing. A man of his times, Mises was a witness to history, literally on the front lines, as an artillery officer in the Great War, a resident of Vienna, and a university lecturer, as the Austro-Hungarian Empire crumbled, a scholar who developed theories of money and banking during the monetary heydays of the 1920s, and a Jew and a staunch critic of National Socialism during the rise of the Nazis, from whom he had to escape as he fled Europe. Then, in Human Action, a treatise on economics, published in 1949, Mises gave the post-war world the unshakable bedrock of the praxeological nature of economics, explainable only in the context of the subjective actions and behaviors of humans. Mises, the scholar and teacher, took pains that others might understand, though sadly much of the world refused to listen. This brings us to a day in 1954, when Mises, then in his seventies, addressed a lecture hall full of graduate students, among them Israel Kirzner, who would later become a venerated economist in the Austrian tradition, who no doubt heard his Austrian accent first, and then his impactful words, The market is a process. In those five deceptively simple words, Mises, perhaps the greatest economist of all time, broadened the thinking among his students. The market could not be viewed as or contained by a mere static thing or physical location, but rather as the actions of countless people, just as Clip showed me that what was happening in the trading pit was only a manifestation of the great process of price discovery. The market can only be understood as being a process, teleological, a series of causes and effects toward the purposeful goals of its participants. Environments and perceptions change, sometimes naturally and sometimes through artificial interventions and distortions. As much as Mises understood the market, he also knew its failings when undermined, which he captured in ABCT, the roadmap of the market as a discovery process in distorted terrain. Through it all, the processual market reacts and adapts with the push and pull, the twee show, of equilibrating forces. Nearly as important as Mises' opening line in the lecture hall that day was where he said it, New York University, the new locus of the Austrian tradition, proudly my graduate alma mater, here was the bastion of classical liberalism and the Austrian school, 
essentially reduced to one man, Mises, who kept the torch burning and refused to let it be extinguished by the hot breath of interventionism and the illiberal, in the classical sense, politics and policies so prevalent in the world. The strict, unbending principles of this refugee scholar exacted a heavy price from Mises, who was treated poorly by the profession when he came to America in 1940. Yet the world is so much the better for his sacrifice and refusal to take a more compromising tone than undoubtedly would have made him more employable. As Ron Paul observed, Mises never yielded to any temptation to soften his stand to be more acceptable to the conventional economic community, which proved him to be a man of strong will and character. He stood by his principles, which never bestowed wealth, but so much more, including the priceless honor of being. In the words of economist Jörg Guido Hulsman, in his extensive biography of Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism The Man Who Predicted the Great Depression Ludwig Heinrich Edler von Mises was born in 1881 in the city of Limburg, in the northeastern reaches of the Habsburg Empire, in what today is Lviv in the Ukraine. Ironically, the birthplace of one of the most stalwart defenders of the free market would subsequently become part of the Soviet Union. His father was a construction engineer for the Austrian railroads, which earned him the honorary Von title, which was inherited by Mises, who continued its use. The family moved to Vienna when Mises' father received a prestigious position in public administration. There, under the influence of their mother, Lou, as he was affectionately called, and his brother Richard received an excellent education. But the differences between the brothers were apparent early on, Mises gravitating toward social sciences and Richard toward natural sciences, the divide between deduction and praxeology in the former and empiricism and historicism in the latter, became more distinct over the years and was never bridged. Mises was educated at the Academische Gymnasium, where he read the classics in Latin and Greek. A verse from Virgil became his mantra. Tu necetes sed contra audentior ito. Do not give in to evil, but proceed ever more boldly against it. He later enrolled in the University of Vienna and studied law and government science, and as a first-year student, engaged in a research study of the Galician peasants in the 18th century and their attempts to win greater rights. Mises later remarked that his constant and burning interest in history in those early years led him to recognize the inadequacy of German historicism. In October 1902, three months after passing his university examinations, Mises reported for obligatory military service with the Imperial and Royal Division Artillery Regiment. Stationed near Vienna, he served one year and returned to his studies in September 1903. As a reserve officer with the rank of lieutenant, he was later promoted to captain. He was mobilized two more times, in 1908 and 1912. In 1914, he would don the uniform of the Austrian army again. Mises began his professional life as a paid intern in a civil service position, which ill-suited him because of his distaste for bureaucracy and decided to practice law instead. It was the scholarly life, though, that appealed most to him, first as a student and later as a teacher. Although Menger was still teaching during Mises' early years at university, Mises did not attend those lectures. However, in late 1903, Mises read Menger's Principles of Economics for the first time, as he recalled in his memoirs. It was through this book that I became an economist. The one who had the most direct influence on Mises intellectually was Bombavirk, whose seminars he began attending at the University of Vienna in the summer of 1905, thus completing the Austrian school succession from Menger to Bombavirk to Mises. In his first book, Theorie des Geldes und der Umlaufsmittel, Theory of Money and Credit, Mises explained how the banking system was endowed with a singular ability to expand credit, and with it the money supply and how this was magnified by government intervention. Left alone, interest rates would be able to dynamically adjust, such that only the amount of credit would be used as is voluntarily supplied, in the form of actual savings, and demanded by entrepreneurs. But when credit is force-fed beyond that, I'll call it credit gavage, grotesque things start to happen. Mises submitted Theoris des Geldes to the university when he applied to become a private lecturer for which he was accepted in the spring of 1913. He began teaching seminars that summer, but soon all would change when the Great War flared across Europe and Mises again reported for duty. Just as the war began, 
Mises' mentor Bambavrik died, with Menger in seclusion, constantly revising his works, and the more visible and prolific Bambavrik dead before his time. The weight of the Austrian tradition rested on the shoulders of a man headed to the battlefront. By the end of 1917, Mises had been promoted to the rank of captain and was stationed in Vienna in the economics division of the Department of War. In 1918, Mises was back at the university as a lecturer, where most of his students in a course on banking theory were women. There were few male students because of the war. Throughout his teaching career, Mises championed both female and male students. While at the university, he met the famed Max Weber, the German philosopher who authored The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Commenting on Weber's death in 1920, Mises called it a great disaster for Germany, adding that had Weber lived longer, the German people of today would be able to look to this example of an Aryan who would not be broken by National Socialism. Mises, who said he encountered nearly all the Marxian theorists in Western and Central Europe during the course of my life, spoke favorably of only one, Otto Bauer, who, had he not been a Marxist, could have become a statesman. Following the Great War and the Allied food blockade, when Bauer tried to turn Austria toward Bolshevism, it was Mises who intervened during the winter of 1918 through 1919, convincing Bauer that the collapse of a Bolshevist experiment in Austria would be inevitable in a very short time, perhaps within days. The supply of food in Austria was dependent on imports, made possible only by the relief assistance of former enemies. In his private seminars at the University of Vienna that winter, as the empire disintegrated and Austria transitioned from a monarchy to a republic, Mises led discussions on market phenomena and the subjective theory of value. His was the voice of the classical liberal at a time when socialism was spreading rampantly across Europe. Thus, as Hulsman wrote, Mises was known as Der Liberale. In today's English, we would say he was Mr. Libertarian, the living embodiment of classical liberal ideas. And so we complete our arc in the Tao of Capital from Lao Tzu, the first libertarian, to Mises, whom many regard as the greatest of them all. As an intellectual freedom fighter who waged a war of words, Mises wrote extensively on the dangers of socialism, penning a classic in 1922, Socialism, an Economic and Sociological Analysis. As Mises later observed, men must choose between the market economy and socialism. The state can preserve the market economy in protecting life, health, and private property against violent or fraudulent aggression, or it can itself control the conduct of all production activities. Some agency must determine what should be produced. If it is not the consumers by means of demand and supply on the market, it must be the government by compulsion. As vigilant as a century, Mises continuously warned about the dangers of inflation. Like the good economist that Bastiat had championed, Mises foresaw great evils to come with dire consequences. He was an insistent voice shouting against inflation-inducing monetary policy over the den of the government printing presses, quite literally, in one story told about him. The 1920s were marked by the brave new era of the Federal Reserve System, promoting inflationary credit expansion and with it permanent prosperity. Economists today still do not agree that this period was driven by monetary phenomena, and in this controversy we can see the limitations of recognizing the distortions in data alone. Fortunately now, as we'll discuss later in the audiobook, we have found a way to detect that distortion. In mid-1929, amid his warnings of the collapse to come from credit expansion, Mises was offered a lucrative job at the Viennese bank Kreditanstalt. Mises gave a straightforward and prophetic rationale for turning it down. As he told his future wife, Margaret, a great crash was coming, and he did not want his name in any way connected with it. As for the lost professional opportunity, Mises told Margaret that he was more interested in writing about money than earning it. Mises did manage to protect his money, and more important, his reputation, by avoiding the biggest crash of his day, which is more than we can say for Keynes, who, though considered more savvy, was apparently blindsided by the crash. Mises himself never attempted to take the Austrian tradition to its logical investment conclusions. He once remarked to Margaret that though he studied money, as a couple they would never have much of it. Extending Austrian economics to investing is precisely what I aim to accomplish in this audiobook. Mises was correct in his projection. Not only did a crash come, but Kreditenstalt failed.
which triggered a wave of financial panic across Central Europe. Thus, Mises was a harbinger of dire times ahead, and the man who predicted the Great Depression. Fleeing the Nazis In January 1933, Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. Two months later, despite a government prohibition of parades and assemblies, the Austrian Nazis rioted in the streets of Vienna. It was a great relief when, in March 1934, Mises was invited by the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, Switzerland, to become a visiting professor of economic relations. His move, though, was viewed as a temporary one, and he returned whenever he could to see Margaret. He waited to propose to her until after his mother's death in 1937. Apparently, Frau Mises did not approve of Margaret, a widowed actress. In 1934, his book, Theorie des Geldes, was finally published in English as Theory of Money and Credit, but it was too late. An understanding of it a decade earlier could have spared the world so much pain, although that does require the huge assumption that people would have paid attention. Some much-deserved respect followed, although it was unfortunate that it took a disaster for people to take heed of the only predictive scholarly explanation of what was happening. Even today, much of the mainstream fails to see the root cause of market distortions, which, as we will hear in Chapter 8, are simply and gratuitously passed off ex post as bubbles. Soon after the release of Theory of Money and Credit, Mises was easily eclipsed by Keynes when this dapper, fresh, and sophisticated English gentleman's book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, was published in 1936. So what if Keynes lost his shirt in the stock market crash? Apparently more important was that his book appeared scientific and sophisticated, thanks to the inclusion of fancy math and even Greek letters, all of which conveyed rigor and modernity. And he seemed a man of action, whether constructive or destructive was perhaps secondary. The good Lord Keynes fearlessly fought the battle against unemployment with proposals of artificially stimulating demand, thus pretending that consumer preferences are different than they actually are, draining the government's coffers and running the monetary printing press. It was a Keynesian avalanche, and Mises was swept aside, not refuted by Keynes and his ilk, but ignored. When Keynes first read Mises' book in German, he dismissed it as unoriginal. This was understandable since, as he himself explained, Keynes's German was good enough only to recognize what he already knew. In March 1938, Mises was back in Vienna for a conference, and he and Margaret continued preparations for their long-awaited wedding. He could no doubt sense the mounting tensions in his home country, as the Germans appeared ready to invade. Knowing he was high on the Nazi enemy list, not only because he was Jewish, but also because he stood in staunch opposition to the Nazi Gleichschaltung, the totalitarian control and forcible coordination of the economy and every other part of society, Mises retreated again from Vienna, this time for good. His and Margaret's von Trappian escape came just hours before the SS arrived to arrest Nazi adversaries and seize their property. Mises's apartment was broken into and ransacked. The Gestapo took 21 boxes full of his possessions and sealed the apartment, and returned again in the fall to take whatever was left, including books, personal correspondence, paintings, silver, and documents. After World War II, Mises's files were among the documents found on a train in Bohemia, and secretly sent to Moscow, where they were obviously further disregarded. In 1991 they were rediscovered. The whereabouts of his precious Viennese library, however, is not known. After war broke out in September 1939, Mises began contemplating departure from Europe. Just as Austrian composer Gustav Mahler considered himself thrice homeless as a native of Bohemia in Austria, as an Austrian among Germans, and as a Jew throughout the world, so too was Mises. As a Jew among Austrians, as an Austrian among Germans, and as an Austrian economist among the historicists, Mises's fate resonates in Mahler's words, everywhere an intruder, never welcomed. As Mises and his wife left Geneva, en route to the tiny Mediterranean town of Cerbère, France, on the Spanish border, their escape was full of close calls and near misses. The bus ride was perilous, as Margaret recalled in her memoirs. To get there without encountering the Germans, the driver had to change his route frequently after seeking information from French peasants and soldiers. The German troops had advanced very far, and they were everywhere. More than once our driver had to backtrack to escape them. 
Finally, in July 1940, they left on board the ship Europe for a new home. Had Mises been stopped and arrested at any point along his escape route from Europe, his life would have been in grave peril, and the Austrian school would likely have never gained a foothold on the shores of the United States. Human Action Life was hard for Mises in the United States, exiled from his beloved Austria. By the end of World War II, all traces of Austrian economics had been purged from Vienna. The Nazis tore down the statue of Menger at the University of Vienna. It was restored to the Arkadenhof, or courtyard, at the university in the 1950s. Mises went to work for the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, thanks to a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to put him on the payroll, at about one-third of what he had been making in Geneva. Although grateful for the opportunity to work, Mises and his wife had difficulty making ends meet. Mises was also discouraged by the ideology sweeping his new home, which had stood up against communism and national socialism, but in the aftermath of the New Deal, was leaning increasingly toward state interventionism in all corners of the economy. With his career stymied and having no way to influence the thinking of the day because U.S. publishers were interested only in the mainstream, Mises fell into despair. In 1943, after being told his contract with the NBER would not be extended, Mises went to work for the National Association of Manufacturers as a consultant and a member of its Economic Policy Advisory Group. Then, in 1944, it was arranged for Mises to become a visiting professor at New York University, where he would give an economics seminar, though his salary would be paid from private funds. He was a visiting professor at NYU for more than 20 years. Although he never had the title of full professor at any university at which he taught, in his seminars, first in Vienna and later in New York, and through his writings, Mises made an impact on a generation of rising intellectual leaders, such as his students, Austrian-born Friedrich Hayek, who would later win the Nobel in economics, and later Murray Rothbard, an American in the Austrian school. However, without a full-time position at a prestigious university, Mises was unable to develop students and future professors who could have further advanced the Austrian tradition. Throughout his life, Mises remained committed to advancing scholarship in Austrian economics. His personal book collection of more than 5,000 volumes, which he amassed after moving to the United States, was acquired by Michigan's Hillsdale College. The Ludwig von Mises Room at the college's library also contains copies of personal correspondence, articles, and letters that the Nazis confiscated from Mises' apartment in Vienna and were later found in Russia, as well as his original desk and chair, incredibly made available to students to sit and study in the master's perch. Even without a university platform, Mises catapulted into the economic spotlight with the publication in 1949 of Human Action. The original book was published in German in 1940 as National Ökonomie, Theorie des Handelns und Wirtschaftens. Rothbard rightly called Human Action Mises' greatest achievement and lauded it as one of the finest products of the human mind in our century. It is economics made whole. Mises' first American friend, Henry Hazlitt, as we recall the author of My Cherished Economics in One Lesson, wrote in Newsweek that human action was destined to become a landmark in the progress of economies. He called it a work of great originality, written in a great tradition, and praised it for extending beyond any previous work the logical unity and precision of modern economic analysis. What critics of the Austrians fail to appreciate is the importance of the idea, as highlighted in the title of Mises' book, that economics is undeniably the study of human action, which is highly subjective and cannot be reduced to data points and mathematical models. To illustrate the point for his students, Mises would use the example of rush hour behavior among commuters at New York's Grand Central Station. Those who studied human action would start from the premise that there is a purpose behind our behavior, which in this instance was to commute from home to work via the train in the morning and then the return trip in the evening. However, the opposite approach by the truly scientific behaviorist who uses only empiricism, would merely see people rushing about randomly, without any particular aim, at certain times of the day. By this example, Mises showed which of the two approaches to human behavior would be most meaningful, clearly the deductive. In his a priorism, Mises took a very Kantian approach, while others were more Aristotelian, which serves to illustrate some of the diversity of opinion among the Austrians. Slight disagreements aside among the approaches of Menger, Bambavirk, Mises, and even Rothbard, 
The crux of the Austrian methodology is what they agree upon, and it is uniquely Austrian and essential to this audiobook. At times, the Austrians' methodological arguments over the favor of a priorism resemble a debate over how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, which will save for the philosophers. What remains most important, as discussed in Chapter 4, is that economics cannot be considered positivist, empirical, because there are no constants in human action, the way there are in the natural sciences, such as the charge of an electron and so forth. It's useless to say the economist should look at history and let the facts speak for themselves, because we need an antecedent theory to know which facts we should even consider, and to even know how to classify a fact in the first place, to call something an exchange, relies on the observer's understanding of the concept of exchange beforehand. In Mises' view, much of the work of professional economists was not the development or testing of theory, but rather the chronicling of historical events. As Mises put it, Economic history, descriptive economics, and economic statistics are, of course, history. At the heart of the Austrian methodology is healthy skepticism of data, and in particular, how economics, and equivalently, investing, uses data to backfit a story around spurious relationships found in the data. We call this data mining. Admittedly, we do take a peek at the data, as we will later in this audiobook but we do not rely upon statistical and historical information to form our understanding. In fact, I might go so far as to call myself an anti-empiricist, because empiricism often creates illusions and obfuscates the true underlying mechanisms at work. As Mises explained, mechanical equations can be used to solve practical problems through the introduction of empirically acquired constants and data. But equations of mathematical catalactics cannot in the same way be of service to practical problems in the area of human action, where constant relations do not exist. A fervent follower of praxeology, Mises used deductive Gedanken experiments, applying introspection to the study of human action, to posit highly subjective decisions and behaviors of what he called the acting man, based on their actions. These actors communicate their preferences in the marketplace, and to entrepreneurs who observe them. As Mises demonstrated, prices are guided by human action, largely through the lens of their impact on profits and losses, as the market adjusts and corrects itself in the face of the turbulence of an imperfect world. When the market is left in its natural state, as we'll discuss later in this chapter and in Chapter 8, entrepreneurs make intertemporal decisions, not infallibly to be sure, but without outside interference that causes a communication disconnect about whether to build ever more roundabout capital structures to meet forward demand, or whether meeting consumers' immediate needs takes precedence. Yet, despite skepticism of inductivist methods, observation does play a role in praxeology. As Mises said, only experience makes it possible for us to know the particular conditions of action. Only experience can teach us that there are lions and microbes, and if we pursue definite plans, only experience can teach us how we must act vis-a-vis -vis the external world in concrete situations. In Mises' view, the economist didn't rely on empirical tests to choose among various candidates for an economic law. Such laws were determined through logical deduction. However, the economist needed to rely on observation and his own sense of judgment to know when to apply a particular economic law or principle. For instance, we can state that doubling the quantity of money other things equal, will increase prices, and we don't need to look at history to test that law. Yet to use this law or principle to help guide people in the real world requires an understanding of what the money is in a particular community, how much it has increased, whether there are other factors that could exacerbate or mitigate the effect, and so on. The 1970s were a time of renaissance for the Austrian school, thanks to the spirit and determination of Mises. During this time, Mises's innumerable contributions to economics became more recognized, including several studies on the business cycle, which he co-authored with Friedrich Hayek. The Mises-Hayek studies warned of the dangers of credit expansion and predicted the coming currency crisis. This work was cited by the Nobel Committee in 1974, the year after Mises's death, when Hayek was awarded a Nobel Prize for economics. Of all the reasons to look askance on the Nobel Committee's actions with regard to those to whom it gives its prize in economics, the obvious slight to Mises stands out as the most blatant of all. While the award to Hayek was certainly good for him and for the Austrian school, the fact remains that without Mises, 
the Austrian school would have died with Menger and Bombavirk. There certainly would have been no Nobel-worthy work from Hayek. It is to Mises that the Austrian tradition owes an inestimable debt, not only for hard work with little recognition and scant remuneration, but also for his resolve to be the lone voice against huge and insidious evils that confronted the world in waves, from hyperinflation and irresponsible monetary and fiscal policies to Bolshevism and National Socialism. This rich legacy lives on, thanks in large part to the efforts of his wife Margit, who supported the founding of the Ludwig von Mises Institute in 1982 and chaired its board until she died in 1993. Mises remained steadfast, a light of reason, because he never forgot his roots with Menger and Bombavirk and stayed true to a tradition which remains highly relevant today. Untenema in the land of the Nibelungen The Austrians are known for grounding all of their analysis, even when looking at macro issues, such as recessions and inflation, within a microeconomic approach, based on the actions of individual consumers and entrepreneurs. We will follow suit here with an economic parable to illustrate how the market is a process, not static action, where neither time nor opportunity is homogenous. We will bring in some key Austrian concepts that are central to our story, especially the entrepreneurial discovery of false prices. We will also discuss a new concept that I've dubbed the Musician Stationarity Index, or MS Index for short, which, though not a measure developed by Mises himself, is a natural extension of the Mengerian Bombaverkian understanding of the temporal structure of capital, roundabout production, and time preference, as well as the Mesisian understanding of economic distortions that arise from monetary interventionism. Thus prepared, we proceed to the mythical land of the Nibelungen. My apologies to any Wagnerians. The land of the Nibelungen, or Nibelungenland, is a quintessentially beautiful place of soaring mountains, lush forests, picturesque farms, and high-elevation pasture land, to which the goat herds drive their animals in the annual summer Alpaufzug, in order to graze in the sweet grass and take in the fresh breezes. In Nibelungenland, there are but three landowners, Siegfried, Johann, and Gunther, who gaze out their back doors each morning and survey their fiefdoms, all of which have pretty much identical land. As pasture for their alpine goats, the land is used in a direct, relatively short production process, as we recall from Bombavirk, of about a month or so, which equates to the time it takes the grass and flora to grow before the pasture is ready again to be devoured by the ravenous goats. From this short production process flows the staple Nibelungen food product, goat's milk. Of course, grass and Alpenblumen are not the only things that will grow on the land. The soil, sunlight, and available water make it suitable for forestry, although timber is a much more roundabout, time-consuming process than simply keeping pastures. Rather than the quick turnaround measured in weeks, the timber crop might take forty years to mature sufficiently for harvest. Timber is tempting because of good demand for wood as fuel and lumber for construction, and yet the landowners can typically count on brisk demand for goat's milk as well. Standing at his back door one morning, listening to the melodic tinkling of the goat's bells as they head to the high pasture and the staccato pounding of hammers from new construction in the village, Siegfried gets an idea to devote some of his land to pasture and the rest to timber. When Johann and Gunther hear of Siegfried's plan, they say to themselves, Warum nicht? Indeed, why not? The demand for milk and lumber is such that all three devote some land to pasture and the rest to timber. At this point in the story, Siegfried, Gunther, and Johann manage to devote just the right amount of land to pasture for milk production and to forestry for growing timber stands, to generate cash flow that equals the market rate of interest on their invested capital, land. We could initially imagine the three Nibelung entrepreneurs are experiencing Mises's evenly rotating economy, the ERE from Chapter 1, in which there are no pure profits, rather, everyone earns the same rate of return from investing in marginal land that they could get if they bought a bond. The Faustman ratio from Chapter 5 for each is thus equal to 1 which means the rate of return on the land investment is equal to the market rate of interest, which represents their opportunity cost of capital. There is no reason to change anything. Everyone is and remains in equilibrium. The entrepreneur serves no purpose and can be ignored. This is largely the domain of mainstream economics. Back when they were boys, Siegfried was always the one to watch, 
because he seemed to have a knack for everything, from raising goats to slaying dragons to getting the girl. He even ended up marrying Gunther's sister, and to make matters worse, won the affections of his wife. There is just something about that Siegfried, named for joyous in victory, that puts him a step above the rest. Eventually, even though his land is physically identical to that owned by the other two men, and his production costs are exactly the same as well, Siegfried finds an edge. He discovers that serenading his pastures with his Alpenhorn, or more precisely his magic Wunderhorn, miraculously makes the grasses grow fuller and faster, and he begins to do the same with his tree seedlings, with the same results. Gunther naturally tries a similar trick, but he just doesn't share Siegfried's musicianship. In fact, Gunther's plants actually seem to suffer when he garishly plucks his zither. Johann, who is truly just the typical average Johann, thinks it's all a bunch of nonsense, since everybody knows grass and trees can't hear music. So in the real world, the ERE is too demanding a benchmark, because things simply don't work in that way. It is more realistic to suppose that some people are better at certain things, such as anticipating what consumers will want in the future, and more efficient in producing goods to satisfy consumer wants, both of which seem to be Siegfried's strong suits. Therefore, some entrepreneurs will earn profits and others will suffer losses. If measured by the Faustmann ratio, the results would vary considerably. The more successful would have a ratio above one, while the laggards are below one. But what if everyone is lumped together? The result would be a stationary economy, in which there are no aggregate profits or losses. The aggregate Faustmann ratio, the sum of all the individual numerators, or the total market capitalization, divided by the sum of all the denominators, or the total replacement cost or net worth, is equal to one. In Nibelungenland, that means Siegfried's profits are counterbalanced by Gunther's losses, while Johann just earns the average rate of return equal to the market interest rate. Keep in mind, though, that the stationary economy in Nibelungenland is not an ERE because things change. Siegfried, the Henry Ford of Nibelungenland, decides that, since he calculates that he is earning a 15% return on his existing land, which is above the current interest rate, which we'll say is 8%, rather than merely pocketing his profits as payment for his past successes, he lives well enough now as it is. He will instead reinvest those profits right back up into ever more land. His operations are thus growing. Gunther, having been bested by Siegfried once again, decides he better scale back his timber operation because he's earning only 1% on his marginal land. He sells some of his land to Siegfried. This reallocation continues until, on the margin, Siegfried no longer earns more than the cost of capital and Gunther earns at least the cost of capital. It's possible that Gunther ends up with no land, but we don't know this in general. It would depend upon specific numbers. However, as Gunther sells off his land, we can assume his marginal return grows steadily higher because he gets rid of the least productive parcels first. Although, as stated earlier, we assume for simplicity's sake that the three men own identical land, it still makes sense to think that selling off some of it would raise Gunther's return because he has to hire workers and invest in other inputs for goat herding and forestry. By reducing the scale of his operations, Gunther can let go the most inefficient workers and or equipment and retain the most productive combinations. In the real world in which land quality and suitability varies, the assumption is even more correct. It would only make sense to sell off the least fertile land first. And we can fairly assume that if Gunther couldn't increase his marginal returns by scaling back his operations, he would simply get out of farming altogether. In keeping with our story, though, we presume Gunther can tweak his operation in response to his losses, rather than selling out to Siegfried completely. Siegfried, on the other hand, would actually experience diminishing marginal productivity as he bought more land from Gunther. If this didn't happen... Siegfried would go on a buying spree until he owned everything in Nibelungenland. One obvious cause for the decline in return, perhaps to below the cost of capital, is that he has exhausted the demand for even his premium products, the Alpenhorn serenaded goat's milk and timber products, and his increased supply has put pressure on prices. Indeed, Siegfried's growth has made life better for both him and his customers. And of course, if Siegfried were to try to add to his operations without limit, the cost of borrowing capital would itself eventually begin rising, which would keep his expansion in check. 
As we can see, Siegfried is the golden boy, whose personal market is favorably in disequilibrium and non-stationarity because the return on his investment is higher than his cost of capital. Thus, Siegfried is progressing. Capital accumulation is occurring in his business as he starts more seedlings, pushing his revenues further into the future, making him increasingly roundabout in his production. Gunther, however, is regressing because he is shrinking his capital. Siegfried is living proof of a Misesian maxim of an entrepreneur's intolerance for false prices. As Mises wrote in Human Action, the essential fact is that it is the competition of profit-seeking entrepreneurs that does not tolerate the preservation of false prices of the factors of production. Furthermore, these entrepreneurial activities bring about the correction of false prices while whittling away at both profits and losses. Keep in mind that entrepreneurs make mistakes all the time, but when there is stationarity overall, absent any change in saving and investment preferences, losses from some are canceled out by profits from others in the aggregate. We see this dynamic in Siegfried and Gunther, both of whom play an essential part in the market process, through which each attempts to better his position, and in so doing ends up weeding out all false prices and removing opportunities for both profits and losses. There is aggregate stability, but not cross-sectional stability in the stationary economy. That is, there is entrepreneurial dispersion. Some businesses are progressing, some are staying the same, and others are regressing. In other words, there are Siegfrieds and there are Gunthers, and even average Johans in between. Taking a deeper look, we would expect that if Siegfried, Johann, and Gunther sold their operations outright to capitalists, say having decided to retire to Boca, in both an ERE and a stationary economy, the total appropriately appraised sale price would exactly equal the amount of land times the market price, plus any accumulated capital, such as trees. Thus, we would expect the numerator of the aggregate Faustmann ratio, the total land expectation value, or LEV, would equal the denominator, which is the total land replacement value, LRV. The whole would equal the sum of its parts. Specifically, ownership of the land operations, entitling owners to the present discounted value of future net rents from what the land produces, pasture or timber. The LEV in the numerator would have the exact same value as the replacement land market price. In short, what the land earns equals what it costs to replace. In an ERE, this balance would be achieved by each individual firm experiencing perfect equilibrium between the return and the replacement costs. In a stationary economy, as stated, this balance is only achieved in the aggregate. Because their returns vary, Siegfried's operation that earns more than the cost of capital will sell for more than the value of his assets. Johann, whose return equals the cost of capital, will realize no premium on his operation, and Gunther's operation with a return below the cost of capital, will sell for less than the value of his assets. It is precisely this mismatch between the market's present value of the free cash flows from his going enterprise versus the market's value of the invested capital under his control that compels Gunther, with a Faustmann ratio of less than one, to sell off land, while Siegfried, with a Faustmann ratio above one, buys land. No matter that Gunther might want to imitate Siegfried, his returns tell a different story. Gunther is simply better off selling marginal land at the market price and investing the proceeds at the market rate of interest and sticking to his pasture land. Siegfried, meanwhile, armed with his Wunderhorn, has greater profit potential from the additional land, even if he has to borrow from the bank to buy the extra land. His return is well above the market rate of interest. This balancing of resources from least profitable to most continues until each man finds that the present value of his future net cash flows is exactly equal to the value of his land, though new changes may disrupt the process before this stasis point is ever reached in the real world. It's also true that in the real world, the spot prices of lumber and goat's milk would probably change, but such details are omitted to illustrate the concept. In the land of the Nibelungen, an ongoing balancing and steering process directed unwittingly by the players in the game, moves the economy towards stationarity. And if there were no further changes in the data, even to an ERE, as false prices are eliminated. This is precisely what Mises meant when he said, the market is a process. The cartoonish Nibelung economy aptly illustrates Mises's concept of stationarity. 
When the ratio across the economy of the total present value of cash flows from the land, LEV, to the total replacement cost of that land, LRV, departs from 1, it signals a departure from stationarity. Thus, I call this aggregate ratio of the LEV to the LRV the MS index, in deference to Mises, the originator of the crucial concepts involved. As such, the MS index will be a central measure and tool used in Austrian investing in chapters 9 and 10. It should be noted that the MS index is similar to the well-known Tobin's Q ratio, and in fact, my calculated values of the MS index used in chapter 9 are essentially the same as the equity Q ratio, as discussed by Nobel laureate James Tobin in 1969. Strictly speaking, Tobin's equity Q calculation nets assets against corporate debt in the denominator. This is equivalent to our treatment of the Faustmann ratio, because debt and interest expenses can be subtracted from the LRV and LEV, respectively, without any impact or change in meaning. Faustmann assumed no debt in his forestry operation, but accounting for it is trivial. However, I will reserve the honor of its discovery to Mises, not Tobin, because Tobin's work on the Q ratio came much later, and also because Tobin patently misunderstood its meaning and the consequences of using it as a monetary policy gauge of effectiveness. The significance of the index lies entirely in the concepts, not the accounting or empiricism behind it. Not only did Tobin arrive at his measure via a different path from the one taken in this audiobook, but his policy recommendations, what Tobin did with his analysis, were also quite different. Tobin recognized, as we have here, that loose monetary policy could cause the valuation of assets to exceed their replacement value, which would cause the Q ratio to exceed 1. Yet Tobin, operating within the simpler Keynesian view of the capital stock of the economy, thought this would be a good thing, drawing forth, as one would expect, real physical investment in new capital goods and making the economy more productive. As if to help me underscore this very point, just as I was finalizing this manuscript, Paul Krugman, in his New York Times blog, admitted that the economy presented some real puzzles. Krugman wondered, why, with profits so high, don't businesses invest more? And he explicitly brought up Tobin's cue. Making it all the more fitting for my point here, Krugman dismissed these real side puzzles as having nothing whatsoever to do with the Fed's monetary policies and saw no signature of an asset bubble. So heretofore, the MS index is what matters most, not only among the entrepreneurs of the Nibelungenland, but also among the rest of us in the real world of capitalistic investing. Genuine change is afoot in Nibelungenland, a market-induced drop in interest rates. Meanwhile, back in the land of the Nibelungen, Siegfried is making money in buying land, Gunther is selling land, and Johann is making the equivalent of his cost of capital. Then, like a shift in the wind, Siegfried notices changes as he walks around the village. People are scaling back their purchases of consumer goods, such as goat's milk, and saving more, perhaps with the intention of buying lumber, or even more goat's milk, in the future. In other words, consumers' time preferences have fallen. Savings are increasing, and as a result, interest rates are declining. Standing at his back door on a clear alpine day, Siegfried contemplates what this means for his land holdings, thus demonstrating Kersner's alertness found among entrepreneurs who are constantly on the lookout for potential profit opportunities. Such alertness exists along the entire spectrum of entrepreneurial activity, from mere arbitrage created by price discrepancies to the development of new products and or the discovery of new and improved production processes. Siegfried engages in a kind of appraisal process known as Versteien, or understanding, which is critical to the decision to become more roundabout. This is about the subjective anticipation of what consumers want, not a mechanical process of expected value and weighted explicit probabilities. In Siegfried's case, he approximates the Faustmann ratio for his operation and that of his competitors, and even appraises the ratios for businesses that do not even exist yet. His analysis leads him to a decision, and he acts upon it. Hence, Siegfried is a real entrepreneur, as Mises would have described him, a speculator who is eager to utilize his opinion about the future structure of the market for business operations promising profits. Although the future remains uncertain, the entrepreneur relies on specific anticipative understanding, which can be neither taught nor learned. 
He does not focus on what was or is, but acts upon what he expects the future to be. In Mises' view, the impulse of his actions is that he appraises the factors of production and the future prices of the commodities, which can be produced out of them in a different way from other people. What occurs in Nibelungenland illustrates the continuous discovery process of endless change, endless disequilibria, endless testing and correcting. What results are also endlessly changing prices and new production, and new liquidations, as in the case of Gunther. As each responds to Faustmann ratios in this way, in aggregate, the system responds to its MS index and thus progresses, returns to stationary, regresses, and so on. The market facilitates the vital control and communication within the system, a grand homeostatic process. Unfortunately, misunderstanding this process has led, and perhaps never more so than today, to interventions which undermine and distort the natural process. In this Nibelungen scenario, in which interest rates naturally respond without intervention to changes in time preference, Siegfried knows that lower interest rates mean that the present value of the expected cash flows from forestry rise because their more distant profits are discounted to a lesser degree. He might possibly also consider that consumers who are saving now could be expected to buy more things like lumber in the future. What he knows intuitively, smart guy, that Siegfried, is that his Faustmann ratio is greater than one, at least for now, as consumer spending is being diverted from now until later, while future expenditures are now discounted by a lower interest rate. Bottom line, the aggregate value of owning his land operations has increased. Siegfried knows exactly what to do. Divert more land out of pasture and into the roundabout production of timber. Keep in mind that, in a forest, the growing stock of trees is capital goods, not land, in an economic classification. Given a plot of suitable land, a forest can be built by humans, but it takes time. Thus, the amount of trees of a certain age available at a given time is not a fact of nature's endowment. It is a product of human intervention, just as surely as a tractor. To the extent that bringing new land under cultivation requires the investment of real resources, using labor and tools to clear the land, till the soil, dig irrigation trenches, install irrigation, and so forth, the transformed product is new capital, too, even though it might initially sound odd to describe a parcel of land as capital. As Siegfried and his workers labor on his land holdings, the accumulation of capital becomes visible as more trees are planted, leading to a perpetually larger quantity of maturing timber in any future year. In the real world, another route by which the economy would become more roundabout would be to pull previously sub-marginal land into cultivation. Most important, though, the MS index remains a robust indicator of the relationship between the aggregate return on invested capital and the associated opportunity costs, just as it did with individual Faustmann ratios. This, in a nutshell, is what's so special about the MS index. In this section, we have been walking through the implications of a sudden and unexpected change in consumer time preference. Their sudden desire to save more will help some producers and hurt others. Milk prices fall because consumers are cutting back their purchases in order to save more. In the short run, the return on land devoted to pasture falls. On the other hand, return on more roundabout timberland rises. Siegfried makes a profit on his timber holdings, but, alas, poor Gunther is once again left behind as he suffers a further decline in the profitability of his pastures. In the aggregate, though, Siegfried's gains outweigh Gunther's losses, because in this scenario, there is genuine saving and investment. It is a classic example of what Mises called a progressing, no longer stationary economy, as defined by a period of capital accumulation. Now, we could imagine some other changes in Nibelungenland in response to the lower consumer time preference. One of our three Unternehmer might decide to invest in cheese production, a roundabout process of intermediate length, longer than selling goat's milk every day, but much shorter than growing trees for lumber. And thanks to lower interest rates, it is now more profitable. In our progressing economy, the MS index, as stated, would rise, but the effect would be fleeting. The numerator goes up because aggregate profits from timber producers would be greater than aggregate losses from milk producers. Mises and subsequent Austrians have argued that genuine savings from consumers are the source of the aggregate net profit. However, the denominator would go up quickly too, 
because the new savings would be immediately channeled into financing net capital acquisitions, such as land and equipment for timber or cheese production. Therefore, there is no reason to expect a genuine savings-driven drop in interest rates, which causes a brief, intermittent move out of stationarity, to trigger a systematic change in the MS index. The increase in aggregate profits, measured in monetary terms, that causes the numerator to increase, would be counterbalanced very quickly by an increase in the market value of the actual assets owned collectively. The same underlying cause, namely a drop in time preference and hence increased savings by consumers, would drive increases in both the numerator and denominator. As we can see, the numerator would never get ahead of the denominator, or vice versa, for very long, because even roundabout production would entail immediate transactions to acquire more factors of production. To expect otherwise is to expect greedy entrepreneurs to fully recognize higher profits in their operations through a higher LEV, yet refrain from exploiting them. In Nibelungenland, there is a hum of activity among the timber operations, dairies and creameries, toolmakers and all the rest. These normal market forces push the MS index immediately back to one. As Siegfried and his peers go about their business, there is no need to take a particular stand on the rationality of investors or the lack thereof. They may suffer from waves of animal spirits, a la Keynes, or have irrational exuberance, a la Robert Schiller. The point is that if these traits will bid up stock prices, why wouldn't they also bid up capital goods prices? If investors are bullish and want to buy shares in a trucking company, why wouldn't people also be enticed to buy trucks? In this sense, we can view any history of a diverging MS index as quasi-proof of distortion away from stationarity, which, as we will hear, creates quite a bit of havoc in Nibelungenland. Distortion comes to Nibelungenland. The central bank lowers rates. One sunny Nibelungenland day, as Siegfried heads out to his lands to serenade his tree seedlings and his prime pasture, he bids a hearty Grüß Gott to his neighbor Fritz the banker. As Fritz returns the greeting, he whispers a bit of news which he managed to find out before it became public from his chums at the central bank. Interest rates are headed lower. Siegfried scratches his head. It doesn't seem to him that people are spending any less and thus saving more, which would cause interest rates to drop. He gives little additional thought to it as he continues on his way, because his operations are already profitable without a change in the cost of capital, thanks, as always, to his Wunderhorn playing. But he isn't surprised when, a few days later, he runs into Gunther and Johann, now bubbling with excitement over their newfound profitability. Indeed, with a lower cost of capital, everyone now appears to be making more money. This time, however, it is not a genuine savings-induced drop in interest rates. Rather, the stationary economy of Nibelungenland is rocked by the central bankers, who decide to pump in more money and push down interest rates. Strictly speaking, the musician theory of the business cycle need not involve a central bank, because credit expansion occurs whenever a commercial bank lends out some of one customer's deposits to a new borrower. However, in modern times, such credit expansion by commercial banks typically occurs under the auspices of the central bank. Now, as households are saving less and consuming more, lumber and milk prices are going up, and all the while interest rates fall. Gunther and Johann sense, finally, a chance to be profitable like Siegfried. At face value, the artificial change in interest rates and the artificial rise in consumer prices have helped all landowners, all of whom think they are earning profits. The Nibelungenland Börse, the stock market, stages a dramatic rally because the market value of firms, the price of title to existing capital, is being bid up, and people are revising upward their expectations of future net rents. Another reason the market value goes up is that future net rents are discounted at a lower rate. Because interest rates have been artificially lowered, the jump in the numerator is greater in this scenario than when rates respond to general savings. In the former scenario, as we recall, households reduced expenditures on milk. The gains of entrepreneurs like Siegfried, who had foreseen the profitability of timber, were partially offset by the losses of those entrepreneurs like Gunther, who had devoted most of their land to pasture, there wasn't a general boom. But in the euphoria induced by the central bank pumping in liquidity, every sector seems to enjoy prosperity, at least temporarily. In the artificial interest rate scenario, 
one firm's gain need not be offset by another firm's loss, and so aggregate profits increase much more, pushing up the numerator of the MS index by far more than in the earlier scenario of lower rates due to genuine saving. Everyone is a Siegfried now, well-dressed, smiling, the toast of the town, or so they think. Meanwhile, the forces that previously pushed up the denominator in the genuine saving scenario are muted in the central bank-induced drama. Despite Siegfried-like profits suddenly made available to average Johans, there is a crunch on how much new capital accumulation can occur, because there isn't any real saving. The central bank can print money, but it can't print land. Everything is encouraged to grow simultaneously, just as we heard in Chapter 2 in The Fire-Suppressed Forest, and as we will revisit again in Chapter 8. The land of the Nibelungen, just like the real world under such intervention, is a frightfully distorted place. It is physically impossible to devote more land to timber production because all the pasture land currently in use appears to be quite profitable and, indeed, deserving of expansion as well. Worse yet, artificially low interest rates don't just maintain the status quo. They spur greater milk consumption. The Nibelungen, motivated by cheap credit, are living it up, drunk on more milk consumption. In order to keep up with the demand, some of the land devoted to timber must be diverted into pasture land. So rather than replanting trees on freshly harvested forest land, some landowners decide to transition back to pasture land in order to boost milk production. No one wants to wait. Rather than accumulate assets to amass their own roundabout capital structures, people bid up prices of existing operations, whether stands of timber or goat farms and pastures. Fritz's proprietary trading desk has already been at work, front-running everyone else, gobbling up these assets whose returns now trump the lower interest rates. Although the availability of some sub-marginal land may act as a safety valve, allowing the expansion of both timber and pasture, thereby lowering the aggregate return on invested capital, in general, the artificially low interest rates will open up the possibility of shortening the overall structure of production the very opposite of the natural response when interest rates fall due to greater savings. Mises called this phenomena capital consumption. In the real world, Mises thought capital consumption occurred as a mistake driven by the perverse effects of inflation upon accounting. For example, if a business owner establishes a sinking fund out of incoming revenues in order to replace his depreciating equipment, then unanticipated bursts of inflation could distort his plans he would see good times in his business, customers spending liberally on his products, and would, in his mind, put aside enough to replace his equipment as it wore out, while spending the rest that he considered to be pure profit. In reality, though, it was only the result of inflation. Later, when he needed to replace his equipment, he would be shocked to discover he hadn't put aside enough. He had unwittingly consumed part of his business's equipment. As we can see, Inflationary credit expansion by the banks can unfortunately lead to a reduction of the overall capital structure, a regressing economy. Although the market value of a given capital good might rise to reflect the higher estimates of future rents, it should be clear that the aggregate increase in the denominator LRV will be at a lesser pace in this scenario. As capital stock is growing slowly or even shrinking, compared to when genuine savings allows for the production of additional capital goods, Keep in mind that when Mises spoke of the perverse effects of inflation, he referred to artificial expansion of bank credit and hence the total quantity of money in the economy. He did not mean the rise of a price index of some basket of consumer goods, which is what most economists and analysts think of today with the word inflation. Although monetary or credit inflation will cause price inflation, other things being equal, this is not an essential element of the Austrian theory. Credit expansion, with its artificially low interest rates, distorts the capital structure, fostering an unsustainable boom, followed inevitably by a crash, whether or not the public perceives an inflation problem. Mises captured the false, unsustainable boom of a central bank-induced drop in interest rates in human action. But now the drop in interest rates falsifies the businessman's calculation. Although the amount of capital goods available did not increase, the calculation employs figures which would be utilizable only if such an increase had taken place. The result of such calculations is therefore misleading. 
they make some projects appear profitable and realizable, which a correct calculation, based on an interest rate not manipulated by credit expansion, would have shown as unrealizable. Entrepreneurs embark upon execution of such projects. Business activities are stimulated. A boom begins. To be clear, it is the abnegation of interest rates as an information and control parameter in the economy that creates the distortion, not just inflation per se. That is, if money was instead simply created by the central bank and wired to Congress to be spent, clearly it would be inflationary and counterproductive, but it needn't create the distortions of boom and bust. In Nibelungenland, the false prosperity has spread faster than hay fever in the summertime. Induced by cheap and available credit, consumers are buying out shops, new businesses open up in the village, and people spend even more, maxing out their credit cards. The average Johann is remodeling his house, along with expanding his business, and even Gunther is looking at getting a vacation place. Indeed, Mises could have been looking at the land of the Nibelungenland when he wrote in Human Action. They feel lucky and become open-handed in spending and enjoying life. They embellish their homes, they build new mansions, and patronize the entertainment business. Time Inconsistency and the Term Structure the canonical exposition of Mises' theory shows clearly how monetary distortions lead to the business cycle that is so evident in Nibelungenland. Credit expansion, i.e. monetary inflation coming from the banks, pushes interest rates down artificially, thereby causing an unsustainable boom period of false prosperity. Because the price discovery and price signaling system is distorted, entrepreneurs try to invest more while consumers save less. And even worse, investments are channeled into the wrong lines. These real imbalances eventually result in a general crash, which takes many resources, including labor, out of use temporarily as the economy adjusts to the harsh reality. In applying Misesian theory to the actual financial world, however, we will make two moves in the interest of realism. First, we will acknowledge that there are multiple interest rates, rather than the interest rate, as is often discussed in Austrian literature. Second, we will assume many investors in the financial sector are better described by the time-inconsistent hyperbolic discounting model, as discussed in Chapter 6, rather than the conventional approach of exponential discounting. Mises and his followers don't use such terminology either way, but they don't stress the implications of time inconsistency, which can't be explained in a standard exponential discounting framework. Ironically, as we have discussed, Bambaverk anticipated much of this modern work, even though subsequent Austrians didn't develop it further. Even with these tweaks to the conventional Austrian thinking, we retain the spirit of Misesian business cycle theory, and we are in a position to better explain the empirical observations of our most recent recession and all the others. Economists of all stripes agree that when the central bank inflates the money stock by buying treasuries, called open market operations, it has much more power to push down the front of the yield curve rather than the back. Intuitively, this is because the creation of more money will push up long-term price inflation, requiring higher long-term nominal yields, and hence the axiom that, in the long run, the Fed can't change the real rate of interest, only the general rate of price inflation, and thus the nominal rate of interest. Even today's quantitative easing programs have limited potency, because the more the Fed gobbles up long-term treasuries, the more money it prints and the higher price inflation investors come to expect, all of which makes attempts to knock down yields ultimately self-defeating, especially longer maturities. Since artificially lower interest rates by the central bank are typically focused on the front of the yield curve, after a drop in rates the greatest spread or greatest arbitrage opportunity is in short-range investments and or production. This also creates immediate profit opportunities and currently productive capital, which results in title to existing capital, a.k.a. the stock market, to be aggressively bid up until those returns on invested capital, more specifically the yields on that title to capital, no longer exceed the new lower cost of capital. The most destructive of all, though, is when new owners of this capital have no desire to replace it as it depreciates, preferring instead to gain an extra current return and thus buy more title to existing capital. They do not become more roundabout because they refrain from investing in capital that will not show returns for a period of time, or a period when the interest rate has not been lowered as much as shorter-term rates. 
Thus, there is a hyper-focus on, and even addiction to, the yields of stocks and other risky and high-duration securities, a maturity mismatch. There is an irrepressible allure to the steep yield curve. What was supposed to create patient, roundabout investors instead creates the opposite, punters in highly speculative carry trades. These tendencies are simply exacerbated if, as I've described, the majority of investors have sharply falling discount rates with delay, what mainstream economists now will often refer to as hyperbolic discounting from Chapter 6. Even if all rates are lowered equally, the default assumption, if one only speaks of changes in the interest rate, if investors have hyperbolic discounting, then the across-the-board drop in interest rates would nonetheless cause the biggest surge in the perceived value of projects that would yield their results in the near future. What hyperbolic discounting implies is that we do not process a discount rate over an interval in some gestalt or coherent whole fashion, as one would implicitly assume under exponential discounting. Rather, discounting is highly sequential and intertemporal. Our willingness to endure a wait from now until next week requires our willingness to wait from now until tomorrow, from tomorrow until the day after, and so forth. And, as per the definition of hyperbolic discounting, we perceive enduring the first day is really hard, and each successive day we perceive will be a little easier. But we must make it past the earlier days in order to get to the later days. Thus it is sequential. What this means is, if we are unsatisfied with the wait early on, from now until tomorrow, we won't make it to the wait much later, from six days from now until seven days from now, despite how satisfied we may be were we to wait over the entire period, from now until a week from now. If we are given fewer marshmallows for waiting early on, recalling the preschooler experiment, then we won't likely make it to see perhaps exceedingly more marshmallows by waiting even longer. Deprived of marshmallows, investors desire for the immediate reward of an even smaller, sooner marshmallow, or perhaps a larger one much later, is further magnified. With standard exponential discounting, a uniform drop in interest rates across various maturities would normally cause the longest projects to respond the most in present value, but hyperbolic discounting concentrates the impact of a rate cut in the near term. The immediate carry trades over the immediate, higher discounting, that is, more impatient period, are thus made even more enticing. To say this doesn't necessarily mean that investors will invest in short projects in a Bambaverkian sense. It is immaterial whether this involves production that is already underway, having gone through a long period of capital accumulation or a short period of production. The quickness for realizing profits is what matters, and so people will tend to invest in projects where they can turn their investments around quickly. Thus, a combination of low short-term rates and hyperbolic time preferences will induce investors to buy title to already existing capital structures, rather than trying to construct them from scratch and suffering the delay in waiting for their completion. The effect can snowball, too, as myopic investors seek to draw profits from their acquisitions. Rather than reinvesting in newly acquired and expanded operations, they will pay out higher dividends and buy back stock, and even borrow to do this, such as is happening today, or even just sit in cash. Each time another investor alters his strategy toward dividend investing, and another firm adjusts to attract this investor, another bit of future progress is sapped from the economy. Entrepreneurs and investors are, thus, consuming capital in the same analogous way they consume capital in Mises' inflationary view. Interestingly, this increased temporal myopia under artificially lowered rates is the very opposite effect of naturally savings-driven lower rates. Genuine savings-driven declines in the interest rate lead to capital accumulation, more roundabout production, and a progressing economy. Artificially lower rates, driven by credit inflation, ultimately lead to naught but capital consumption and a regressing economy. When credit inflation first comes on the scene, there is a brief adjustment process where funds are channeled into investments that were previously less profitable than they now appear, and this wave of new investment pushes down yields, or the rate of interest income on capital investments, to the new lower rate. This is the aspect of the boom on which many Austrians focus almost exclusively. Yet I think the more insidious malinvestments occur after this initial burst, when the lower rates have been arbitraged throughout the system. Amplified by the fact that people discount the immediate future at a steeper rate than more distant periods, we arrive at the perverse result that managers squeeze as much out of their firms as they can in the present, 
their immediacy is magnified. While neglecting the capital expenditures necessary to keep the firm growing and even maintain it, the standard Austrian analysis is thus correct when it says that artificially low interest rates lead to malinvestments in projects that are too roundabout relative to the amount of genuine saving. But I am stressing another aspect of the boom, one also discussed by Mises, in which the capital stock is actually degraded. It becomes less roundabout. It is this second phenomenon that can explain much of the stylized facts of historical and our current recession. This aspect can also explain, in solid Austrian analysis, the profound paradox of the MS index when it is elevated. Note that the Keynesians, with their concept of a liquidity trap, grope around the same issues, but as usual they completely misdiagnose the real problem. Today's Keynesians recognize that odd things happen when interest rates are pushed down to zero, because cash and government bonds become virtually interchangeable. The Fed suddenly loses traction and can no longer stimulate investment. Yet because of their misdiagnosis of the problem, the Keynesian solution is all the worse. They recommend either government deficit spending or unconventional monetary policy that will convince the public that higher price inflation is down the road. Naturally, such alleged remedies will only exacerbate the misallocation of resources that the Austrians have correctly identified. In light of the distortions generated during the unsustainable boom and the misery that would necessarily follow in the ensuing bust, it is no wonder that Mises considered economics to be deadly serious. To him, it was no mere intellectual exercise. Rather, the very future of mankind, of civilization, rested upon an understanding of these economic principles. The Day of Reckoning Comes to Nibelungenland For a while in Nibelungenland, Businesses do appear to be earning more than their cost of capital, or at least their profitability would be higher. Share prices are bid up, but the market value of these assets net of liabilities lags. Thus the MS index rises in this scenario, whereas in the natural interest rate environment, the rise was short-lived, even imperceptible, equilibrating forces that would knock it back to one or far weaker to non-existent. Miraculously, the whole remains greater than the sum of its parts. Furthermore, there is genuine misallocation of real physical resources. Land is simultaneously tugged between pasture and timber, as both appear to be highly profitable. Entrepreneurs make irrevocable investments, such as constructing creameries and buying equipment for cheese production. When the day of reckoning does come and the crash occurs, such capital investments will be recognized as wasteful. What was believed to have been a wave of prosperity is finally revealed to have only been distortion induced by credit expansion. The axiom of the axe is enforced. Shops close. The pounding of hammers at new construction sites ceases. Goat herds are sold off or culled. Pasture land grows wild and unused. The shiny equipment of the creameries gathers dust. And even stands of trees are clear-cut, perhaps for pulp, and the ground is not replanted. Siegfried gets hurt somewhat by the drop in prices, and a bit of his land goes fallow for lack of demand, but he remains profitable, just as he was before rates were artificially lowered. He manages to stay above the fray, because of this, we will meet up with our hero again in Chapter 10. He was not significantly affected by the lower cost of capital. His operations were profitable without the change in interest rates, yet his heart is heavy when he sees the impact on his beloved village the for sale sign in front of Johann's house, with the new addition on the back, and the foreclosure notice on Gunther's front door. When Siegfried goes out each day to play his Wunderhorn, his music is mournful, a dirge for the lost dreams of the Nibelungen. The Austrian View In the Austrian View, the familiar business cycle that periodically plagues modern market economies is the result of government intervention in money and banking, as Mises told us, once a boom sets in, a bust is inevitable. The only question is when. Rather than employing the typical Keynesian solution of goosing spending to get out of a recession, the Austrians would rather avoid the preceding boom altogether. The longer the boom lasts, egged on by accommodative central bank policy, and the more distorted the capital structure becomes, the worse the ensuing crash. By now it should be clear why the crucial concept used in our parable and completely applicable in the real world is called the MS Index, named as it is for Mises, who identified the distortive forces at work in the business cycle. 
Mises' perspective, and that of the other Austrians, proves to be the superior one. First, we can see why monetary policy can yield a ratio that is persistently higher than one, even though in the beginning it seems paradoxical and nonsensical. Second, we understand why the types of capital investments spurned by artificially low interest rates are undesirable. Yet with the richer Austrian concept of the roundabout structure of production, we know that the types of investment ultimately matter even more. The market process prevails. When Ludwig von Mises stood at the front of that lecture hall in 1954 to proclaim the market as a process, he labored under no delusion that we lived in a natural system, free of the distortion of intervention. In 1954, the Federal Reserve was in its 41st year and attempting at the time to manage the economy after a mild recession while curbing inflation. A brief but more severe recession would follow in 1958. Mises, the father of Austrian business cycle theory, knew all too well the disastrous effects of inflation and expansion, which proved far worse than deflation and contraction. As he wrote in Human Action, expansion squanders scarce factors of production by malinvestment and overconsumption. If it once comes to an end, a tedious process of recovery is needed in order to wipe out the impoverishment it has left behind. But contraction produces neither malinvestment nor overconsumption. Although there is a decline in business activities during a contraction, there is also less consumption of both consumer goods and factors of production. When a contraction ends, there is no need for painful healing as there is during the euphoria of an artificially induced expansion when capital is consumed. Destructive capital consumption is more than just excessive spending. It is a deadly virus that deprives both current and future generations of the resources needed to carry on and even to advance civilization itself. Constructive capital accumulation is an intertemporal legacy that sparks gratitude for what came before and also obligation for what will come after, indeed a process unto itself. As Mises wrote, we are the lucky heirs of our father and forefathers, whose saving has accumulated the capital goods with the aid of which we are working today. We favorite children of the age of electricity still derive advantage from the original saving of the primitive fishermen who, in producing the first nets and canoes, devoted a part of their working time to provision for a remoter future. If the sons of these legendary fishermen had won out these intermediary products, nets and canoes, without replacing them by new ones, they would have consumed capital, and the process of saving and capital accumulation would have had to start afresh. Distortion persists, and capital is consumed to the detriment of roundabout capitalistic production. And yet the process that is the market continues. As we will hear in Chapter 8, natural systems from forests to markets continuously seek balance. Although there may be obstacles and delays due to intervention, the drive to re-establish this balance cannot be thwarted. Adjustments may be painful. Ridding the system of excesses can leave behind the scorched earth of destruction. Yet these natural systems will always find a way.